Police, fire, medical. I need uh, uh, emergency, please. What? Uh, ambulance. Um, someone is, if someone is hurt, uh, yeah, lacerated, cut. Okay, who's cut? Uh, a, 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 who is this? It, it's a, a teenager. Okay, male or female? This is the girl of I think it's a girl. She, she's, they have a major cut to their neck. Do you know what happened? I don't know. My husband heard someone screaming and then we came outside. Ma'am, do you know if this person was assaulted? I don't know. We just came outside. They have a major wound to their neck and they're struggling to breathe. Are they awake? I, I don't think they're even responsive at this point. Is she breathing? I, I don't see any breath. Yes, yes. Breathing. Okay. She is breathing, you think? Yes, but struggling. Ma'am, is the blood spurting or pouring out? You know, it's all over the ground. Okay, but is it spurting out or pouring out of the person? It, it may have already. I don't think this, I don't think this person has any more blood. Okay. It looks like a, a, a knife wound. Okay. I, I don't think get it clean. Right? Yeah. I don't see them breathing. I don't think they're with us. In a jealous rage, a killer stabbed his victim multiple times and attempted to sever her head before fleeing into the woods as someone stepped out of their home hearing the commotion. The killer left his victim to bleed to death. Why did he do it? And why were the warning signs ignored after his first victim? Before we begin, we would like to send our sincere condolences to the loved ones of Kay Baker, who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. Meet Kay Elizabeth Baker, a 43-year-old woman living in Lithia County, Florida, with her two sons. Kay was a third-grade math and science teacher at Cypress Creek Elementary School in Ruskin, beloved by her students and peers. It was on a quiet, warm spring night on May 28, 2022. Jonathan Figgins, who lives next door to Kay, was sleeping peacefully on his couch, his wife and children sound asleep upstairs. It was right after midnight when Mr. Figgins heard unsettling sounds that roused him from his sleep. The best he could describe what he heard was the sound of someone falling on the floor and then a female gasping for breath. Mr. Figgins first thought one of his daughters had fallen out of bed and hit the floor, but when he went upstairs to check, everyone was sound asleep in their beds. Upon investigating outside, Mr. Figgins spotted what he believed to be a teenage girl laying face down on the ground near his front yard. This woman later was identified as Kay Baker. Kay was lying in a pool of blood that appeared to be coming from around her neck. While checking the status of the injured woman, Mr. Figgins heard a sound from behind. He turned to hear a rustling sound that appeared to be coming from the wooded area behind his home, but he saw nothing. Mr. Figgins told his wife Ruth to call 911. By the time fire rescue and the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office deputies arrived, Kay was gone. The medical examiner who inspected Kay's body at the crime scene discovered that she had multiple stab wounds to her shoulders and neck. Kay's neck laceration was so extreme, detectives concluded that the attacker had intended to sever her head from her body. Deputies searched the perimeter of Kay's home. In the driveway, detectives found a gray Ford Focus. After running the tags, they found out that it belonged to a Matthew Terry. One window was open and the screen was knocked out. The room belonged to one of Kay's boys, neither of which were home that night. This window was facing the Figgins' home. From the window, turning right led to the front yard area, the area where Kay had been found. Left led into the backyard, where drops of blood were discovered. Detectives were able to quickly obtain a search warrant to enter Kay's home. Inside the house, it was noticed that in the kitchen, a single knife was missing from a butcher block knife set and a cell phone had been left nearby. The knife missing from the set was a specialized pairing knife called a bird's beak knife, given that name because of its three-inch curved blade, which resembled a parrot's beak. The knife was never located. 
The bathroom door frame had major damage, showing that someone had violently forced the door open at some point. The main bedroom showed recent signs of forced entry as well, and another cell phone was found on the nightstand. Deputies found the door to the child's room with the open window was locked, so they had to force the door open. They found no one inside the house. To follow the blood trail, deputies brought in a bloodhound. The scent led the dog into a thick wooded area behind the subdivision. After trailing the scent for a while, the bloodhound led the deputy to an area of woods off of Lithia Pinecrest Road. There, they found a patch of grass covered in blood. Knowing there was a good chance that the perpetrator was nearby, deputies decided to bring out a different canine unit, a Belgian Malinois, one trained to attack and apprehend criminals. Deputies led the dog towards the blood found by the bloodhound and shouted out warnings that they had a dog that will bite if whoever is out there doesn't come out. After a moment, the dog begins barking and attempts to charge forward. They soon found Matthew hiding in the tall grass and bushes. He was wearing only a t-shirt and his underwear. His clothes were soaked in blood. Matthew had injuries on his neck and was having difficulty walking. After apprehending Matthew, police ended their chase and Matthew was arrested on first-degree murder charges. May 27th marked the last day of the school season. To celebrate, Kay went to the Landing Bar and Grill that night with her boyfriend, 47-year-old Matthew Terry. At some point, Kay and Matthew got up to use the restrooms. Kay came out first and happened to run into a friend of hers, Kelly Andrews. Excited to bump into each other, Kay starts doing a little happy dance. As Kay is doing her little happy dance, a man, unknown to either Kay or Kelly, walked by and playfully mimicked Kay's happy dance as he passes by. This lasts for maybe four seconds. This interaction between Kay and the stranger occurred right as Matthew was walking out of the restroom. Matthew immediately jumped to the conclusion that Kay had danced with another man and became furious. At the bar, Matthew starts an argument with Kay, angrily accusing her of dancing with another man. This accusation is heard by both Kelly and a nearby bar patron. Matthew and Kay left the bar and headed home around 11.30 p.m. It was about a 90-minute drive back to their home, and Matthew continued to argue with Kay about dancing with another man. Kay decided to call Kelly and have her tell Matthew that she wasn't dancing with a passing stranger. Kelly overheard Kay tell Matthew to stop being stupid. After the phone call, Kelly received a text message from Kay at 11.56 p.m. that read, LOL, sorry for that, so dumb, all good now. About 30 minutes later, Mr. Figgins found Kay bleeding to death in his yard. Investigators at the crime scene believed Matthew had attempted to murder Kay while he was in a drunken rage. They believe he stabbed her multiple times and attempted to remove her head before she found a way to escape through a window and made her way into her neighbor's yard. Kay was not Matthew's first victim. He had a criminal history of violence towards women, which Kay was well aware of. Five years before Matthew murdered Kay in a jealous rage, he was in a relationship with a woman named Michelle Rogers. Matthew and Michelle had met over a dating app in 2015. They both lived in Michigan at the time. Michelle lived there with her five-year-old son. Matthew had spent a few years in the Marines. Around the time he met Michelle, he was working as a wrestling coach. After dating casually for a few months, Michelle decided that she wanted to end the relationship. That is, until she found out that she was pregnant. For the baby, Michelle thought it best to make her relationship with Matthew work. Soon, they moved in together. But all too soon, it became apparent that Matthew was abusive and violent, and these behaviors worsened when he drank. Once, he threw a cast-iron pan at Michelle while she was holding their infant son. Another time, Matthew picked up her cat and threw it against the wall. On nights when he was both angry and drunk, Matthew would show up at Michelle's apartment and bang on her door saying that he knew she was sleeping with another man and would demand to be let in. During that time, Matthew worked for a local internet provider. One day, he told one of his co-workers he wanted to stab the sh out of Michelle. The co-worker took Matthew's statement as a way of venting and thought nothing more of it. But a few months later, on March 17, 2017, 
it was brought to light just how serious Matthew was. Matthew and Michelle had gone out bar hopping with a few of their friends that day. Around 6 p.m., Michelle was ready to go home. She went looking for Matthew, who happened to be at a bar adjacent to the one that she was in. Michelle found him so drunk he was slurring his words and stumbling. Michelle was so upset by how drunk Matthew had allowed himself to get that she went home and left him at the bar. Around 8 p.m., Matthew comes knocking at the back door. He knocked at that door and I proceeded to let him in. Um, at that time, he was very clearly drunk. Um, he couldn't walk straight. Um, he seemed just very, um, you know, it's hard to describe, but just you could kind of sense his energy as being very frustrated or angry or upset, um, just in general, just right. the general sense. So as the kids say, you got a vibe off of him that he seemed angry? Correct. Did you do anything in that moment? I did not. I went and I sat back down on the couch where I was when he showed up. And what does he do? Uh, so he went into the kitchen, and I believe he was making a sandwich. He was making some kind of food at the counter, and um, the kitchen and the living room area is pretty open. So as I was sitting on the couch, I could I could see him. Um, um, so I remember sitting on the couch watching TV, and then you know the next thing I remember is standing behind the couch, and I'm I'm looking at him in the kitchen, and I remember him coming around the counter and coming at me. Um, and before that, before we get to the part where he comes at you, do you remember if you guys are having any sort of argument, if anything's being said, either he's saying something, you're saying something, whatever the case may be? I don't recall any of that, no. So you remember now all of a sudden there's a moment he's coming at you, and I want you to describe that as best as you can. Do you mean he's just leisurely walking in your direction? No, he was um, coming at me very quickly and aggressively to the point where I kind of backed off and, and braced myself, and I actually verbally said, you know, what are you doing? You know, oh my God, what are you doing? And when you said the words to him, what are you doing? What, if anything, did he do? Um, he proceeded to knock me into the, the front door that was behind me. Um, and at that point, then we both fell to the floor. Um, so then we're on the floor and he's just trying to keep me on the floor. And he keeps punching me um, wherever he can find access to punch me. So whether it be the face, the chest, the back, wherever. Um, and he... Is a was a wrestler and the best way I can describe what he was doing is trying to keep me in wrestling moves and keep me on the floor so that I couldn't escape when you say he's a wrestler you mean like in the WWE or you mean like a high school coach? a high school coach um, or a coach maybe it was not high school like but he was a wrestling coach um, and I can't remember if he wrestled himself but um, as as the struggle continues and I'm trying to break free there was a point um, when I yelled at him I said you know I love you why are you doing this and he he said um, no, you don't. Fuck you. I'm going to kill you. He just continues to, for lack of a better phrase, beat the shit out of me. Um, and I keep trying to escape. There is a point where I'm able to stand up, and he continues to punch me in the face. Um, at one point, he gets me onto the floor. and. Are you still in the same place by the door, or has the fight moved? No, nope, mo it moved through the living room, and then um, where I landed on the floor was, you know, I landed face first. Um with my upper body like on the kitchen tile and then my lower half was on the carpet of the living room um and at that point there was there was blood everywhere um where is the blood coming from i i believe my nose at that time he had broken my nose um but i remember trying to push myself up and he was on me and every time i tried to push myself up i couldn't grip on the floor because there was so much blood and um he would purposely put his weight on me and push me back down, so I, I was unable to get up. And through all of this, are you fighting, resisting, trying to stop him? Yes. So what comes next? Um, so I remember laying there, and I was laying on my left side, and I remember seeing the, the trash can there. There was a black trash can, and at this point, he was taking both of his hands, and he was taking my head, and he was slamming it into the floor. And... Um, so every time he would do that, my vision would go black. And I thought he was going to knock me out or I would be unconscious or something at some point. I was thinking, like, holy shit, that, you know, is this really happening? And I was really disoriented and dizzy. And I was, you know, I was hearing all the shuffling in the kitchen. Um, and then the next thing you know, um, Mr. Terry comes around behind me and stabs me in the neck. When you say he stabs you in the neck, do you know what he stabs you with in the neck? 
I didn't see it, but it was a knife. So at that point, uh, again, it was just kind of the thought like, holy shit, he just stabbed me with a knife. Like, I need, I need to get the hell out of this house or I'm going to die in here. And um, so I remember standing up, and as I stood up, he continued to, you know, try and stop me and try and punch me. I was able to get loose for enough time to be able to turn around, and directly behind me there was the garage door. Um, so I was able to get the garage door open and run to the garage. So I pushed the opener with my left hand as I, as I was running out um, to try and get the garage door to open so I could escape that way. And did the garage door start to open? It did, um, and I ran towards it, but it was very slow, um, so I couldn't quite get under it right away before he was able to get to me again. All right, so now you're waiting for the garage door open enough, and he attacks you again? Yes. Describe how he's attacking you again. Um, he, he was just trying to stop me from leaving, and um, we both fell to the ground at that point and somehow had rolled out of you know the garage that was open um, down the driveway. So now you've spilled out onto the driveway, like out in public. Correct. And what's happening there? Um, so we were rolling down the driveway a bit, and I ended up in a position where I was I was under him, and he was on top of me. Um, he had he had used both of his hands to take my head and slam it into the cement multiple times. Um, sorry. Um, so he had he had the knife, and he had stabbed me three times in the right shoulder. All right, so he's still armed with this knife, even though you fled out of the home and he's chased you. Yes, and this this entire time I'm I'm screaming for someone to come help me. At um, any point, do you realize that some sort of like neighbor or person nearby has responded to your calls for help? Yeah, as I was screaming, um, I could very faintly hear voices across the street um, saying, you know, get off of her, and and just hear them talking. Um, a lot of it I couldn't make out what they said. All right, and so we're at a point where Mr. Terry and you are in the driveway. You're still fighting. He's still armed with a knife. Tell me what else he's doing and what you're doing in response. So, again, I'm, I'm screaming this entire time, you know, that he's going to kill me and somebody please help me. Um, but he had, he had stabbed me those three times in the shoulder, and he went to bring the knife down again, and I had reached up, and I, I grabbed with my right hand the, the blade under the knife um, in midair. And don't ask me how I did it. Um, <laughs> I just grabbed. Um, and I took the knife and I, I pulled it, again, I'm on my back, and I, I pulled it across my face. And I just remember thinking he was going to, like, stab my eye out or something as I'm doing this. But I was able to pull the, I'm sorry, pull the knife enough over that it fell out of his hand. And it fell to my left side. Um, and then I kind of rolled over it and tucked it underneath me so that he didn't have access to it anymore. And so once you've kind of tucked the knife under your body, rolled onto it, does he stop fighting with you, or does he still no. keep trying to get the knife? No, he was still slamming my head to the floor, um, and because and he would he would reach down with his hand and he would try and like fish for the knife real quick, um, but then I would try to get up and then he would hold me back down again, and then you know kind of just back and forth like trying to fish for the knife and I'd get up and he'd try to fish for the knife, and then he pushed me back down and there was a point. Um, when he had gotten really pissed off because I was I was kind of you know holding the knife with my arm as it's tucked under me and he reached down and he bit me um, on the forearm here to try and get the knife loose um, from my grasp. Is that the only place he bit you? No. Um, shortly after that, after he fished a couple more times for the knife and couldn't get it, he reached down and um, he bit me twice on the side of the, my left cheek to try and get me to let go. And throughout all of this, are you screaming and yelling for help, asking him to stop, putting up resistance? Yes. So does this eventually, does the fight sort of end at some point? Um, yeah, so we didn't live that far from the hospital and stuff. And, and as the neighbors were, you know, I later found out they were on the phone with 911 at the time. We could hear sirens coming. You, you could hear them coming from around the corner, not too far away. And when... We both heard the sirens. That's when he got up off of me and ran back in the house. And what did you do? Um, I got up and I grabbed the knife so he couldn't get it back again. And I couldn't see very clearly because my contacts were in, but they were all like covered in blood. Um, but I, I ran across the street to the voices of the neighbors who were telling me to come over there, you know, come here. Um, and then I... I proceeded to go across the street and I collapsed on my back in their front yard. Like Kay, police found Michelle lying in her neighbor's yard after being bitten, beaten, and stabbed multiple times.
Michelle was lucky to survive the attack. However, she had to spend five days in intensive care. A detective, Matthew Crumback, who investigated the crime scene, said it was as close to a homicide as you could get without it being a homicide. For his violent acts towards Michelle, Matthew was charged with attempted murder. After being arrested for attacking Michelle, Matthew contacted an old friend to testify for him in court. That old friend was a woman he had dated nearly 20 years earlier. Her name was Kay Baker. Kay was more than happy to testify and stand up for her friend's character in court. She told the judge, Matthew is very truthful and I trust him completely. Michelle tried desperately to get Kay to see the monster that Matthew truly was. During the trial, Michelle sent Kay photos of her stab wounds through Facebook Messenger and said, please don't let this be you. But Kay could only see the man she knew Matthew to be back in those days 20 years prior when they dated. Kay was not the only one defending Matthew. He had many friends and family in the courtroom supporting him. They all just glared and shook their heads as Michelle spoke in court. Somehow, Matthew's lawyer convinced the jury that his attack on Michelle was in self-defense. He further explained, being an ex-Marine, Matthew used his training to neutralize the fight that Michelle had started. Matthew was sentenced to three to ten years in prison for assault with intent to cause great bodily harm. In a letter written to the Michigan Parole Board, Michelle said, If he gets out, I fear for myself and my family, and for the next victim. Society is in danger. Michelle's warnings fell on deaf ears, and Matthew served only three years before being discharged in December of 2021. Matthew was released on good behavior and had passed a domestic violence class. Matthew stayed in touch with Kay during those three years he spent in prison. After he was released, he moved to Florida to begin a new life with her. All seemed to be going well until the dreadful morning of May the 28th shined a light on what was going on behind closed doors. Matthew claimed he was not guilty of hurting or killing his girlfriend Kay. However, prosecutors believe Matthew murdered her in a jealous rage because he believed that she had danced with another man while they were at the bar. After Kay's murder, investigator Crumbach, who was part of the team who investigated the crime scene after Matthew's attack on Michelle, told the Times that Matthew Terry was a textbook case of an evil, narcissistic, manipulative killer. The trial between Matthew Terry and the state of Florida began in November of 2022. Prosecutors worked hard to convince the jury that Matthew was responsible for the death of Kay Baker and wanted Matthew to receive the death penalty. They believed Matthew had also tried to take his own life after murdering Kay. That's why he was found with multiple cuts on his throat. Matthew's lawyers tried to convince the jury that Matthew and Kay had been attacked by an intruder whom Matthew was unable to identify, and this perpetrator escaped out a window. Matthew's attorneys claimed that deputies gave up the chase too quickly. They assumed that Matthew was the killer immediately and therefore allowed the real killer to get away. Since the murder weapon was never recovered, Matthew's lawyers tried to downplay the size of the missing knife from the kitchen, the bird's beak knife, to state the knife's inability to do the damage that was done to Kay. Now, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was the knives. You said you actually looked and you're the one who found that there was that one bird's beak knife missing, right? Yes, ma'am. So that one bird's beak knife was the only one missing. Out of the butcher block? Yes, ma'am. And that is what we call um, a paring knife. It's a little curved knife, right? Yes, yes ma'am. There were a bunch of snake knives there, right? Uh, outside of the kitchen or the, the block in the drawer? Either in the block itself or outside of the block. There were a bunch of steak knives, right? Yes. A bunch there. of big knives too, right? Yes. And the one that we're talking about is a little itty bitty small paring knife and that's the only one that was missing from the home, right? Yes, ma'am. Do we have any idea if that ever even existed in the year prior? I cannot tell you that. 
Thank you. Matthew's attorneys fought hard to keep the previous case between Matthew and Michelle out of the current case, knowing how damaging it would be for the jury to know about Matthew's violent history. They didn't, however, get their way. Michelle was brought in to testify, and she shared the assault that she had suffered at the hands of Matthew back in 2017, which possibly played a major role in the jury's decision. Within only an hour and ten minutes, the jury unanimously convicted Terry on a charge of first-degree murder and sentenced him not to death, but to life in prison. But based on what I heard, I believe that you should have been in prison in Michigan and that Miss Baker should still be alive. This is Florida. You're going to prison for the rest of your life. I adjudicate you guilty. I sentence you to life in prison. I impose all fines, fees, associated charges, and I advise you that you have 30 days to appeal the judgment and sentence entered against you. Thank you. It's just a man parking his SUV in the lot of a small-town motel. Nothing out of the ordinary. The middle-aged man seems to be concerned with the appearance of his vehicle, taking extra care to polish it a bit here and there. He certainly doesn't seem to have a care in the world as he walks away. That's actually quite amazing, since the man, Daniel Prince of Bostick, North Carolina, had just brutally murdered an 80-year-old woman less than an hour before. No one who would have seen him walking down the street to another nearby parking lot would have any idea that a serial killer was casually moving among them, satisfied with his kill, and enjoying a warm, sunny day in South Carolina. No one would have suspected that he was on his way to put that woman's body in a shallow grave in the mountains of North Carolina. This was at least his fourth kill, and thanks to some carelessness on his part, it would be his last. Come with us as we look into the diabolical case of serial killer Daniel Prince. If you tell him to turn that off, I will talk to you a little more freely. Before we begin, we would like to extend our deepest sympathies to the loved ones of Edna Suttles and the other victims discovered in this devastating case. <laughs> The date was August 27, 2021, in the small town of Traveler's Rest, near the border between North and South Carolina, a scenic rural area in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. This Greenville County, South Carolina location is a quiet, out-of-the-way place, and it made a perfect hunting ground for 59-year-old Daniel Prince. Prince, working as a handyman, had been employed by Edna Suttles to do some work on her home a repair or two here or there, and a relationship between them developed, a friendship that brought Prince into her realm of trust. An 80-year-old retired businesswoman and the owner of A1 Freedom Bail Bonding, Edna was a fixture in the community, vibrant and active. She took care to check up on and assist a number of elderly people in her community as well. On this very morning, she was scheduled to sit with a homebound friend, a friend whose family was counting on her that day. Edna left her home that morning but never showed up at her intended destination. Greenville County 911, what's the location of your emergency? The thing is, a sitter was supposed to show up to be with my mom today, and she's in her 80s, and she didn't show up. We'd come to her house. And we can't get nobody to the door or anything. Her name is Edna Suttle. Vic's not like her. She shows up like clockwork. So something's wrong. In almost all jurisdictions, there's an unspoken rule that a competent adult is generally not considered missing until they've been out of contact for at least 24 hours. Very recently, however, the Greenville County Sheriff's Office had decided to change that policy. Initially, from a sheriff's office standpoint, our missing persons were reported by phone. We would take a report by phone. Uh, the Suttles case, we changed some things here, uh, and the Suttles case was 
kind of in time with that, if you will, where we were going to respond to every missing person. Um, usually it was, you know, there had to be some extenuating circumstances, some type of medical issue. Members of the sheriff's office were dispatched to make a wellness check on Suttles, but could get no answer at the door of her home. After obtaining a warrant, they entered the property. Inside, they did not find her, any evidence of foul play, or any clues as to her whereabouts. Her vehicle was not at the residence. That vehicle, a champagne-colored Jeep Grand Cherokee, would prove to be the starting point of suspicions that something terrible may have befallen the woman. Miss Suttles was a, she's pretty well known in the northern part of this county. Uh, she was a bail bonding agent. She was a tough lady, street smart, uh, had, a, had a great reputation here in our area. Uh, she was certainly nobody's fool. Edna was gone. The police put out alerts through all the local media. They described her vehicle, gave its license plate number, and warned that she could be in need of immediate medical attention. They could not have known that Edna had already been killed and taken across a nearby state line. It was seven days before the Jeep was found by an officer of a local police department on September 3rd in the parking lot of the Best Western Hotel in the town of Traveler's Rest. The Jeep had been backed into a parking space, concealing the license plate from anyone just driving through the lot. After determining that Edna had not checked into the hotel, members of the Greenville County Sheriff's Office scanned the hotel's security footage for the day of the disappearance. They found what they were looking for, footage of the Jeep being driven into the parking lot, and the person who got out was definitely not Edna Suttles. A man got out of the car and then began to wipe it down, paying particular attention to the inside of the front seat passenger's door and then the door frame and quarter panels. He left and then came back quickly to give it one more wipe down, and then he walked away, leaving the property. Any number of missing persons cases turn out to have nothing sinister about them. Some are just a person taking a short trip without telling anyone. Sometimes it can come from a mental health crisis, sometimes just a romantic rendezvous that ran a little long. At this moment, though, investigators realized that any pretense of Suttles willfully being out of touch with those that she knew was probably gone. This missing persons case had taken a serious and unsettling turn. Investigators now had to determine who the mysterious man was and what happened prior to the 1.46 p.m. timestamp on the security video. There were hours still unaccounted for from that morning when Suttles presumably left her home to visit and sit with a friend. In this day and age, security cameras are nearly everywhere, and investigators began searching for the pieces of the puzzle that was unfolding before them. Now, with a date and time to work backwards from, it was a matter of finding the footage and canvassing locations in the small town until they could pick up a trail. Working diligently, law enforcement was able to piece together video from around the area that gave a timeline for the day's events. At 9.22 a.m. on the morning of August 27, 2021, a security camera video shows a Chevrolet cruise pull into the parking lot at a Food Lion supermarket in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. Just eight minutes later, at 9.30 a.m., Edna Suttles drives away from her home in her champagne-colored Jeep Grand Cherokee. Security camera footage from a nearby antique store showed the time of departure and initial direction of travel. At 9.38 a.m., a man matching the appearance of the individual spotted leaving her Jeep at the Best Western purchases a pack of strawberry yogurt cups at Food Lion. The man uses the store rewards card, and investigators now had his name, identifying him as Daniel Prince. A minute later, Edna Suttles pulls into the grocery store parking lot and parks her vehicle near Prince's. Footage shows Prince holding a grocery bag and gesturing to Suttles. He then goes to his own car and retrieves a small bag. He gets into the front passenger seat of Suttles' Jeep. Minutes later, the Jeep leaves the parking lot with the pair inside. Four hours passed before there was any more video evidence. Then, at 1.43 p.m., Suttles' Jeep is seen driving away from her residence back in the direction of the Food Lion supermarket. Minutes later, at 2.02 p.m., the Jeep pulls into a different part of the parking lot than before. Prince is shown exiting the Jeep from the driver's side door and walking across the parking lot to the Chevy Cruze he had arrived in. 
Prince then moves his crews alongside the Jeep in the parking lot, front passenger door to front passenger door. He gets out and moves something from one vehicle to the other. A closer analysis shows that it is a person with the starkly blonde hair of Suttles. Prince then drives Suttles' Jeep away, and the blonde-haired person is left unmoving inside of Prince's car. Five minutes later, Prince parks the car at the Best Western parking lot, wipes it down, and walks back in the direction of the Foo Lion parking lot. At 2.14 p.m., Prince gets back into his Chevy Cruze with the unmoving Suttles and drives away. The trail of video evidence goes cold from there, but Prince's purchase led right to his door. The rewards card information provided an address in Bostick, North Carolina, about 70 miles away in the rural area of Rutherford County, North Carolina. So, who was this man, Daniel Glenn Prince? What connection could he have with Edna, and how did he come to meet with her on that fateful day? A native of Michigan, Prince had moved to the North Carolina mountains a few years before, making his home in one of the many hollers in Rutherford County. It's a friendly place, but one where a person who might want privacy is apt to find plenty of it. Prince and his wife, KK, settled in and he began working as a handyman, often for elderly single or widowed ladies. He had a knack for the work and also for developing relationship with those women, gaining their trust and befriending them. Prince, however, harbored a troubled past, one that he didn't bring up. As a youth, he had joined the military to get away from a life that was leading him down the wrong path. The stint in the military was short-lived, as was his avoidance of a life of crime. His criminal record showed charges of assault and battery as well as firearms violations. Most disturbing was his conviction in Michigan in 1997 for kidnapping a woman. He was sentenced to 13 to 30 years in prison for the crime and served 12 years of that sentence before being paroled. His parole was terminated two years later, and he moved out of the state not long after that before ending up in North Carolina. Detectives now had not just videos and a timeline, but they had the name of a man with a history of kidnapping. Quickly, the Greenville County Sheriff's Department contacted their counterparts in the Rutherford County Sheriff's Department just across the state line. Probable cause for auto theft had been established at the very least, and a warrant to arrest Prince and search his property was quickly granted. The Rutherford County Sheriff was more than willing to assist in serving that warrant. Prince surrendered with remarkable calm to the large number of heavily armed officers who had arrived at his property. Totally cooperating, just with my... Can I do anything? Can I Can I stand up on your feet? Stay right there. Yeah. Sir, I would be very cooperative. All right, let's try that, please. Prince was quickly taken into custody and on to the Rutherford County Sheriff's Department, where he was initially interviewed. It was obvious from the beginning that Prince wanted to run the interview and control the narrative. He was arrogant and seemed unfazed by what was happening. So, investigators let him talk. I want to talk to you about August 27th, 2021 of this year. What day of the week was that? Oh, it was a Friday. Okay. Which, which, where are you on that day? What's your typical Fridays like? Some Fridays I go do jobs. Some Fridays I stay home. Some Fridays I go look at jobs. I do all okay. sorts of things. Days run together for me because I don't have a set schedule. Fair enough. Whereas the jobs come, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So specifically the 27th. Mm-hmm. What, two weeks ago? Do you remember where you were at? Not specifically. Where do you think you were at? I've been going all over the place. I've been back and forth to okay. Charlotte. I've been down to South Carolina. Yeah. Like, I've where's been, your jobs in South Carolina taking you? Um, actually, I was down to Traveler's Rest, but I don't know if it was Friday or Thursday. I know I've been there earlier that week. Okay. But you don't remember which day specifically? No. It was either Thursday or Friday. What kind of job were you working on? I wasn't. You wasn't? I wasn't. This lady had talked to me several times. I'd been down to her house two or three times. We kind of got to be friends. This woman has so many damn problems, mostly her daughter. Yeah. And what she did is she had me looking at um, ductwork mm -hmm. that she wanted done. 
because somebody had done duct work for her and she was suing them oh, because wow. they didn't do all the duct work or yeah. something. She would call me and have me come down there. Okay. And she was constantly having problems. She said she needed to have money at one point in time to help her daughter because her daughter was in jail. Then she needed money another time because, um, what was it the next time? She was hiring a private investigator because her son-in-law was, she talked to me all kinds of stuff about it. We got to be pretty good friends about stuff like okay. that. But she kept seeing like she was blowing me off and I actually doing any work for her. She wanted me, she was going to have a guy come out and wash her house and I said, well, if I'm coming down here to look at other stuff, I got a power washer, I can wash your house and clean out your eaves for a couple hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. She was going to have me do it. Packed my power washer up, went down there, never did the work. Because she's, I don't have the money right now. I got to sell a bunch of jewelry. I got to sell a bunch of stuff to go ahead and get more money for a private investigator. Then she wanted a different private investigator because she didn't like the one she had. So it was like one excuse after the other. How'd you meet her initially? Years ago. Okay. Years ago, it was somebody had given me her name or number or her my name and number. I get passed around a lot. Okay. So it was a years ago thing. That's pretty awesome. Your name made all the way down to your Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. That's good reputation. Yeah. You know, solid work. All right. So, so why what, are we? What you're telling us is that's not you on the 27th. Food line parking lot, Traveler's Rest. I don't think so. That's not you. That's me. Where's That's that? Food line, August 27th, 2021, 923. Okay. 326. Ring a bell? Yep. Yeah, I went down to food line. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what were you doing down there that day? Um, she wanted me to look at some stuff at her house. Okay. And she picked me up at Food Lion because she wanted me with her when she was um, going to go meet some guy for her, uh, for her, um, God damn it, private investigator. Okay, yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us about that. She wanted me to meet her down there. Okay. She was nervous because she says, I'm not sure I trust this guy. And she knows I've been in the military. And she says, will you meet me? And I go, yeah. And I said, where do you want to meet? She says, well, he's been talking to me. I guess I'm supposed to meet him at a restaurant. And um, I'm supposed to meet him down near Food Lion. Okay. So I went down to Food Lion and she met me. And <clears throat> he didn't show up where we went to next. And she had been trying to get a hold of him. And we went to her house for about two hours. And then we went back to Food Lion and it just, she just dropped you off and you went home and you just know something about PI? Well, she wanted me to see if this guy was going to meet her okay. where he was supposed to meet her. Do you know where? There was a hotel lobby that he had finally said, meet me at the hotel. Okay. She says, drive up there and see if he's there. And I drove up there and things are starting to sound really squirrely to me. And then she finally said, just drop me off at home. And if you drop me off at home, my daughter will pick me up. And I said, because I got to get going. I can't be yeah. doing this all day. So that's you all uh, coming down 25, you and her together. Back, back towards the hotel. It could be. Okay. Because that's her car. That's about 1345 on the 27th. Okay. So that's so you're with her there? Yeah. Okay. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying, yeah. I'm, I'm just saying yeah. that could be her. Yeah, it's a different angle. But I mean, you know, we've watched this car, right? Okay. Here's y'all in the uh, hotel parking lot. Okay. Yeah. Oh, look. There's y'all you all backing in. Yep. Yeah, a couple of different copies of it backing in, backing in. Yeah. Oh, look. You get out. Nobody else gets out. I told you that. You're walking around the car. Yeah. You wipe the entire car down. Because I was worried. You were worried. There's you walking across the parking lot in front of Little Caesars. Mm -hmm. 
And there's you getting back into your car and driving away. Oh, she's with me. Look, man. Where's that? We need, I don't have a we need to know. And I, listen, Dan, mm -hmm. okay? You are a good dude. I honestly do believe that, that you screwed up years and years ago. Okay. And now... Can I look at these? What? I just want to look and see what you're talking about. Let's... let's you're not a bad guy. That's right. Nobody is saying that you're some evil, twisted dude. Mm -hmm. Okay? Where's the right now? Her family is desperately looking for her. She's missing right now. Yes, Dan. Where is it? I don't have a clue. Yes, I dropped her off at her house. Dan, Dan, please listen. You did not drop her off at her house. We have followed that car the entire day, up and down 25. Mm -hmm. There's a number of minutes that are unaccounted for that are not by her house. Okay? Which car? Mine or hers? Dan, stop playing games. You know what? When I got about. okay, I can help you here. Okay. You gotta give me a second. You gotta let me answer the questions when they're asked. When I dropped her vehicle off looking for the guy, she said. She wanted me to take her and drive around in my vehicle, so I left her vehicle. I went down to Food Lion, and she was in my vehicle with me, and I dropped her off at home. Damn, we watched the video. She is not... The yeah. car sits there. It sits there, man. No, no, not in her car. Never. My car. We watched I dropped you go her off the food my line. car. You did not drop anyone off, man. I picked her back up. She yeah. sat in my car at food line and I went back and got her. No, you did not. When are you trying to say? Please explain. Explain yourself. Please explain at which point that we must have missed in the video that you dropped her off. Why your that your vehicle never went back to her house. We have your vehicle, that silver car going straight up 25 and not stopping at her house. That's not true. It is true. I Dan. stopped at her house. What's your wife going to think about this? Well, my wife would be very upset if I had done something, but I didn't, and I don't know where Edna is. I think you do, Dan. No. I don't know where Edna is. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Dan. Let's go back to why you wiped the car down. What, what you said you were worried about what? The only thing I did was because I knew I'd been in and out of her car all the time mm -hmm. with her. I'm like, there is no way in hell I'm going to just leave this thing here mm -hmm. because she's got somebody that's after her. It's not making sense. Of, it's, I mean, you're the last person to be in a vehicle you wipe down of a, of a lady that's missing. That sounds really fucked up. It does. Mm -hmm. it does. That's why we're here. But and then it's, it's fucked up as it sounds. We're having to do it right. We're going to do it right. Until, but we got guys down there now that are homing in about where we think she might be. His story rambled, and it didn't really add up, but the holes weren't big enough to catch him just yet. As the interrogation went on, deputies were still at work searching his property. The officers there found a formidable arsenal, including two AR-15 variants and up to 20 handguns, plus a large stockpile of ammunition. The serial numbers on both the AR-15s had been removed. Chapter 44 of Title 18 of the United States Federal Code bans convicted felons from owning firearms, and here he was with many of them in his possession. The removal of serial numbers is also illegal, building even more trouble for the man. The firearms violations immediately upgraded this investigation to the federal level, meaning that Prince could be held longer as the investigation continued. As the search of Prince's house continued, more damning evidence turned up, but not evidence dealing directly with the disappearance of Edna Suttles. This evidence would end up bringing down a serial killer who had lived unnoticed by the surrounding community for years and whose crimes were unknown even to the wife he shared his home with. Deputies discovered among his possessions the driver's license and passport of Nancy Rigo, age 66, a woman from nearby Charlotte, North Carolina. Rigo, a widow, had been missing since 2017 and had only made sporadic email and text contacts with her family members since that time. 
Rigo, or the person who may have been posing as her online, always refused to meet directly with family members when asked. The same family members would verify that Rigo and Prince were supposed to be in a relationship during this time. Her wallet was also found among his possessions, along with financial records that indicated Prince's address was now hers. Prince was also found to have Rigo's bank card in his wallet. It's not hard to see the possibility that Rigo was dead and that Prince had been using her money rose to the suspicions of law enforcement. A separate search warrant had been issued now to look for additional information on Rigo while the search for Suttles continued. The search allowed for the seizure of the aforementioned items, plus a purse that had belonged to Rigo's mother, Dolores Sellers Gore, who had passed away in 2017 from what had been called natural causes at the time. Prescription bottles with Rigo's name on them were also found, ones for cyclobenzaprine, tramadol, and lorazepam, all filled in 2017. A black bag was found with more sinister contents. That bag contained zip ties, a taser device, lubricant, and crushed pills in a bag labeled Ativan, the brand name for lorazepam, a strong sedative that can be used to slow breathing and even cause death when combined with alcohol or some other substances. In custody, Prince was playing for time and maintaining his innocence when it came to Suttle's disappearance. On October 9th, as Prince sat in jail, his time ran out. Prince's wife decided it was time to leave and began efforts to put the home and surrounding property on the market. She enlisted a couple of friends to help with cleaning up the property and wrangling together a few chickens and other domesticated birds that were living on the property. One of those friends, while walking along the outer edges of the property, spied a large white bee box deep in the woods at the very corner of the land. K.K. Prince had been unaware of its existence and the contents that her friend found within. She quickly called law enforcement to search the box. After obtaining another search warrant, deputies from the Rutherford County Sheriff's Department found Suttle's purse, Jeep keys, rope, zip ties, and a variety of other small items belonging to her. A single opened cup of yogurt of the same type and flavor that Prince had purchased on that fateful day was also inside the box. Nearby was a vehicle's back floorboard panel, a black plastic bag, and a tarp. The floor panel would match one missing in Prince's other vehicle, a vehicle that had been taken in for repairs right after Suttle's disappearance. The repair shop verified that among the repairs was a request to replace that cargo compartment panel matching the one that was found in the woods. The trash bag also found at the scene included some personal items, possibly belonging to Suttles, such as jewelry, a bracelet, and a pair of shoes. The items were sent off for testing to the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division's Forensic Services Laboratory, and the yogurt container came back showing signs that drugs had been mixed with the yogurt. Those traces of drugs included cyclobenzaprine, tramadol, and lorazepam, matching the same pill bottles of Nancy Rigo that were found in Prince's home. Realizing that a piece of linchpin evidence had been found, law enforcement brought in a cadaver dog to search the property on October the 10th. While the dog could not find Suttle's body at the site, it did alert officers that it detected the scent of human remains at the same location where the panel, trash bag, and tarp had been found. The body had not been located, but officers moved with a certainty that they had evidence of Suttle's murder. Sitting in jail, Prince so far held fast to his story through two interviews. He had admitted to knowing Suttles and having to come to Traveler's Rest to visit her a number of times before. He first maintained that on the day of her disappearance, he had met up with her, driven back with her to her home to discuss some matters about a private investigator that had been hired to look into her daughter's upcoming divorce. He then returned to the Best Western parking lot alone in her Jeep to retrieve his own vehicle and go home. He explained that he wiped down the vehicle to keep himself out of the private investigator's efforts. He stood pat on this explanation, thinking no connections had been found that would upend his story. Now, however, armed with new evidence, law enforcement agents began a third custodial interview with the man. 
It became quickly evident that Prince knew he was caught, and he moved quickly to control the narrative and as much of the outcome as he could. There are things that have to happen, and there are things that are going to happen. And I'm a realist, and I have acceptance with this. I would like a little bit of control in how they happen. If you tell them to turn that off, I will talk to you a little more freely. For almost an hour, Prince confessed to law enforcement, stating that he needed to fully disclose his sins. He said that he knew he was looking at life imprisonment at best, and he quickly made a deal to ensure that he would not see the death penalty handed down to him. As part of the deal, he wanted to inform them of things that were not on law enforcement's radar and that he would come clean when his attorney was present. Most importantly, he told the officers where they could find Suttle's body. In May of 2022, Prince led law enforcement officers to a piece of ground on a nearby property where they found her body buried but still identifiable. Still, in the custodial interview, he went on to explain that he had been involved in the deaths of Dolores Sellers, Nancy Rigo, and Lee Goodman. He had confessed to multiple murders. A serial killer had been uncovered. In the matter of the deaths of Dolores Sellers and Nancy Rigo, he claimed that he had hypothetically assisted euthanizing the elderly Sellers, hinting that Rigo had been a part of the process. He intimated that Rigo later was bothered greatly by what had happened and had threatened to tell the police. Rigo then became his next victim. He disposed of her body, did not tell anyone, and used a power of attorney that she had given him to have her social security checks routed to his residence. Seller's death, originally attributed to natural causes, was reinvestigated and then declared a homicide. The third victim, Lee Goodman, was originally from Florida and had disappeared in the time between the deaths of Rigo and Suttles. Prince claimed that Goodman had attempted to rob him, but that it did not work out well, and her body was disposed of in a rural area after he had cleaned up the incident. No evidence of a robbery was ever found. Prince avoided trial and was sentenced to life imprisonment. We certainly want to thank y'all for joining us today as we announce an arrest and subsequent plea deal has been reached in connection with the disappearance and death of Edna Suttles. She went missing from Greenville County on August the 27th of 2021. This investigation uncovered the man responsible, a man who has now been identified as a serial killer residing in Boston, North Carolina, 59-year-old Daniel Glenn Prince. He is serving his term with no chance at parole at the United States Penitentiary, Hazleton, located in Bruce Mills, West Virginia, a maximum security prison. It is known by its inmates as Misery Mountain, an apt destination for such a man. While Daniel Prince will continue to live out his remaining days, his actions devastated families and communities. Our hearts go out to the victims of the crime, knowing that each of them left behind loving families and friends who, up until now, had no answers as to what had happened to their loved ones. Still, there is a question. Did Daniel Prince confess to all of his sins or just a handful of them? Could there be other victims left behind in places he lived before he got to Bostick, North Carolina and was eventually caught? Until he decides to say otherwise, we have to live with the hope that his trail of terror began and ended with these four unfortunate women. This is a case you won't soon forget. Deep in the Appalachian foothills of Pike County, Ohio, eight members of the Roden family were slain, execution style, in their beds on the night of April 21st into the morning of the 22nd, 2016. Three children, all aged three and under, were spared 
and a tight-knit Appalachian community was left with questions of who had done such an act and why. The largest mass murder in Ohio history would also set off one of its largest criminal investigations. I just might tell you this is just the most bizarre story uh, I've ever seen in being involved in, in law enforcement. Before we begin, we would like to send our sympathies to the loved ones who fell victim to these abominable acts on this dark night. The western edge of the Appalachian Mountains is home to Pike County, Ohio, some 28,000 souls call the area home in a handful of small towns and among the valleys and hollows of the area. It can be a hard scrabble place to live with fully 24% of its population living at or below the poverty line. Opportunity is a rare resource, but it is balanced by a fierce independence. A frantic phone call to 911 on the morning of April the 22nd would lead authorities to the evil that had been done as the sister of one of the victims arrived at the property to feed the animals on the farm. There's blood all over the house. Okay. My brother was in bed during the whistle. I'll beat the hell out of him. She, Bobby Joe Manley, and her brother, James, then went into the house, discovering the horrors that had been done. Law enforcement officers and first responders flocked quickly to the scene and went into the cluster of three homes. The grisly discoveries they made showed that the attackers had achieved complete and total surprise on their victims. In the living room of the first house, they found the patriarch of the Roden clan, 40-year-old Christopher Roden Sr. Christopher had been shot nine times from very close range and was the only one of the entire family to show even the slightest signs of defensive wounds. Five of the shots were to the face and head, another three in his torso, and a single gunshot was in his arm, as if he had attempted to ward off the attack. Nearby lay the body of Gary Roden, age 38, Christopher's cousin. The man had two gunshot wounds to the head from close range and a third close enough to leave a muzzle stamp on his temple. There was no sign of struggle from Gary, and it is thought he was asleep at the time the first shot was fired. In the next house, Chris's eldest son, Clarence Frankie Roden, and his fiancée, Hannah Hazel Gilly, were found murdered in their bed. Their four-month-old child was found unharmed, laying between them, while their three-year-old child was found asleep on the floor. Frankie had been shot three times in the head and face. Hannah Gilly had been shot through the eye and an additional four times. James Manley then rushed down to the third home, that of his sister and Chris Roden Sr.'s ex-wife, Dana Roden, a home they shared with their 16-year-old son, Chris Jr., and daughter Hannah. Hannah, 19, had just given birth four days before to her second child. Dana had been shot five times in the head, including point-blank shots through the temple and one upwards under the chin. In a nearby room, Chris Jr. was found with two fatal gunshots down through the top of his head. In the last room, Hannah Roden was found, dead from two gunshot wounds to the head. The newborn baby was unharmed and still attempting to suckle at the mother's breast. Her two-year-old daughter, Sophia, was staying with its father and the family while Hannah recovered from the birth, and so she had been spared this night of horrors. As police and first responders swarmed over the scene, the area was cordoned off and the members of the local community began to gather to offer support and to share in the shock of the discoveries. As news spread about the killings, a man from the crowd, Donald Stone, a cousin of Chris Roden Sr., began to worry about another member of the Roden clan who lived a few miles further down the road. He quickly called Kenneth Roden, age 44, and no one answered. Stone and two friends quickly drove down to Kenneth's small home and found that that man had not been spared the grisly fate of the other members of the family. He lay dead in the house, a single gunshot wound through his eye, fired from close range. When you walked up to the residence, did you notice, uh, was the door unlocked? Yes. Okay. So you walked into the residence, 
together and you said Luke was there first but then you and then what happened and then we walked in he we walked into the supposedly the living room and I noticed to the right I didn't see him in there nowhere so I seen a stairway to the right and I walked up the stairway and that's where I found him up there in his bed and when you say you found him <laughs> I found Kenny can you tell us what condition you found him in? He had blood all over his eyes. And where was he located? In his bed. Okay. Did you believe him to be dead or alive at that time? He was dead. There were now eight dead, all members of the same extended family. And there was a disturbing lack of evidence as to who had committed the massacre. No shell casings were found. There were no reports of any gunshots. Two pit bulls that lived at one of the trailers didn't even start barking that night. And that particular pair of dogs had a reputation for being hostile to anyone they did not know. In addition, not a single cell phone was found among the victims. There were no other signs of theft, and so the missing phones had to in some way be a removal of possible evidence by the perpetrators. The sheer number of deaths without any signs of the victims being alerted pointed to multiple assailants rather than a single suspect. But who could have done it? Forensic experts from the County Sheriff's Department and the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation scoured the scene for any evidence they could find. Police sought out witnesses and tips, racing to outpace rumor and the code of the hills that might keep some people silent. Families in the community attempted to cope with the loss of so many lives as they buried their loved ones in the deep, dark hills of Appalachian, Ohio. The rodent patriarch, Chris Sr., and his brother, Kenneth, had a reputation for being on the wrong side of the law. A discovery of a pot growing operation in the barn next to Kenneth's house and the discovery of what could have been a cockfighting ring set up at the family complex only strengthened the suspicions that those endeavors had brought an end to those men. Rumors swirled about the community that the rodents had been involved with a Mexican drug cartel and that that had led to their demise. Killings like these had been the hallmark of those organizations, but never in areas as far north as Ohio. Two recent busts in pot growing operations in Pike County had shown tenuous links to the Mexican drug cartels, so the smaller operation of the rodents could conceivably have been part of the bigger picture. Others said that the rodents had been part of the Cornbread Mafia, a large-scale drug operation that worked throughout the five-state area of the central Appalachian Mountains. That organization runs pill mills and meth labs, making use of communities back in those hidden hollers of the region, as well as short travel distances across state lines to facilitate the gathering of the necessary manufacturing materials. More of a loose confederation than a true cartel, the Cornbread Mafia, as it was known, had some history of violence, but nothing like the concerted mass killings seen here. Still, law enforcement could not rule out that organization had moved into a new phase of violence. Hundreds of tips poured into law enforcement and rewards were posted looking for evidence in the slayings. State and local investigators poured through the tips and tracked down potential connections all to no avail. Enticing leads ended up going nowhere. The vehicles, mobile homes, and other evidence was removed from the rodents' property and put into storage to preserve it as their work continued. Custody of the three children left alive at the scene and two-year-old Sophia was brought to the courts to decide. Little Sophia, safely at the home of her father and another set of grandparents on the night of the murders, it turns out, would be the linchpin for the entire investigation and the centerpiece for the entire massacre. Investigators had no way of knowing at the time that what looked like an organized crime hit was actually a vendetta between two families that played out over the custody of that small child. Billy Wagner and Chris Roden Sr. had history together, there was no doubt about that. They didn't live that far apart and both were from a more rough and tumble part of the community. The possibility that they had sometimes been partners in crime and possibly competitors in it was common knowledge of that part of local lore. 
Billy's son, Jake, and Chris's daughter, Hannah Roden, had dated from the time she was 13 until a year or so before the killing, and they shared the daughter, Sophia. Outwardly, Billy Wagner shared nothing but praise and friendship about Chris, particularly in an interview with the Ohio BCI. Me and him, you know, our plan was gonna buy a bar on the beach and just sit there and, you know, get drunk, sit on the beach and, you know, play with strippers. <laughs> Once again, outwardly, the entire Wagner family seemed to be very concerned with Sophia's well-being. They filed for custody of the child shortly after the murders, producing documents allegedly signed by Hannah Roden, stating that the father would have sole custody of the child should anything happen to her. And as the community settled back into normal life over the next few months, the Wagners, as a group, pulled up stakes and left the community. They headed to Alaska, about as far away as you could get from the violence that had occurred in Ohio. They would return as a group, along with a new wife for Jake, about a year later. Things had cooled down in Pike County, and while the investigation wore on, life there had returned to normal for the regular population. The Wagners reintegrated into the community, and all the men got jobs at a local trucking company, where they were, for all intents and purposes, model employees. And that, on retrospect, was a little outside of their normal pattern. The Wagners had never been known as what one would call a model family, or even a normal one. In a region where families are close-knit and clannish by nature, the Wagners stood out. Growing up, the two sons, George and Jake, were homeschooled and kept close to the house. The tight family structure even held up after the parents, Billy and Angela Wagner, divorced, with Angela moving into a small home just down the road. While they kept to themselves and voted together on every family decision, it created a strong and indelible bond between them. When George married, his wife was also brought into the fold and kept under very controlling influences of the main four. When Jake married a woman while the family was in Alaska, she too would find herself under the crushing, controlling nature of the family. Not long after the family returned to Pike County from their stay in Alaska, something happened and the two women bolted. What they told police and family members is not public knowledge, but perhaps coincidentally, the investigation into the Roden family massacre turned towards the Wagners. The facade of friendship and custodial care fell apart quickly, and a sinister story began to unfold, one of an illicit underage love affair, jealousy, and conspiracy a story that would lead to cold-blooded, calculated murders, all to obtain permanent custody of the young Sophia. Assistant Attorney General Angela Canapa, leading the prosecution in the case, laid out the beginnings of the love affair to the court, setting the stage for what was to come. It kind of starts with a love story, if you want to call that. Um, a very young teenage girl, Hannah Mae Roden, age 13 at the time, was at the Pike County Fairgrounds. Um, she participated in 4-H and she had bunnies and uh, somebody introduced her to Jacob who was almost 18 at that time and she kept asking him, him to um, look at her bunnies or pet her bunnies. Um, Jake will tell you that he was annoyed initially um, but then on a second um, chance meeting um, they started dating, if you can date at age 13. That was in August of 2010. Um, reportedly, Jake gets permission from Chris Roden Sr. to date his daughter, his very young daughter. Um, Chris Roden agrees, but he always sends along a chaperone, either Frankie or little Chris, go with Hannah Mae when she, whenever she's hanging out with um, Jake Roden. And you will learn as well that Chris Roden Sr. also knew Billy Wagner. They were in fact friends. Um, and so because of that, he gave his permission um, for her to be dating Jake. Assistant Attorney General Angela Canapa, leading the prosecution in the case, laid out the beginnings of the love affair to the court, setting the stage for what was to come. 
The two broke up after jealousy and anger took a turn for the worse within Jake. She called her father to come and get her after Jake allegedly choked her. She said that she couldn't take not just Jake, but how the whole family attempted to control her life. From there, the battle began over who should have full-time custody over the child. Hannah proclaimed on social media to her friends that she would never give the baby up to Jake and she'd rather die than give a child up to him and his family. What she did not know was that the messages were being monitored as Jake and his mother, Angela Wagner, had hacked into her Facebook account. A seemingly private statement to her friends may well have set the families on a direct path that would lead to her death and those of seven of her loved ones. Jake had already made statements saying that he didn't like the people Hannah was seeing and who their child was being exposed to. It was during this time that Hannah began dating a man named Charlie Gilly, the brother of her sister-in-law, Hannah Gilly. The short-lived relationship would result in another pregnancy for young Hannah Roden. The birth of that child didn't just further push Jake over the edge, but it also provided the Wagner family with an opportunity to enact a plan they had been working on for some time. Four months prior to the birth of the child, Jake and his family had gathered around a table in their home to entertain a plan devised by Billy Wagner to remove Hannah, not just from the picture alone, but to remove anyone else who might have a claim to Jake and Hannah's child, Sophia. The possibility that other scores between the two families were going to get settled as well cannot be ruled out. The Wagners voted on it, as they often did with many life decisions that would affect the group. There were killings to be done, and afterwards they would file legal motions for the custody of Jake's daughter. No one would be left to stand in their way, and there would be no challenges to follow. What happened next was months of planning, purchasing, and preparing to do the deeds. The Wagners knew they had to cover their tracks and be discreet in every phase of the plan if they were to get away with their skullduggery as they intended. They needed to be thorough in the killings. They needed to be quiet in the planning. They needed to leave no evidence behind and they needed to make sure no one would be alerted to the killings as they were happening. Investigators also found receipts and video evidence of the Wagners making purchases of shoes during the same month of the homicides that matched identically the shoe tread marks left in blood at one of the scenes. The family began by purchasing two pairs of athletic shoes from a nearby Walmart, one for each of the sons. The shoes were not the size worn by the children, the shoes were not used and instead were intended to be worn on the night of the murder. The shoes were different sizes than the young men normally wore and of styles they would not normally have chosen. Handguns were obtained for each of the two sons. The firearms chosen were 22 caliber long rifle semi-automatic pistols, quieter and with less recoil than a larger caliber pistol but still very deadly, particularly at the short ranges used in the murders. The men also purchased a manufactured suppressor for one and parts for making a second for the other gun. While not completely silencing the gunfire, these would limit the sound to just coughs that wouldn't carry well outside of the trailers the Roden family lived in. In addition, they purchased brass catchers, pouches which are slung on the pistols to catch ejected shells after each shot were purchased and mounted on the guns. The two sons practiced with those weapons and others extensively over the intervening months in a wooded area behind the Wagner family property as shown by later investigations where bullets were recovered from standing trees. In addition, the remnants of a burned-out homemade suppressor were found in the area after Jake told them where to look. The family also purchased a cell phone jamming device to be used during the slayings, and both young men dyed their hair to further change their appearances. While this was going on, according to Angela Wagner's testimony and plea deal, documents were forged showing that Hannah had signed a statement saying that if she were to die or to become unable to care for the child, custody of Sophia would revert to Jake Wagner and his family. 
Those documents would be held until a few days after the killings in hopes that they would receive the child in a way that would make them look caring and concerned and wanting to participate in the child's life, but not in the mother's death. The Wagner's son also began to stake out the Roden family homes. They were both familiar with the property and the people who lived there and how they came and went. What they learned now was the activity patterns of the family. When did they come home? How late did they stay up? Were there visitors after dark and when the family slept? The information would serve them well in the terrible task they were undertaking. The fateful evening came right after Hannah Roden had given birth to her second child. Sophia had been sent to the Wagners for a couple of nights while Hannah, at her own home, recovered from the birth of the new child. As the Wagner plan sprang into action, Hannah went to bed with her newborn and went to sleep. The Wagners drove up to the Roden family property that included three trailers and homes along with a number of outbuildings and other farm features. The father, Billy Wagner, went into the house of Chris Roden Sr., ostensibly to recruit him for a lucrative drug deal. George and Jake hid in the pickup truck as their father gained entrance to the home. With murderous efficiency, they moved from home to home, killing adults and youths, but leaving the infants and toddlers untouched, just as they had planned. And then, they disappeared into the night and began their plans to dispose of any evidence and assume their roles of shocked, surprised, and concerned members of the community, ones who shared a bond of friendship and near family with the murdered rodents. The truck was ditched outside of the area. Their clothes and shoes were disposed of. The weapons, which could certainly incriminate them if ever found, were made to disappear in an ingenious manner. A cousin of the Wagners was having a birthday in the very near future. The man was a fisherman and often took his boat out on nearby lakes and waterways to enjoy his activity. The Wagners took the guns, shell casings, and suppressor remnants and placed them in gallon buckets strung on long lengths of rope. They then poured wet cement into the buckets and let them dry, sealing the evidence of their deadly deeds and they turned them into boat anchors as gifts to the cousin. Those anchors were later taken out to a local lake, and their lines were cut, sending the evidence to the muddy bottom. They would have remained there, unknown and lost, had things not taken the turn that they did. The four publicly maintained the image throughout their move to Alaska and again back to Ohio, but cracks began to appear in the facade. Perhaps the two women who left the family gave information. Perhaps someone at work overheard a conversation. But whatever it was, local and state law enforcement began putting together the pieces. Soon, listening devices were hidden in the work trucks used by the Wagners, and a wiretap was begun as well. The Wagners were questioned as to their relationships with the rodents, then brought in and finally charged with the murders and the other crimes dealing with that night. We promised that the day would come when arrests would be made in the Pike County massacres. Today is that day. George Billy Wagner III, his wife Angela Wagner, and their sons, George Wagner IV, and Edward Jake Wagner. After an extensive, thorough joint investigation by the Attorney General's Office, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, as well as our Special Prosecution Section, and Pike County Sheriff Charles Reeder's Office, these four individuals are now in custody for allegedly committing this heartless, ruthless, cold-blooded murder. I'd only been sheriff of Pike County less than a year before April 22nd of 2016. And that day changed a lot of our lives, including mine. The images of the houses, the bodies, the scenes, I can never erase them. Even 20 years of law enforcement experience cannot prepare you fully for a day like that day. Every single day since, 
that day I have worked, we have worked as a team to figure out who did this in Pike County where I have spent my entire life. We have obsessively focused on solving this case. We've been patient when it was painful to be, running down every lead, no matter how small. But it all has brought us to this day. Today we have the answer. Members of one family conspired, planned, carried out, and then allegedly covered up their violent act to wipe out members of another family. They did this quickly, coldly, calmly, and very carefully, but not carefully enough. Sitting in jail, proclaiming their innocence, the specter of COVID-19 dropped onto the world, and the family found themselves incarcerated, separated, and awaiting trial for nearly two years. Two years that proved to be too much for Jake. Jake Wagner cracked under the weight of the silence and admitted to all 23 charges that had been levied against him. He cut a plea deal with the state in exchange for the death penalty not being used against him or his family. He would tell everything. He said that he personally pulled the trigger on five of the killings, leaving the other three deaths to weigh on the shoulders of his father and brother. He also testified that his mother did not have a hand in the actual killings, but that she had stayed home that night. He did, however, implicate her in the conspiracy, the cover-up, and the forgery of the custody documents. With his plea deal, Jake will serve eight concurrent life sentences for his crimes with no chance at parole. Angela will serve a 30-year sentence for her role. Both Billy and George are undergoing trials for these crimes at the time of this story. Both have refused to admit their guilt. Text messages obtained from the night of the killings corroborated, in part, his story of the pretext for the meeting of Billy Wagner and Chris Roden Sr. The weapons, hidden in the cement anchors, were recovered and broken from their molds. Bullets matching those recovered from the bodies were found in random trees on the back portion of the Wagner's property, along with the remnants of the burned-out homemade suppressor, like those found with the recovered weapons. It was a long, slow grind, but the wheels of law, if not justice, seem to have finally caught up with those who murdered the members of the Roden family six years ago. Jealousy and rage, conspiracy and lies, all have now given way to the survivors, who must carry on however they can. Our thoughts and hopes go with them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we need a car here at 1231 Temple Drive, okay. Winter Park, Florida. There's a woman that's a danger to herself and to others right Not now. Oh, okay. The gentleman is a danger to us. Uh, this audio recording was made in the evening of January 11, 2019, when Michael Redlick would call 911 to frantically report a woman who posed a danger to herself and to others. Without providing more information, he told the operator that he would call back in five minutes as his attention was drawn away from the call by this dangerous woman. But Michael would never make that second call. In fact, this would be the last call he ever made and the last anyone would ever hear from Michael because by the next morning, Michael was dead. Uh, I don't know. I think my husband is deceased. There's been a tragedy at my home. What's the, what's the address up there? 1231 Temple Drive, Winter Park. What's going on at 1231 Temple Drive? I believe my husband is deceased. Okay. And why do you believe he's deceased? Because he's been... Uh, I, I just... He's stiff and he's... He might have had a heart attack, I don't know. Okay, did you just find him? No, actually, it happened last night. It happened last night? Correct. Okay, how old is your husband? He's 65. So did you find him this morning? Because I know you said that you believe it happened last night. Did you see him last night? Was he okay or was... 
you were not okay last night. We had we had altercation and he stabbed himself and I ran into the bathroom and then when I came out I tried to help him and I thought he was in lying in blood. And then I tried to help him and I put him in Correct, yes. And then I tried to help him and I thought I woke up with sitting up next to him. And uh-huh. I was trying to figure out what to do. Right. So you all had an altercation last night, correct? Yeah. All right. Are there any weapons on scene now? A uh, knife. A knife? Mm-hmm. Okay, so Danielle, let me ask you this. So did he stab himself last night? Did he pass last night? And you just didn't know what to do? Correct, I believe so, yes. Okay. Were you all drinking? He was. And an uh, altercation it was the night before, too. But I left the house and took my children with me because he was drinking them, too. This is. Were your kids there last night during this altercation? No, they were not. They were not here, and they're not here now. I know you first said that you thought he had a heart attack. So do you think it was a heart attack or do you think it was due to the stabbing that he passed away? Um, probably the stabbing triggered it, I guess. I don't know. It's a shoulder wound. You say it's a shoulder wound? Right. How old are you, huh? Uh, I'm 45. The next morning, Michael's wife, Danielle Redlick, made this call to report Michael's death. When she was asked about what had happened, she would describe an altercation that had taken place the night before, and she states that she thinks her husband may have stabbed himself. But what left investigators puzzled was the fact that Michael had been killed more than 11 hours before the call was made. And, as the events of that night were exposed, we would come to learn much about Danielle and Michael's twisted relationship. But what would ultimately be revealed would be more shocking and unexpected than anyone could have predicted. Was this a case of a battered woman protecting herself, or was it cold-blooded murder? Before we begin, we would like to send our sincere condolences to the friends and loved ones of Michael Redlick, who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. Danielle Redlick was born in 1976 in Florida. Despite her mother and father separating when she was young, her early years were spent in a loving and safe home. Danielle attended the University of Central Florida, where she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Interdisciplinary Studies, majoring in Communication. She went on to complete psychology papers and a photography certification. Danielle was, by all accounts, an intelligent and ambitious woman. When Danielle was around 22 years old, her mother Kathleen met Michael Redlick. Michael was known as Red by his friends, given his last name. He was a nice guy with a big smile and an even bigger heart. It was his generosity and kindness that initially attracted Kathleen. The couple seemed content together, and by all accounts, their relationship was a happy one. He was supportive and encouraging to Kathleen. Michael loved being sort of a stepfather to Kathleen's children, as he had none of his own. Even though he and Kathleen were not traditionally married, Michael fit in well to the fatherly and husbandly role for Kathleen's family. Two of Danielle's siblings lived with the couple, while the other three lived with their father. By now, Danielle was living away at college, but she would regularly visit her mother, her siblings, and her stepfather, Michael. While Michael was a qualified lawyer in the years before he met Kathleen, he experienced great success as a businessman. During his relationship with Kathleen, he held a number of executive positions in professional sports organizations such as the Cleveland Browns and the Cleveland Cavaliers. But in 1997, tragedy struck when Danielle's mother, Kathleen, was diagnosed with advanced breast cancer. Kathleen, 
Michael, and the six children were devastated. Not only did they face losing their mother, but they were also in no financial position to pay for her treatment. With her humble background, Kathleen didn't have the funds to pay for her own health care. But Michael wasn't going to give up on Kathleen without a fight, and he decided their best course of action was to get married so Kathleen could be entitled to his own health care benefits. With his executive position, his health care package would cover all expenses related to treating Kathleen's cancer, and once she was cured, they could continue on as normal. They had been together just two years. Kathleen loved Michael deeply, but they both knew their shotgun marriage was one of convenience in hopes that the modern healthcare system would help save her life. But devastatingly, Kathleen's breast cancer had progressed to stage four. Despite trying every available treatment, Kathleen was told she only had months to live. Just months after getting married, Kathleen sadly passed away from the terrible illness. Danielle had been very close to her mom, and she was devastated by her death and worried about how her siblings would cope with losing their mother. Michael was left to care for her two younger siblings who had been living with him and Kathleen. He reached out to Danielle and asked if she wanted to move into one of the spare rooms of the house that he had lived in with Kathleen. He hoped that Danielle could be a mother figure to her younger sister and help her through the loss of Kathleen. Danielle's sister was in the final year of high school and was traumatized by the loss of her mother. They agreed that having Danielle close by would provide some familiarity and stability while she finished her senior year. Danielle moved in, and initially their relationship revolved around completing the domestic chores for the home and providing emotional support for each other and to Danielle's sister. Michael encouraged Danielle and provided career guidance. His many years of experience in business put him at an advantageous position to guide Danielle as she set out into the working world. As Danielle began to rely on Michael more and more for emotional support, their relationship changed from amicable and fatherly to romantic and sexual. Danielle was working as a part-time bartender while she studied, and as their relationship began to change, Michael would show up during her shifts. He would order a drink and they would chat while Danielle served the other customers. Soon, Michael began to take Danielle out with him to various activities and events. Initially, it seemed innocent enough and Danielle thought of it more as bonding. That was until Michael began buying Danielle gifts and spending more time with her than anyone else. Danielle had become infatuated with him and when Michael introduced Danielle to one of his business contacts, she secured her first professional job, and she felt indebted to him. Over a period of months, their once platonic stepfather-stepdaughter relationship turned into something much more physical. Soon, they were in a full-on romantic relationship. It was Danielle's first experience with a long-term relationship, and she truly believed she was in love with him. But she was smart enough to know that given Michael's history as her stepfather, her friends and family would struggle to accept them as a couple. So initially, Danielle and Michael decided not to make their relationship status public for fear of public criticism. By then, Michael had secured a position as the executive vice president of the NBA basketball team, the Memphis Grizzlies. This meant he would need to move from Cleveland to Memphis when he first raised the issue of the move to Danielle and asked her to go with him, she declined. She knew moving with Michael would mean that her family would find out about their relationship. While they had been romantically involved for two years, she wasn't sure she was ready for that level of scrutiny. She supported Michael moving and decided that instead of moving with him, she would just visit frequently until she felt ready to go public with their relationship. When Michael moved to Memphis, he would fly Danielle out to see him every weekend, and she would touch down at the airport, Michael would pick her up and take her on a whirlwind romantic date before she had to return back to her normal life with her sister in Cleveland. He took me to um, um, a place called Mud Island where um, it's a beautiful neighborhood on the Mississippi River in, in Memphis, and he pulled up to a home and he went inside and he said, I bought this for us. And it was a beautiful house, it had a pool and it was on the river. And so um, from there, I, I, I went ahead and made the decision to go ahead and move to Memphis. So you were there on a visit and he told you that he'd already bought a home for you? 
Yes. Or for you together? Right. Okay. At this point, how was the relationship? Um, it was good. I mean, like I said, odd, odd circumstances how we came together, but it was good. I, I enjoyed, we enjoyed our, our time together. And how did the rest of the family view this at that point? Um, I don't, I think um, the, my, the sister that was living with us, I think she took it kind of hard, which I don't blame her. Um, I think people were a little bit shocked, but other than that, um, didn't have much to say about it. On one such visit, Michael drove Danielle to a beautiful home in the suburbs of Memphis. As they pulled up outside, he declared that he had purchased the home for her and wanted her to leave Cleveland and join him once and for all. Danielle was flattered and agreed to move out to live with Michael full time. In a new city with new surroundings, they could finally be seen as a legitimate couple. With their newfound freedom, they decided to formalize their relationship, and in the early 2000s, the couple got married. There was no hiding from the criticism of friends and family, but the newlyweds presented themselves as a loving and dedicated couple determined to prove the cynics wrong. But even with their newfound freedom and determination to succeed, Danielle and Michael's relationship was far from perfect. Danielle was new to a long-term relationship, while Michael, who was 21 years older than her, had years of experience. He maintained a position of seniority over Danielle throughout their marriage. While Danielle was trying to make her own way in the professional world, Michael was already successful and had an established career. But the couple seemed to overcome their difficulties and went on to have two children together, who they named Jaden and Sawyer. Michael took to fatherhood just as he had with Danielle's siblings. He was a hands-on father, and despite the pressures of his professional role, he was able to support the children in any way he could. But as time went on and the children reached high school age, Danielle began to notice that Michael wasn't as romantic or as available as he had once been. She suspected he was cheating on her, and when she confronted him about it, her worst fears were confirmed. Michael admitted that he had been cheating on her. Despite the hurt and betrayal of infidelity, and on top of everything that had already happened between the couple, Danielle wanted to provide her children with a stable home, unlike what she had been raised in. So Danielle decided to stay with Michael and try to put their problems behind them. And in an effort to save their marriage, the couple agreed to therapy, both together and separately. But the damage had already been done. The trust was gone, and the couple fought often. Their frequent screaming matches soon turned into physical fights, and often their two young children would be witnesses as their parents kicked and scratched at each other. The home was filled with tension and discomfort for everyone, and Danielle was faced with a hard choice, to stay or to go. Danielle decided that she had had enough of Michael's ongoing infidelity and their endless fights. Eventually, the couple would separate and begin living their lives in separate homes. Michael was furious and began to turn against Danielle. He threatened that he would stop paying the bills on the home that they had once shared, and he cut Danielle off from being able to access their joint accounts. He told her he would go for full custody of the children and kick her out of the house that he was paying for, forcing her to return to Cleveland. And yet, Michael also claimed he wanted to reconcile. He told Danielle that if she let him move back in, he would continue to pay for everything. After a few months of separation, in 2018, Danielle filed for divorce. But the judge in the case rejected the divorce filing as Michael had not been properly served with the papers. Michael had managed to dodge the process servers on a number of occasions. On one occasion, he visited Danielle and begged her for one more chance to fix their marriage for the sake of their children. He promised he would change, and Danielle believed him. As the server turned up to deliver the papers to Michael, the couple were engaged in relations. Once again, Michael had avoided being served, and this time it was with Danielle's help. As they attempted to reconcile their marriage, Michael began to invite Danielle over for dinner at his condo. 
he started to take her on dates again and lavished her with gifts and expensive restaurants. Danielle was confused by the status of their relationship. In her mind, they were separated and both were trying to rebuild their relationship. At the same time, she was suspicious that Michael had an ulterior motive or was potentially still seeing other women. When she stumbled across a letter Michael had written, Danielle's confusion turned to anger. How do you feel at this point? After, after reviewing that, what's your mindset? I'm shook up by it because I was surprised that he was saying this when we were clearly trying to get on better and so what you're seeing there matching the interactions that you are having with your husband no after observing that after having this experience did you speak with michael about it did you confront him about what you had found yes i asked him about it and is that what leads to this email exchange yes but could it have been this anger that led her to commit murder or had the years of conflict and abuse led Danielle to reaching a breaking point, leaving her with no choice but to defend herself against an attack by Michael? Michael and Danielle had been together for 18 years. They had been married 15 years when Michael died on the night of January 12, 2019. After Danielle's call, police arrived and it was immediately clear that Michael was dead and had been for some time. Rather than dying from a heart attack, Authorities could see clearly that Michael had been stabbed to death. He was lying in a pool of his own blood, which looked as if it had been recently disturbed. There were bloody towels strewn across the floor in the vicinity of the body and throughout the home. The home smelled of cleaning products, and it looked like Michael's body was recently moved due to smears of blood on the floor. Danielle was in a frantic state when the police arrived and she was taken to a psychiatric ward where she could be assessed for risk of self-harm. Meanwhile, an investigation began, and the family home was cordoned off as a crime scene. Refer to everything we see here as suspected blood because you haven't done some tests to actually truly confirm that it's blood. That is true. Uh, but a, it's a pretty strong suspicion. Yes. Okay. When Danielle was released from the psychiatric ward, she returned home. Michael's autopsy showed that he had died from a single stab wound to the chest and that he would have died within five or six minutes of sustaining the injury. These facts did not line up with Danielle's version of events, and now she was considered a prime suspect for murder. A search warrant was carried out on Danielle's home, and she continued to deny that she had murdered her husband. Based on police interviews with Danielle and her strange behavior and demeanor after the fight with her husband, she was charged with second-degree murder. Despite having offered a plea deal to plead guilty to manslaughter in exchange for a reduced sentence of 10 years, Danielle decided to take the case to trial. And it was during that trial that the disturbing details of what happened inside their suburban home finally came to light. According to Danielle, she was in the fight for her life. There was no denying that she was the one who stabbed Michael, but her entire case rested on a claim of self-defense. Ms. Redlick, on January 11th, 2019, did you stab your husband? I did. Yes. That he ended up um, pushing, pushing her to the ground, pushing her to the ground. And then did she get up? Yes. What did he do next, according to Ms. Redlick? Um, pushed her head against the stove and began like covering her, covering her mouth with her, her face with his hands, okay. yelling and screaming at her. So she's described, can you kind of describe what you understood um, her to be saying Mr. Redlick was doing with his hand? Like just covering, like smushing her, his hands with, over her mouth. Okay. N she was not describing being choked? Correct. She wasn't. Did she say whether or not Mr. Redlick uh, struck her at any point during the sequence of events? No, just smudged his hand against her, her face, but like, like that, okay. like smudged it. Like was r like rubbing his fist yeah, on Yeah, like rubbing, mm-hmm. You're face to face with Ms. Redlick, right? Yes. Nothing covering her face? Right. Um, did you observe any injuries on her? No. She detailed how their relationship was mostly great, but the incidents of domestic abuse had started long before they moved to Memphis and before she found out about Michael's infidelity. 
I remember I made an offensive comment, which I wouldn't make today. Um, I, I called him, I said he was, I said at least he wasn't um, Jewish and cheap. And he backhanded me in the face and mouth. And my mouth started bleeding and my nose started bleeding. And we were in the car at this point. And so when I got to the red light, I wanted to get out of the car. And he grabbed me and I grabbed him back. And we kind of just went back and forth in the car. And we actually got uh, pulled over. She shared how Michael's behavior got progressively worse, especially when he drank. He was coming home from work every day and he was pretty agitated. Something was really bothering him. I just remember that it was something had to do with something with two of his bosses. And um, he was coming home and he was pouring a drink each night. And um, I, I was so pretty young at that point. So I grew up in a house where you eat dinner every night. And I noticed that Michael, when he would drink, he would skip dinner. And so he was doing this by the third night. Um, I started to wonder, you know, are you going to keep doing this? I think I'm just going to go ahead and if you're not going to eat dinner, I'm just going to go down to the, to the river. There's some, you know, a city walk where they have some shops and eateries and stuff. And when I said that, he got irritated and said, what are you mad because I don't want to have dinner with you? And I said, well, yeah, kind of at this point, because I said, how's the wallowing working out for you? I said something sarcastic. And I went to head to the door to leave, and he was near the door, and he moved in front of the door. And um, I tried to shove past him. And I feel like at that point, he just he raises his fist, and he just crossed me in the face. And I feel like, I don't know, like he took out every frustration that he had had that week on me. and. Um, the next thing I remember was actually laying in his lap and he was stroking me and he was apologizing and he was crying and um, I had looked down and I had blood all over me and he was telling me how sorry he was that he's going to take me out to a nice dinner tomorrow and he wanted to go ahead and take care of me, let him take care of me that night. Witnesses also shared their experiences of the extensive history of the volatile relationship between Michael and Danielle. There are incidents which were reported to the police and evidence of Michael being prescribed testosterone and a medication for erectile dysfunction. He had become increasingly frustrated and insecure about his poor performance in the bedroom, and he would verbalize his fears that Danielle would want to leave him because of these issues. His insecurity meant that what was once purely physical violence turned into sexual aggression. He was going to be going out of town for a work function um, for the week, and so he called me from work um, the day before and said, I'm going to bring home some movies and dinner. We're going to spend some time together tonight. And I said, okay. So he brought home dinner and alcohol. And we started watching the movie, and there was a love scene. And this happened often, I noticed. He would get um, flustered and kind of start acting strange. And um, during this particular movie, he approached me, and he was aggressive. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, he was hurting me. So I moved to a separate couch, and I, I told him that that wasn't okay. And he just continued to drink through the movie, and he passed out about halfway through. And I finished the movie. And at that point, I just went upstairs to bed. I turned everything off, and I let him know that I was going up to bed. He was snoring. Um, I didn't wake him up, so I went up to bed. And the next morning, he had to leave, get ready to go out of town. And then he came upstairs into the bedroom, and he said, why didn't you wake me up last night? So when he says that, how, how does it continue from there? Um, so I'm in my bathroom at that point, and I'm brushing my teeth, and um, we're having this conversation. And the next thing I know, something hits me in the back of the head, and I look, and it's... There's a box of tampons on the floor. And I said, did you just hit me with that? And he said, yeah, are you calling me a USSY? And I said, no, what are you talking about? And he said that I had left the box of tampons on his side of the sink. What was I trying to say? And this is just was very strange to me. And I said, I don't know. Those were just, this just happened to be there. I didn't do that on purpose. Didn't clean up the bathroom. Sorry. And I was upset. And I said, maybe you are acting like that, um, a P-U-S-S-Y. And I walked away from him. And he How did came, he react when you walked away? He said that he came up behind me and grabbed me from behind and started choking me. And um, I had never been choked that hard before by him. 
Um, you did this a second ago. Can you show the jury how, with, with your hands, do a demonstration? Um, with his of forearm, how he just came up behind me and yanked me really hard and pulled me close to his body and to the point where I couldn't breathe and he cut off my um, air. And basically, it was choking me out. Um, I started to pass out. I remember falling and I remember thinking to myself, is he, oh my God, is he going to kill me? And I remember reaching up and I fell to my knees. And the next thing I know, I was sort of aware and I was looking up at him and he was just staring at me with this like surprised expression on his face. And he just, he reached out his hand and he said, I'm sorry. And I just crawled away from him into a corner. And I just, I was really frightened at that point and I couldn't believe it. From Danielle's perspective and from witness testimony given by their children, the marriage and life inside the family home was toxic. Both parents were to blame for the behavior, which would be particularly bad when either of them had consumed alcohol. Michael had moved back into the family home just one month prior to his death. Danielle claimed this was after she had given in to his demands to return so that she didn't lose custody of her children. But she was realistic about the fact that it was unlikely their marriage would continue much longer. During the time she had filed for divorce, she had begun setting up profiles for herself on dating sites. Despite never meeting with any of the men from the sites, she had exchanged messages with multiple men, and she claimed that the reason they fought the night of Michael's death was that he had discovered one of those messages on her phone. This infuriated Michael when he discovered the messages. At the time, Danielle was out of the house for a brief moment after going to McDonald's for dinner, but when she returned, she would find Michael intoxicated, and in that drunken state, he would come at her violently. And around 10 p.m., she goes to McDonald's. After McDonald's, she heads home. And Michael is there. He is pounding down the vodka. He grabs her food, and then he goes at her. He is in a rage, and this rage is the angriest that she has ever seen him. It's worse than any of those other incidents. It's different. He pushes her down. She goes to her knees. He pulls her up by the hair. He shoves her to the kitchen island. He chokes. He smothers her. She reaches into a drawer. She grabs a knife. She stabs him one time. He is stunned. He releases her, and she runs to the bathroom. When it came time to testify to her version of events leading to Michael's death, Danielle calmly described what happened on the night of January 11th, 2019. You find the knife. You're able to open the drawer? Yes. You're able to grab the knife? Pull it out, yes. How does it continue from there? Um, pull the knife out, and I don't know if he saw it, but he released my head, so I'm able to move. Okay. How, how do you position? So you said that he, you're able to move a little bit. What position do you go Just into? Slightly more to the left, turning toward him. Does he back away from you? No. Okay. How, go ahead. He says, what well, are you going to stab me? And I take the knife and I position it and face it toward him. What does he do at that point? He immediately just goes for my chin and pushes me back and, that's, and I stabbed him at that point. How are you positioned at the point of stabbing him? Basically on the back of the island um, and been pinned by him. At that point, are you able to get out? After I stabbed him, yes. Prior to doing that, prior to stabbing him with a knife, are you able to remove yourself? No. Are you able to wiggle free? No. Are you able to get out without using a weapon? No, I was trying. Are you able to talk to him? The defense rested on claims of years of a toxic and abusive marriage in which Danielle was driven to violence, the act which would end Michael's life. The prosecution, in turn, would also build a solid case against Danielle, accusing her of second-degree murder. From their perspective, the evidence painted a picture of a callous and cold-hearted woman that would say anything to get away with murder. They claimed she wasn't defending herself when she murdered Michael. Rather, she intentionally attacked him as payback for his infidelity. They claimed she was trying to find the easiest way out of their marriage and into the arms of a lover. 
They questioned every statement she made in relation to the events of that night. You have told this jury that he has taken a bite of your hamburger, correct? Yes. And then he spits it at you, yes. right? It's at this point that you stand up yes. and you grab that McDonald's bag and such and you begin to throw it on the counter or the island, right? Right. Mr. Redlick is behind you. Yes. And you feel yourself get hit in the head. He grabs me and I fall. Then I get hit in the head. I thought you, stump you stumbled. Yeah, well, he grabbed me first, which I tried to turn, and then I tripped up on my feet and fell. You, so you fall, and then it's, it's while you are still on the ground that you feel something hit your head. Yes. Well, could you tell if it was an object or a, or a fist or something else? Elbow, fist, I don't know what it was. But not like a, a blunt object, like a bat or a mallet? I didn't think it was an object, no. It's at that point that you are pulled back up by your hair? Is that what happens next? Well, I attempted to get up on my own, and he was too far on top of me, so... Where are you at when he's now too far on top of you? Coming up, trying to get up off the ground. Where specifically? Where specifically, or is he too far on top of you to um, get on top of you? So am I using this? Permission to allow the witness to use the laser pointer, Your Honor? Um, yes, that's fine. I might need to turn it on for you. Uh, put the laser pointer to where you were whenever he was too far on top of you for you to get up, please. I'm in this corridor between here and here. Okay. I'm facing so, that way, on my knees. On your knees, facing towards the uh, cabinets on the far wall where the scale is at. Yes? And um, when you say he's too on top of you to get up, is he actually standing, he's standing over you at this point? Yes. And is it this point that he picks you up and by the hair? No, I, I'm going to get up like this, and I don't know where exactly he's at, but he's, I know his head slammed into my head. So as you're getting up, you feel your head on his head? I feel the back of my head on his head. Then, and then it's at that point that he takes your head and he slams it onto the uh, stovetop area. Yes? No, I wouldn't say right at that point, no. Um, I reached up um, and with my right hand to pull myself up. And as I'm pulling myself up and trying to turn around to face him, that's when he grabbed my hair and slammed my head onto the... Slams you, slams your head into the stovetop, yes? Yes. And at this point, you have a 6'1", 240-pound man uh, pressed against your body, yes? Yes. Pressing you against that island. Yes. The next thing that you say happens is that he begins to take his fist and he's rubbing it in your face. That was your story, right? Took my head and he held it down. It was a very awkward position. I couldn't move because it was a hurting. And yes, he had me pinned, so he had it. He held my head down first. So your neck is sort of like cr cricked against the corner of that island at that point. Yes. Now he's using this force to keep your head down. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he is still on top of you. His his 240 pound body is still pressing you into that island. Yes. You can feel the island on your body. Yes. This is when the, the rubbing happens? Yes. Because he doesn't, he doesn't hit you. He doesn't punch me, no. Well, he hit me in the back of the head, but... In the back, where, you're, where your hair covers, correct? Yes. On the skin that's exposed, he doesn't, he doesn't strike. And then it, it, is it at this moment that he decides that he's going to um, put his hands over your nose and mouth? Yes. The prosecution had a lot of questions for Danielle, asserting that her excuses and explanations didn't add up to self-defense. The fact that Danielle had waited 11 hours before calling 911 was highly suspicious. Why would an innocent victim wait so long to call for help? The delay meant she missed the opportunity to save Michael's life. Danielle claimed that after she had stabbed him and gotten away from his grasp, 
She hid in the bathroom after their fight because she was scared for her life and didn't know Michael was dying. The prosecution also pointed out her statements on the 911 call that Michael had had a heart attack and her second explanation that he had stabbed himself during the fight, statements that were admittedly untrue. But Danielle excused her lies by saying that she was in a state of shock immediately after the stabbing and couldn't process her thoughts correctly. She told the court that she was scared and confused and didn't know what to say when she called 911. But there were still more questions to be answered. Investigators found deleted texts on Danielle's phone, which she sent while Michael lay dead on the kitchen floor. Her phone also showed evidence of a dating site being accessed while Michael lay there dying on the floor after being stabbed. The prosecution claimed this proved that she couldn't have been in so much shock that she was unable to function and call 911 to get him some help. The prosecution called on Jaden, one of the couple's daughters, to testify. Though her face could not be shown due to her age at the time, Jaden revealed that Danielle was not the victim at home. Rather, she was the instigator of the couple's fights. She further described Danielle as toxic and manipulative. In contrast, she had a very close relationship with her father, whom she described as attentive and loving. Jaden says, my dad and I were very close. We practically did everything together. He took me out on daddy-daughter dates all the time. We were very close. I told him everything. Prosecutor, what was your relationship like with your mother? Jaden, very toxic, very manipulative. Prosecutor, what was the relationship like between your parents? Jaden, very toxic, tumultuous, very rocky. Yeah, it was not a good relationship, very rocky. Prosecutor, who was the primary source? Jaden, my mother. Prosecutor, why do you say that? Jaden, if there was an issue between them, it would be brought up by my mother. Jaden, when he came home, he was very distant. And this is what she's talking about, I believe, the night of. Not very talkative. He was very cold when he came home. Prosecutor, did you sense tension? Jaden, yes. Prosecutor, did it turn into an argument? Jaden, yes. It was very rare for me to see him get angry and upset that night. He told me he was sorry, that he loved me, and he wished I hadn't seen him like that. The next day, I went to school, and those were the last words we ever exchanged. I didn't answer him then. Jaden, the last thing I said to him was when they were arguing the night before. Jaden, I received a text from my mom saying she was dealing with something here and that it was best for me to stay at my friend's another night. I thought that was odd because my mom usually wanted to pick me up right after a sleepover. Prosecutor. When was the next time you spoke to your mother? Jaden, sometime later that week. I believe she called me from the hospital. Prosecutor, did she tell you what happened to your father? And this is important, folks. Listen, Jaden, no, I don't think so. Prosecutor, did you later ask her what happened to your father? Jaden, I remember her exact words were, the autopsy said he had a heart attack. Prosecutor, I have no other questions for this witness. When the prosecution rested its case, it was not clear how the jury would find in the matter. Both the defense and prosecution had painted vastly different pictures of Danielle Redlick and her motives for stabbing Michael and covering up the crime. Both sides admitted that the marriage had been toxic and unhappy for a number of years, but it was up to the jury to decide whether they believed the testimony of a battered woman who felt she was driven to murder in order to save her own life or would they side with the prosecution who presented the voice of a victim who could no longer defend himself? Did they believe that he was struck down by a deceitful and calculating murderess who was only concerned for herself? The trial broadcast internationally and internet forums were divided on how the jury would find the case. After just two days of deliberations, the courtroom was completely silent when the verdict was read. In the circuit court of the Ninth Judicial Circuit in and for Orange County, Florida, case number 2019, CF18460, State of Florida versus Danielle Justine Redlin. Verdict as to count one, we the jury find the defendant not guilty. So say we all sign juror badge number 283, four person. In response to the acquittal, Danielle and Michael's daughter, Jaden, 
gave an emotional statement to the court, which was read by her attorney. I want to start this off by saying the only reason I am not personally reading the statement to you all myself is because I simply do not ever want to be in a room with Daniel Drohan ever again. I feel as though there has been absolutely no justice served for my father or his family, including myself and my younger brother. It takes a lot for me to talk about these things and be so vulnerable in front of total strangers. <clears throat> so I please just ask that you all listen to me and please take my feelings into consideration. Since I was about seven years old, I have endured insane amounts of trauma. <clears throat> this trauma all stems from the same thing, Danielle Drohan. And yes, I'm referring to her as her first name and maiden name because I feel as though she should not even have the privilege of having the same last name as me or my father. <clears throat> I refuse to call her mother because she was never a decent mother figure to me. There were a great deal of things I was not permitted to say in court when I was testifying, which I feel is absolutely insane. I still am unable to even scratch the mere surface of the trauma I am referring to. <clears throat> All I want is justice for my father. It breaks my heart into a million pieces over and over to hear people side with such an abusive, horrible person and then continue to bash on a dead man who isn't here to defend himself. Sure, my dad was no angel <clears throat> and definitely had faults, but he was the kindest, most caring person, and I'm sure the other people who had the chance to know him would vouch for that. He was so kind, gentle, and he never laid a hand on a single person in my family, not myself, Sawyer, or Danielle. I don't even remember him spanking me. My dad always advocated for love and acceptance. He loved everyone and treated everyone the way he wanted to be treated. He was a great man <clears throat> with great values and loved his family. He would never hit a woman. He took my brother and I to so many different ball games, always took me out on our father-daughter days, <clears throat> and he was always in a good mood. Him and I used to watch Saturday Night Live together every Saturday for five years straight. He took me and Sawyer to the movies all the time and made sure we were always happy, fed, and well taken care of. <clears throat> he always stood up for others. He always wanted to joke around and play whatever game or talk about literally anything. He loved to talk, people watch, and get to know people. He loved others, <clears throat> and everyone loved him. He was not a bad person. I am so angry about the way he has been portrayed, so extremely angry. He was the best dad I ever could have asked for. I remember at certain points, I would imagine Sawyer and I staying with him full time if my parents were to divorce. <clears throat> I have no regret in saying that, and I mean it wholeheartedly. It absolutely breaks my heart into a million pieces that Sawyer has to grow up without him. I do too, but Sawyer no longer has the amazing dad to show him how to grow up and be just like him. <clears throat> we are both extremely heartbroken to have our pops ripped from our world so suddenly and to have been lied to about it for so long after. We miss our pops so much. I would do anything to bring him back. Someone took him from our world and ruined our childhoods, let alone the start of our lives and, and futures. We have endured so much since he was taken from us that it has been difficult to process a natural grieving process. We have suffered such incredible amounts of trauma to the point where our bodies have reacted to it. 
I have had nightmares for the past three years about Danielle and more specifically about certain decisions she has made. Sawyer has nightmares too. I have developed a near fear of being murdered. I have had phases of extreme paranoia and I've gone through phases where I've been so depressed over the situation that I was unable to take care of myself for a long time. I've lost a great amount of weight and for a while I would get extremely triggered and break down over someone even saying the words dad or parent. I've had an entire school gossip about me and my situation, as most of Winter Park. People recognize my last name and often already know about this so-called news story that is my life. I lost everything at once and it was broadcasted to the world, and I have always given the short end of the stick. I am just now getting to be okay again, but this reopened so many wounds that I generally thought could start to heal from. You may all be fooled by the incredible mask this woman presents to you all, but I am not. My father did not get away in time. I am not worried. I am so worried for my brother. Judge, please make some kind of stipulation that Danielle not be allowed near myself and Sawyer so we don't have to be re-traumatized re like we have been already. We're both settled into our new life without our dad, and we won't to be left in peace. It took us a while to get here, and we deserve that at the very least. While Danielle was acquitted of murder, she still faced sentencing for the other crimes of which she had been found guilty. She was due to be sentenced for tampering with evidence as investigators had proven she had cleaned up the blood and moved Michael's body after his death. According to the crime scene pictures and evidence, blood stains were smeared throughout the home. You used bleach and other cleaners to clean what looked like a horror scene. Crime scene photographs also showed where you left the cleanup towels and a bucket of colored water. The blood pattern expert testified that typically blood, blood patterns could tell a story or explain the circumstances surrounding a homicide crime scene like this, but not so in your case. The expert also testified that as a result of your conduct, it was virtually impossible to determine the exact circumstances surrounding Michael Redwood's death. The scene was tampered with so much so that the blood evidence was of little to no value to determine what happened between the night of January 11th of 2019 and mid-morning, January 12th of 2019. You've already been adjudicated guilty of count two, tampering with physical evidence, and so for that conduct, I will sentence you to 364 days in the Orange County Jail with credit for 364 days time served. That's going to be followed by a period of 12 months of probation. You will report to probation by 3 p.m. The office is on the seventh floor of the side courtroom 7B. Within the first 30 days, you will sign up for and you will submit to a mental health evaluation and complete the evaluation and any required treatment within 12 months. I will impose court costs, and there is also a public defender lien that should be imposed. Court costs of $418. Mr. Parnell and Ms. Conlon, for the public defender lien, what do you feel is an appropriate cost for your services for the trial and the litigation? On January 18th, 2022, Danielle was released from the Orange County Jail after having served nearly 1,100 days behind bars while she awaited her trial. Today's case examines the brutal double homicide of a young couple in a quiet suburban neighborhood. The case was unusual, with a friend claiming to overhear the start of the attack over the phone. Oh my God, uh, we just called the police here. I'm lost. Yes, but we need a rescue coming. He's got a big horse. 
And as the investigation unfolded, it seemed that many of those closest to the couple were unwilling to share what they knew with police. Did he sound like he was out of breath? No. Did he sound like he was scared or nervous? No. Did he sound like he knew them people? Mm -hmm. That's why I said I think that whoever did it, he knew. It would take nearly a year for investigators to sift through the web of lies and half-truths before an arrest could be made. Yet 10 years later, questions remain. Do police really have their killer? And who else was involved? This is the disturbing case of Johnny Clark and Lisa Straub. Before we start, we would like to send our deepest sympathies to the loved ones of Johnny Clark and Lisa Straub, who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. It was midwinter in Toledo, Ohio. Snow covered the streets of the quiet suburban neighborhood of Holland. Residents had long since turned in for the night, but at 2161 Long Acre Lane, a nightmare was unfolding. Officers arrived at the house on Long Acre Lane sometime just before 2 a.m. They found there were lights on inside the home, but no one was answering the door. A search of the property revealed nothing suspicious, and with no probable cause to break into the home, they left. 2161 Long Acre Lane was the home of Jeff and Mary Beth Straub. Three days earlier, the couple had left for a cruise to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary, leaving their daughter, 20-year-old Lisa Straub, and her boyfriend, Johnny Clark, age 21, in charge of the house. Lisa and Johnny had been dating off and on since the summer of 2009. For the first time, the pair had rented an apartment in Toledo. But with Johnny attending barber school and Lisa working part-time at TGI Fridays while attending nursing college, money was tight. In December 2010, Lisa's parents agreed to let the couple move back into the family home. With their extended vacation coming up, it seemed like an arrangement that would benefit everyone. Just three days after the Straubs left for their cruise, Johnny's mother, May T, would place the first of four 911 calls made that evening. Sheriff's office. Listen, ma'am, I am a concerned mother. Okay, four cop cars were already out at this residence. They're not there, and her car is in the driveway. I want to know where my son's at. Okay. I want to know where my son and his girlfriend are at. I want to know if they got abducted by whoever tried to assault them and rob them. And it's pretty funny that this girl named Tiffany, which is there right now by the residence, waits two hours to call somebody and report this. Okay. Well, like I said, we were out there. There was nothing going on there. Okay. Where is my son and his girlfriend and her car's in the driveway? Uh, how would I know that, ma'am? I need to report my son missing. I have a feeling you set up my son. My son is missing. He's nowhere to be found. Officers returned to the house where they found several people waiting at the property. Johnny's parents, Métis and Johnny Clark, Métis' cousin, and Tiffany, the friend who had alerted Johnny's mother to the concerning phone call. Police searched the property for a second time. Blinds and shutters prevented them from seeing inside the house, and once again, they left. The Clarks now searched the premises themselves. At the back of the house, Mr. Clark spotted a window containing partially opened blinds. He hoisted Métis' cousin up to peer through the slats. Oh my God. You need to get the police out to Long Acre Lane. My son is in the basement tied up of this house. I just saw him through the window. I, the police were out here earlier and did absolutely nothing. Both cell phones are on the ground and we can see the people. Him and his girlfriend are tied up in the basement. Okay, all right, we'll get them out there. Get them cops out here. I told them earlier. Hey, we me. need to calm down. We'll get them out there. But this yelling at me is they're unconscious. They're unconscious, ma'am. Oh, okay, you said they're unconscious? Yes. Okay, all right. Before officers could arrive, Mr. Clark kicked in the front door. On the floor of the kitchen, he found Johnny and Lisa laying on the floor with their hands bound with duct tape 
and plastic bags over their head. He ripped open the bags only to find that his son and Lisa were dead. I found them and I ripped off the bag off my son's head. <laughs> you found them tied up by how much bags are on their head. Then went to her and did the same. Detective Jeff Kozak, who later would lead the investigation, was the first on the scene. Soon it would be swarmed with police and forensic experts. Lisa and Johnny lay on their backs on the kitchen floor. Both their hands and Johnny's ankles had been bound with black duct tape. Plastic grocery bags had been placed over their heads and secured around their necks with duct tape. Their deaths would later be recorded as due to strangulation from the duct tape and asphyxiation. Moving room by room, investigators documented the crime scene. Downstairs, a plant pot and a clock had been knocked over. Cabinets lay open. Broken pieces of a cell phone were scattered across the floor, and a torn photo of the couple was left in the sunroom. The door between the garage and the kitchen showed signs of bowing at the deadbolt. Upstairs had been ransacked, the master bedroom in particular. Dresser drawers were open and emptied, and the mattress was pushed off of the box spring. Clothes had been flung around the walk-in closet, and a dresser pushed forward. A panel behind the dresser led to a crawl space that had been opened, and a hole had been made in the drywall. The lock on Lisa's bedroom door showed inward impact damage. If this was a botched robbery, it was a strange one. Six envelopes containing 4.6 million in Iraqi dinars was left discarded the equivalent of about $4,500. Other valuables, including laptops and jewelry, were also untouched. Only two $20 bills were taken from the house. Clearly, the perpetrators had been looking for something specific. Police began piecing together a picture of what had happened. The perpetrators, they believed, had entered the house via the garage door. Johnny and Lisa had likely spotted them and attempted to block them from entering the house hence the damage to the internal door. At some point, Lisa had likely fled and locked herself in her bedroom before the door had been forced inward. Police concluded that more than one perpetrator must have been involved. The timing of the attack suggested they knew the Straubs were away and therefore had some connection to the couple. Other clues suggested the attack had been planned. The duct tape had been brought to the house as well as the plastic bags. And then there was the unusual M.O. These murders would have taken time to execute. They smacked to police of something personal. On March 1st, police announced at their press conference their belief that Johnny and Lisa had been specifically targeted. News of the double homicide in the suburban neighborhood made national headlines. Police came under fire by journalists for failing to enter the home earlier. Joey Jackson, do you realize that the police, in coming there two different times, the first time they stayed, I think, 11 minutes, the second time they came 30 minutes, they knew that the 911 call said that the son had said, who are you, why are you here? And it's the family that had to find the bodies with the plastic bags over the heads? This is a horrific circumstance, uh, by all means, Gene. I, you know, I mean, listen, in terms of probable cause or objective standard, whatever you want to call it, there's more than ample here. You have a phone call to 911 repeatedly by the mother. You have the, the girl who's describing the friend who's saying it's ransacked, the lights are on, you have the car there, and they're not there. It's problematic. And even if you say there was no objective, credible reason or probable cause, Gene, what about an exit? circumstance. Something needed to be done. Something needed to be done immediately. And it wasn't done. And it's unfortunate. And I hate to besmirch the character of our members in blue. They protect us. They keep us safe. But something is amiss. Reporters and internet sleuths, meanwhile, went into overdrive, speculating over motives and digging into the backgrounds of everyone involved. And there was plenty of dirt to uncover. Both Johnny and Lisa had grown up in loving homes. They had been well-adjusted, and they were athletic teens who were liked by all of their peers. But teenage partying had turned into regular drug use, and by 2011, both were habitual users of pharmaceutical painkillers. At 18, Johnny had spent a year in jail for robbing two men at gunpoint. Former friends had distanced themselves. Their social circle had come to include some seriously shady characters, many with long rap sheets for drug and violence-related crimes. 
Police now depended on this community for leads on the couple's killers. Of the numerous items taken from the house, only small samples of DNA evidence had been recovered. These had been lifted from the duct tape binding Johnny, the inside of Johnny's pockets, Johnny's cell phone, and a half a dozen cigarette butts, including one that had been conspicuously discarded near the door to the garage. This DNA identified as belonging to five different unknown males and females. No matches were found for the profiles on CODIS. Detectives were left with the job of collecting DNA samples from all of those connected with the couple. In the coming weeks, they would collect DNA swabs from nearly 40 people and conduct dozens of interviews in an attempt to establish potential leads. It would be a process more complicated than anyone could have imagined. Many of the couple's so-called friends were reluctant to divulge information that could put them on the wrong side of the wrong people or implicate themselves in a different felony. Many had had issues with Johnny, who owed money to people and had a reputation for bragging. And a recent rumor had circulated that Lisa's parents owned a safe containing $100,000, a topic that had been discussed at length during a party just weeks before the murders. Front and center of the police attention was Tiffany Williams, a girl who had overheard the start of the attack. Police would interview Tiffany several times, along with 17-year-old Zachary Burkett, who had gone with Tiffany to the house two hours after receiving the troubling call. At the time of the interviews, Tiffany was pregnant to a man named A.P. A.P. was the ex-boyfriend of a girl called Alex Casino. They were names that would crop up again and again throughout the investigation. Tiffany told police that she and Zach had planned to meet the couple that night, which involved getting some pills and shooting some pool at the Straub home. Johnny had agreed to pick them up from East Toledo after Lisa had finished her shift at TGI Friday at 10 p.m. At 10.41 p.m., Tiffany had called Johnny to let him know they were heading out but would be back in time for their lift. Let's talk about talking to Johnny and Lisa. Was there supposed to be a party? No, no party. There wasn't supposed to be a party. No, they didn't invite anybody else over. No, it was a last minute, hey, do you guys want to come over and play pool? Okay. A last minute thing. Nobody knew we was going out And there. what time, what, do you remember about what time you guys were, was this on the phone? Yeah. All right, or oh. texting. No, it was on the. We were on the phone. But you're texting too at the same time. No. This, I mean, if you're I, not a, okay. No, I had texted Lisa while she was at work, because we had talked to Johnny and Johnny said they were going to get pills when Lisa got off work, and I was like, "Can you find a, um, meet one and I'll give you the money back tomorrow?" <laughs> he said he had to ask Lisa, so I text Lisa's phone. That's where the texting came in. Okay. Then by the time Lisa got off work which was at, I'm guessing, 10 o'clock. Lisa had texted me back and was like, you know, I thought you was a friend. And then that's when I called Lisa, like, no, 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 you took that in the wrong way. It wasn't nothing like that. Tiffany is referring to an argument she had had with the couple three days earlier over drugs. I want to go over that conversation again in okay. detail. that's fine. All right. You call Johnny on the phone. Mm -hmm. How many times did it ring, you think? Remember? Um, once or twice. Okay, he one to two right rings. Up. Picked it right up. Mm -hmm. You know it was Johnny. Yes. How long of a pause before he said anything? He didn't say hello. All right, so he never said anything. Never said hello. So, all right, so you're on the phone. Mm -hmm. How long before you hear anything on the phone? Did you, what did you? Like, as soon as he picked it up, he didn't say hello to me, but he was like, Bro, what are you doing? All right, I want to get this down again. Bro, what are you doing? Okay. Okay, and he said that approximately three times. Okay. Then the All right, let him, give me his voice. Was it, bro, what are you doing? Or, bro, what are you doing? Yeah, just like that. Was, he bro, sounded yeah. pissed? Yeah. Did he sound scared? No. He just scared. sounded pissed? Just pissed, yeah. All right, so you hear, you hear, bro, what are you doing three times? Johnny sounds pissed. Mm -hmm. All right, then what he said? Then the next thing he said was, who the hell are you? How many times? Um, once. 
And then that's when I heard the other person in the background. But I couldn't hear what he was saying. So you overheard a voice in the background. A guy voice. You're sure it was a guy? I'm positive it was a guy. Have you ever heard it before? No. Well, I really couldn't tell, you know what I mean, right. but... Okay. All right, so then what? Then he asked again, bro, what are you doing? After he said, who are you? After the three times he said it yeah, here, he said, he said it said, again. Yeah, and that's when this guy was talking, so that's why I couldn't hear him, is because Johnny was saying, um, bro, what are you doing once again? All right. Did you hear anything in the background, like a door close, footsteps? It sounded like Johnny was, did he sound pissed here again? Mm-hmm. Did he sound pissed here? Yeah. Did he sound like he was out of breath? No. Did he sound like he was scared or nervous? No. Did he sound like he knew them people? Mm-hmm. That's why I said I think that whoever did it, he knew. Did Zach talk about the inside of that house? Did he say anything? Did you ever hear Johnny talking about a safe in that house? Never once heard Johnny talk about a safe in the house. Never. I never heard Johnny talk about money being in that house. The only thing that Johnny ever bragged about was Lisa's family had money. Okay. That was the only thing. All right. Why had she not called authorities right away? Tiffany told detectives there were drugs in the house and she didn't want anyone to get in trouble. But she hadn't phoned anyone else for two hours despite Lisa or Johnny no longer responding to calls or messages. And there were inconsistencies in her account that bothered police. Tiffany told detectives that Johnny's last words had been, Tiff, I'll call you back. But she told Johnny's mother, Métis, that she heard Johnny drop the phone. He couldn't do both. Métis had also told dispatch that Tiffany had been concerned when she'd gone by the house because it looked like it had been ransacked. But officers who had visited the house that night reported being unable to see inside. 17-year-old Zach agreed to take a polygraph test, which he failed. But with no other evidence linking the couple to the crime, police turned their attentions to other leads. Phone records showed that minutes before Tiffany's call to Johnny at 10.41 p.m., Johnny had phoned a close family friend. According to this friend, Johnny had repeatedly told her that he was waiting for a visit from a dealer called Anthony Watson. As it happened, police had also received a tip that Anthony had been implicating his brother Chris in the crime. Police now called Anthony in for questioning. Did you see Johnny that day? No, I didn't see him that day at all. What time did you start talking to Johnny on the phone? I probably talked to him in the morning. But when I started talking to him, like I, I mean, I probably I talked to him every day, all day. You know what I'm saying? When he was okay, but when? Yeah, but that's what I'm. Um, five, five. He probably called me in the morning when he woke up around like one. You know what I mean? He sleeps in a lot. He sleeps in a lot, so he probably called me around noon one. You know, I probably talked to him, and then when, when I talked to him, probably I think I talked to him when I was at my mom's house, and then when I left, we talked. And then did he call your mom's to, house or you and yourself? My mom's house phone, probably my cell phone. So Johnny called in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So you never saw him? Not that day. When did you guys start making plans for him to come over? I was about to leave my mom's house. Well, he said he was going to, when he um, gets, gets, um, Lisa gets off work, he's going to come over. And then it ended up being, I think about like 9, 9.30 when we got home from my mom's house. And then I was talking to him on the phone and about, 10, 10 30 he called me he said he was going to come over and then i was like no it's too late i'm going to go i'm going to sleep i got school in the morning well we've interviewed a lot of people you know mm -hmm. i mean you know we've talked to a lot yeah. of people i mean you hear it yeah i heard yeah. they had to come down and talk to cops and mm -hmm. do you have a feeling about who might have done this the person i thought had done it i already passed the lie detector test so you know Person I had in my mind, the only person I could pop up and be like, oh, I think he did it. All right, well, who you, the All right, you're so, talking about AP. Yeah. All right. Who do you think he'd have done it with? See, I, I have no idea. You know, I know. I think you do have an idea. I know who it was when AP did came into my house. You know All what right. I'm saying? Who was he with? 
I well, this is what the word on the street was. He was with Mike Gonzalez and um, Adam Gonzalez. It was them three. When they robbed you, you, AP was with Mike and Adam Gonzalez. That's what that's what the word on the street was. You know what I mean? The AP Anthony mentions here is the same AP that Tiffany had spent hours with on the day of the murders, and who was the father of her baby. That's a word on the, that was a word on the street. That wasn't, you know, for a fact, for sure. I never even know if AP was that one did it, but that's okay. what he said. All right. Let's, uh, let's take Mike and Adam Gonzalez out of that picture right there. And you got AP. Who else? I have no idea, to be honest. No idea. What about Chris? My brother? Yeah. He don't like AP. They tried to kill me. You know, like my brother's not gonna hang out with AP. You know, they came in my house shooting. He ain't gonna hang out with AP. He don't like the kid. He wanted to fight him, and I was like, bro, just leave it alone. I don't know if he's the one did it. You know what I'm saying? Well, I'm gonna come right out and ask you, did you ever make the statement, I think my brother Chris did this? No. You didn't say that to anybody? No. So if more than one person would have sat here and told me that Tone said, that he thinks his brother would have done this. Everybody else is lying? Yeah, it has to be. They ain't here from my mouth, I'll tell you that. People talk, you know. That's I know people, people talk. People but I think you're lying to me right no, now, Anthony. No. I think you have a feeling of who might have done this, and the reason you have that feeling is because do you know something? I know nothing. Anthony suggested that police look more closely at another of the couple's friends, a girl by the name of Alex Cosino. 21-year-old Alex was a single mom of two who had been involved in two bust-ups with Johnny, one just two months prior to the murders. In October 2010, Johnny and Lisa had visited Alex and noticed she had a pit bull puppy that wasn't being cared for properly. They offered to buy it off her and agreed to pay $100, but they only ever paid $50. Alex admitted to police that she had been furious at the time, but they soon resolved the issue. Then, around Thanksgiving 2010, Alex bought a car off Johnny, who, according to Zach, was desperate for cash. Not long after she had made the first payment of $750, half of the full amount to the car, the car had broken down. Alex refused to give more money for the car. Did you use, with Johnny, pills? Yeah. Smoke weed? Yeah. Did you buy your weed from Johnny? No. Did you buy your pills from Johnny? No. Who'd you buy your weed from? I mean, I know all the players in this thing. Yeah, I, I really do. do. No, I know you do. But see, there's a lot of, like, with this whole situation, like, you, I, I'm from the east side. I'm not from the south side. So, like, a lot of people over there I know, I really don't know them, though. Because okay. they, they won't, like, talk to me. They won't have nothing to okay. do with me because I am from the east side. All right. All right. So, okay, after Johnny and Lisa broke up, you guys sleep together. Did you still see Johnny every so often at a... We just like in trap, like bumping each other, like out and about, you know. Okay. But like we didn't really hang out or nothing like that. Johnny had some good friends. Johnny had a lot of good friends. Right. Uh, he had. Uh, well, one one of his good friends was Tiffany. Did you know Tiffany? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I know Tiffany. <laughs> Her father, child's father, is killed at my house. So I know Tiffany. Okay. And we don't get along. Don't you don't get along with Tiffany. You talk to Zach a lot on the phone. Mm -hmm. A lot. I know. I call him all the time. It's my little, what I do you, get, what are you guys talking about? Pills? I just tell him random weed? stuff. No, I don't get my pills and weed off of him, though. That's what's so crazy. But So you've, Zach, talk, you've talked to Zach a lot yeah. since this whole thing's happened. That's like, I would, I, that Zach's like, my family knows Zach. My kids know Zach. Like, they love him. What's, what's Zach been like since the homicide? How's he been active? The same. Same as always? Yeah. But I know Zach's got a real bad pill problem. Oh, man. That's why I'm glad he's doing it right now. Yeah. I just actually, unless they took my letter, there's, um, I wrote Zach a letter. <clears throat> the whole time, the whole entire time where I, I mean, basically, he, I felt like he was putting me in a corner because he kept begging me to buy the car off him. Like, he really needed the money. I really need the money. I really need the money. I'm like, okay, well, I had a 59, but I didn't want to give him all my money, so I told him I'll give you half. Where'd you get that kind of money? Huh? <laughs> Where'd you get $1,500? Just from, like, you know, holidays and stuff. No. But, um... No. I don't know if it's from around. All right. But, um... So, I tell him that 
you know, I'd rather wait. He, he just pestered me, will not stop. Like, he's begging me, like, he's really literally begging me. Like, and I was, Johnny, like, I, I'm, what if you just, you know, take off with my money, you know? And <clears throat> so by the time we got back to Zach's house, we reached an agreement that I'd give him half money, 750. And then okay. it was a big situation with his mom. His mom is like certifiably crazy. You're because talking about my day? Yeah. Yeah, certifiably crazy. Like before this happened, she was nuts. Like, okay. So now you've got the car. Well, see, the, the, that night everything was like, you know, on eggshells with my day about the car. Right. But the next day, things were fine. Like it wasn't, it was a big deal, but it wasn't a big deal because. She, she knows Johnny made that decision, and okay. she couldn't. Well, it was Johnny's it. car. Exactly. He bought that money with his money, or yeah. bought that car with his money. She was just trying to, you know, be a mom, and I understand right. though. She and was I looking out to make sure I he didn't. Honestly, take. I didn't even want to buy the car. Like, I felt Johnny just would not stop. Like he was so incessant. It was just, I just like shut up here, take it. Like I don't even care. I do need the car. I got the money for it, so just shut up, please. Okay. Like, so did you ever, you never got it transferred into your no, name? No, never okay. got it switched over because so, I was going to wait till I finished paying him. All right, so you didn't pay him the rest because? The car, the tire fell off. Did you hit something? No. Did you no. hit a pothole? No, did you I hit a guardrail? No, I didn't hit anything. How long after you bought the car did the wheel fall off? Like a week and a half, maybe two weeks. This moment. is after you moved to Berry Street? Yeah. Okay. Johnny's father had picked up the car from Alex and would later testify that Alex had threatened Johnny over the phone. Others would later testify that Alex had also threatened Lisa. Alex willingly gave her DNA to police, which was not a match. She told detectives that she believed someone had murdered Johnny and Lisa over money owed, and Johnny, she said, owed thousands. Anthony Watson returned to police with a scenario he'd heard from a female friend, in which three men, including someone by the name of Samuel Williams, had attempted to rob the Straub home. He told police that according to the girl, they had been looking for heroin and the rumored safe. It wasn't faced, you know what I mean? I guess it wasn't seen by face, but it was, you know what I mean? I guess it was, from what it was, she told me they were messed up, you know what I mean? Who was messed up? Maxed up. Oh, mask it yeah. up. Oh. Okay. So he confronted somebody. Yeah, he confronted somebody when he walked out, and then they pushed him back inside. They brought him back inside, and that's when it all went bad. from the house looking for and he couldn't find sh They couldn't find no safe, nothing. So I guess they started uh, checking in walls and sh Anthony told detectives that the woman had also placed herself at the scene of the crime. She was someone that police had already interviewed several times, he said who had previously slept with Johnny, but now passionately hated him. After this tip-off, a pending felony burglary charge against Anthony would be reduced to a misdemeanor, but any further cooperation he could have offered ended with his life in 2018 when he was gunned down by an unknown assailant. Police now had a breakthrough. The Newport cigarette butt found near the garage door contained DNA evidence that was a 50-50 match for two individuals. Samuel Williams and Cameo Petaway, the same Sam who had been named in the tip-off by Anthony Watson. 22-year-old Sam Williams had been in and out of jail for years. Sam and Cameo were childhood friends and known to share a cigarette or two. Cameo had done several stints in prison and had reportedly been overheard saying he was looking for a big hit. Sam, it seemed, had been trying to turn his life around. He had received his GED in 2010, and by the autumn of 2011 was studying sociology and criminal justice. Police arrested Sam while out buying cigarettes. He would later say that he thought it was for a probation violation over domestic violence charges and had only become worried when he saw the FBI badges. You know a guy named uh, Johnny Clark? You don't know John Clark? You know a young lady named Lisa Straub? No, don't know John no. Clark, you don't know Lisa Straub. Have you ever been to that house since Springfield Township? No. Okay. You sure? Um, positive. All right. All right. Well, I'm 100% positive. All right. Some more names? Yeah. You know what? Uh, I'm going to throw some names at you. You know, you tell me, you know, you know, uh, Tom Watson? You know Tom? 
Anthony, Tone, always hangs out with a... I know a couple of Tonys, but not, you don't go by Tone. Well, okay. Anthony, Tony, um, hangs with a dude, mixed dude, Zach, Fat Zach. You know, Fat Who's Zach. Who's the Tonys you know? Yeah. I know one from the east side, um, Starlet, my baby mom's other baby dad, Anthony Wolf. Can we get to the to the meat of what we want to talk to you about then? Go ahead. We had a problem at that house last winter. Did you hear anything about it? No. Okay. A couple of kids were found dead in there. Young adults, and uh, they were probably the victim of a burglary. They got bum rushed in the place. You know what we're talking about, bum rushed. Somebody just crashes in on you and maybe robs you or burglarizes your house. I mean, you know what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's what happened to these young couples. So how did my name get brought up in this? Science. I don't understand how. Well, remember when these guys respond to a scene and they go in there. You're a criminal justice major, right? You cordon off the area. Everybody that is involved in that scene goes in, they start collecting evidence. Okay? These guys collected a lot of evidence. And they had a lot of evidence tested for DNA. Do you know what DNA is? Okay, explain to us what you think DNA is. You, you, saliva, whatever. Saliva, poop, piss, skin cells, hair, follicles, all that stuff gives up an individual's individual characteristics. Do you buy that based on what you've been taught in school? I haven't, I'm only doing my, like, Basic okay. courses right, right. now. I'm not doing. They that. will tell you soon enough that DNA is like fingerprints. You know, there's no two fingerprints that are alike. There's no two DNAs that are alike. Now, when these guys collected a lot of pieces of evidence in there that were involved in this crime, they sent it down to Bowling Green for testing. Okay. And items in that scene came back with your DNA. On it. Okay? Well, how do you explain that? How can we explain that? I have no idea. You've never been to that house? Never been you to that house. You don't know those kids? I don't know them people. And your DNA's in that house? I don't know. You have no idea? No. Do you understand where that puts you? Do you understand where this is going? In September 2011, Sam pled not guilty to the murders of Johnny Clark and Lisa Straub. Soon after, Kemio Petaway was arrested and indicted as an accomplice. The entire case for both rested on a small amount of DNA found on a single cigarette butt. But within days, that would change. While being held at the Lucas County Jail, Sam began making phone calls using another inmate's PIN, a tactic to evade police tracking phone calls on specific inmates. The calls were made to Stephen Petaway, Cameo's brother, and the content of those calls were damning. During one call, Sam said, When you was in the joint, man, we took off, man. That was supposed to be me and you, but you know, Lil Bro had to step up and take your spot, man. Stephen Petaway responded, Yeah, but you know he ain't gonna. He ain't gonna do it right like I would do it right. In a later interview with investigative journalist Brian Duggar, Sam would claim that the calls were taken out of context. Sam claimed he had been referring to the prostitution racket he had going on with Stephen Petaway, not the murders. In another conversation, he told Stephen that he'd effed up and was going away for a long time. But this, he said, was a reference to not having sold the drugs that he had in order to afford a decent lawyer. Meanwhile, a woman named Destiny Madrid came forward claiming that she was with Sam the night of the murder. He was with me that night. 
and I want to say, I'm not quite sure, but I want to say that we had went to the Bedford Hotel that night, but I'm not sure. I haven't went to the hotel. I don't know if I can go to the hotel and get the like records. All right, what if I clear it up for you? What if I tell you that you're not on the video at the bottom line on that night? What do you mean? The bottom line has video. Right. So you or Sam are not on that video that night inside the bottom line. Or whatever bar that was. Was it the bottom line? Yeah. yeah. We were sitting right by the front door. Like oh, that okay. table by the front door it was like right. right there. There was four seats. And I don't know who the other guy that was with us, but I know it was me, Sam, and Larry. And then there was another person, but I don't know what his name was. But we were sitting like. Here's the door and the table, like right there. We were sitting right there. Like, what was on TV that night? The NFC football game. The NFC. Oh, the championship game? Yeah. Yep. It was, I want to say it was a Sunday. To be honest, I want to say it was a Sunday that we were there. Because Sundays they normally have karaoke, but I think the karaoke was not there that night. Detective Kozak's challenge was a bluff. The bar had no CCTV camera. But despite this, Destiny would never be called on to testify at Sam's trial. Soon afterwards, a jailhouse informant by the name of Eric Yingling came forward. Yingling was being held on the same floor of the Lucas County Jail as Sam and had gained his trust by explaining that he'd already been sentenced and therefore had nothing to gain from being a snitch. Yingling told police that Sam had gone into elaborate detail on his role in the murders of Johnny and Lisa. This is an abbreviated version of his account. He did tell me that he went through the garage and there was an entrance door to the home. Johnny Clark was on the phone and he said that he went into the house and they started yelling and getting violent with it. And Johnny Clark told Lisa to go upstairs and they started yelling and screaming about where's the diesel, where's the money, and they're telling them there's nothing there. They were searching for the stuff and couldn't find anything. Lisa had gone upstairs and went into a locked room. Sam had to push his way through the locked door to get in there and bring her out and bring her downstairs. They were trying to torture Lisa, for lack of better words, to motivate Johnny to tell them, hey, here's where the money is, here's where the drugs are. And it never happened. On the third time that Lisa passed out, she never woke up. Sam and Cameo, at that point, went into the garage. While they were in the garage, Eric Taylor was inside, killing Johnny Clark. Cam Petaway, by Sam's word, is the one who had killed Lisa Straub. They did not go there to kill anybody. Yingling also said that they had found some foreign currency in the Straub home, but they didn't know how to exchange it for U.S. currency. The jury trials for the two men took place simultaneously in July of 2012 on different floors of the same courthouse. The defense team in both trials argued that there had been errors made in collecting the evidence at the crime scene and that nothing definitely proved the cigarette butt had been left there the night of the murder or left there by Sam or Cameo. Neither Sam nor Cameo were the source of the DNA found on the duct tape, Johnny's clothing, or the broken cell phone. The prosecution argued that gloves may have been worn. Cameo Petaway was acquitted on the grounds that the burden of proof had not been met. The prosecution of Sam Williams, however, had not only the DNA evidence, but the jailhouse phone calls and the testimony of informant Eric Yingling. Detective Kozak testified that the information about the Iraqi currency was not public knowledge and something only the killer had known. On July 27, 2012, a jury found Samuel Todd Williams guilty of two counts of aggravated murder, kidnapping, and burglary. He was sentenced to two life terms without the possibility of parole. Justice had prevailed. Or had it? In 2021, a deep-dive investigation into the case by journalist Brian Duggar explored the various holes in the case against Sam Williams. Duggar revealed that information about the Iraqi dinars had been public knowledge as early as three days after the murder. It was mentioned on CNN. Yingling later admit that his wife had researched the case online. During Sam's trial, his alibi for the night of the murders and the evidence and affidavits supporting that 
were not made available. Destiny Madrid had been arrested for obstructing justice shortly after her interview with police. Sam maintained in his interview with Duggar that he was at the bottom line bar on the night of January 30th for a friend's 21st birthday. I know that I was at the bottom line bar watching the Provo with a few other people, which one was Destiny Madrid, the girl that got arrested on my case. Um, my cousin Larry Gilhouse was there. Eddie Flores um, was there. And there was other people that was in that bar, obviously. Sam also claimed that phone records showed that his phone pinged off a cell tower near the bar at 10.27 p.m., 20 miles from the home of Lisa's parents, placing him far away from the scene of the call that was overheard by Tiffany at 10.41 p.m. The call was to Destiny, who was on her way to the bar. But Sam admits that he had at least three cell phones at the time of the murders, and there was no proof that the number he refers to was his. About one thing, there seems to be a consensus. It would have taken more than one man to overpower Johnny and Lisa. Curiously, Cameo Petaway's cell phone did not receive or send any messages or calls from 6.35 p.m. on January 30th until 12.59 a.m. on January 31st. Journalist Brian Duggar is pushing for police to use more advanced DNA technology to help identify the other perpetrators in the attack. One person in particular, he suggests, has not shared all that she knows with police. That person, he says, is Alex Cosino. Alex was the only person who knew both Sam Williams and Johnny Clark. Alex had known Sam since she was 13 years old and considered him as a brother. Prior to their arrests, Alex admitted that she hung out a lot, very often, with Sam and Cameo. During her court testimony, she admitted to sending this threatening message to a girl in the early morning hours of February 1st, just two days after the murders. Paraphrasing, you don't know me. I do this kind of thing. Watch the news. These people get duct taped and tied up and left for dead. You should have asked me, and I would have told you who I am. Period. And there are others, too. In September 2016, Johnny's parents, along with police veteran Frank Ramirez, were convicted of hatching a plot to kill Tiffany Williams after firing shots at her from a car. Tiffany claimed in court that she had been stalked and harassed since the night of the murders. Meanwhile, friends and family of both Lisa and Johnny were left to pick up the pieces. I feel numb to the whole situation. I just... It's been very tough on me. Again, she was my best friend, so I've kind of just... And for parents, there's no respite from the pain. There's blood on the wall here. There's blood on the wall here. And there was blood right here. Was there any blood on the TV, do you remember? Yeah, there was blood on the TV. Okay. There was blood on the chairs. There's blood on this chair, there's blood on the table, there's blood on the Hobby Lobby bag that was sitting there. Okay. Thanksgiving is a time for family and friends to gather, thankful for everything they have been given, sharing in the bounty of the season. So how did that wonderful holiday tie in to the disappearance of a young mother and the eventual discovery of her brutal murder? Join us as we look into the horrifying case of Kelsey Barreth. Before we begin, we would like to extend our deepest sympathies to the family and friends of Kelsey Barreth. Twenty-nine-year-old Kelsey Barreth was making her way in life, establishing her career as a flight instructor and raising her one-year-old daughter, Kaylee, in a picturesque area called Woodland Park, Colorado. She had a relationship with a handsome young rancher she had met through a dating website. The two built a relationship that reflected the mountains in which they lived, rocky but filled with promise if you worked hard to make it a home together. 
Kelsey grew up on a farm in Washington State and pursued her passion of flying, becoming a licensed pilot and eventually a flight instructor for DOS Aviation in Pueblo, Colorado. Her small town home at 269 East Lake Avenue in Woodland Park was a great starting point for a single mom. Quiet and in a nice community, the home was just an hour commute to the office and a 20-minute drive to little Kaylee's father's ranch near Florissant, Colorado. That pleasant story began to play out differently, though, on December the 2nd, 2018, when local police knocked on Kelsey's door for a welfare check on the young woman. Kelsey's mom, Cheryl Barreth, had not heard from her in some time, all the way back to Thanksgiving, 10 days before. It was something completely out of the ordinary for the young woman, who made it a point to stay in touch with her family members and friends. This morning, a nationwide search is on for missing mother and pilot Kelsey Barrett. She was last seen wearing a white shirt, a gray sweater, uh, blue pants, possibly blue jeans, um, with a brown purse and white shoes. The 29-year-old who has a one-year-old daughter was last seen more than two weeks ago on Thanksgiving Day. Over the weekend, neighbors and friends gathered for a vigil, praying for Kelsey's safe return. Please keep the family of Kelsey Barrett in your heart and soul. Holding out hope that Kelsey will be found. Police found no one at home and the neighbors hadn't noticed her coming and going over the preceding days. Her boyfriend, Patrick Frazee, had said that he hadn't seen Kelsey since they met to exchange their daughter, who was currently staying with him. He did say that the two had talked and texted during that time, but that he hadn't heard anything at all in the last couple of days. A check with her employer provided them with the information that she had texted them a few days before that she would need to take a week off because her grandmother wasn't well and Kelsey would need to travel back to Washington State. Management at the company say they approved the time off but hadn't heard from her since. Cheryl, however, quickly let them know that there was no emergency with Kelsey's grandmother and a check with the family there showed that the young woman had never arrived, nor had they been expecting her. No one seemed to know where she was, and no one could say when she had left for sure. Local police and the Teller County Sheriff's Office immediately began the process of searching for a missing person. Right away, a search warrant was issued to Verizon to access the records of Kelsey's cell phone. First, they found 19 communications between her phone and that of Patrick Frazee, corroborating his story that they had talked at first and then texted during the intervening week. He told investigators that she had responded to his last texts as having gone out for a run and that she was going to jump in the shower. The text from Kelsey's phone ended after that. There were no other calls or texts from her phone after that, but the last electronic signal from the phone was a single ping detected on a cell tower in rural Gooding, Idaho. That ping was over 800 miles away and a long 12 and a half hour drive, and it was nowhere near anyone or anything Kelsey had a connection with. Just one ping so far away. What was the connection? The answer was on the other end of Kelsey's phone records that investigators found as they searched through Patrick Frazee's records. There, among all of his regular day-to-day -day communications was a single phone number in Gooding, Idaho. It was literally the needle in the haystack they had been searching for. Investigators called the number and connected with 31-year-old Crystal Lee Kenny, a nurse and former rodeo beauty queen. At first, Kenny said that she didn't know Kelsey or Patrick, but she quickly changed her story. When she began to speak, everything about the horrific story came tumbling out. She began by telling them that she had to tell the truth, that she didn't want Kelsey's family to be left wondering what had happened to their daughter. She said that Patrick had killed Kelsey and she herself hadn't driven to clean up the mess left behind in Kelsey's apartment after the young woman had been murdered. She admitted that she had then carried Kelsey's telephone, purse, and ID back to Idaho, where the items were then burned on Crystal's property. Crystal had met Patrick years before when she had come to Colorado to look at some horses he had for sale. Patrick, who trained cattle dogs and did farrier work shoeing horses and trimming their hooves, had a lot in common with the former rodeo queen, and they began a long-distance romance, but it was one that had faded with time. 
Crystal had married and started a family of her own, but the two kept in touch. Patrick told her many times about Kelsey, but had said that she was abusive to him and his daughter. Crystal continued and said over the intervening year, he had told her that things were going terribly in the relationship. And finally, he asked her to help him by killing Kelsey. Still devoted to Patrick, Crystal said they had concocted a plan where they would poison the young mom. A trained nurse, Crystal said that she could give her a lethal combination of Valium and Ambien, and Kelsey would just drift off to sleep and never wake up. Crazily, Crystal actually agreed to drive to Woodland Park and to do just that. She told investigators from the local police, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and special agents with the FBI that one morning she ordered a large vanilla mocha drink from Starbucks and took it to Kelsey's home. The drink, Patrick told her, was Kelsey's all-time favorite and she would find it irresistible, thereby ensuring that she would drink the lethal cocktail. Crystal knocked on the door, and when Kelsey answered it, she immediately introduced herself as a new neighbor from down the street. She then said that she thanked Kelsey for helping her get her dogs back a couple of days before. When Kelsey said that wasn't her, Crystal just played it off as no big deal and offered her the drink as an attempt to meet a new neighbor. Kelsey thanked her, and Crystal quickly left. She told police that it didn't matter whether or not Kelsey had drunk the coffee because she couldn't go through with putting the drugs in it. It was just coffee and in no way dangerous. Patrick apparently figured that Kelsey had not fallen for the plan simply by not drinking the drink. He provided Crystal with a metal pipe next and told her to lay in wait near the side entrance to the townhome and then just crack her on the head with it. Once again, Crystal couldn't bring herself to do it. He then provided her with an aluminum baseball bat and ordered her to ambush her again. After the third attempt did not go through, Patrick sent her back home. On Thanksgiving night, he would call Crystal and tell her, it's done, you've got something to clean up. He told her he would provide a key to Kelsey's place and that she would go in and clean it thoroughly, getting rid of any evidence. He also told her, she said, how he had killed her. He said they had met up to share a small Thanksgiving meal at Kelsey's place. Security footage from earlier in the day would show Kelsey at a local Safeway grocery store with Kaylee in a baby car seat. They were shopping for the ingredients for a sweet potato casserole. Further, security camera footage from her next-door neighbor's home would show Kelsey, Casey, and Patrick entering the home as a group, with nothing looking out of place. Patrick said that while she was getting ready, he had challenged Kelsey to a little game that he had devised. He told her that he had bought three scented candles and wanted to know if she could pick out what their scents were without reading the labels. She would have to wear a blindfold to do it, though. A makeshift blindfold was fashioned out of one of her sweaters, and Patrick lit the first candle. As she leaned over to get the scent of it, he brutally hit her over the head with a baseball bat. He then continued to beat her. He told Crystal that at one point, Kelsey had uttered her last words, begging him to stop. He didn't. After hearing the horrible story, Crystal could have said no right there and turned him in, but she didn't. She'd tell investigators that she was not just in love with Patrick, but also terrified of him as well. She told Patrick she couldn't come immediately because of the holiday, but within a couple of days, she was back in Colorado with a car full of cleaning equipment and a grim and bloody task on her hands. Going into the townhome was like walking into a horror show. Blood and gore were everywhere. The signs of struggle were apparent, the only thing missing was Kelsey's body. Patrick had taken it from the scene already. With determination, she set about cleaning the place. She would later be taken back to the townhome by the investigators to show them just what she had seen and cleaned. Investigators provided Crystal with a cap and a jacket to conceal her identity going into the house. This video was taken by investigators as she took them through the home. She begins in the living room area. Again, on the 21st of December 2018, um, we're inside Kelsey's apartment with Crystal. Um, her attorney's with us. What did you see? Blood all over the floor. I saw blood up the wall. I saw blood on the roof wall. She continues on, showing investigators where she purposefully left some small blood spatters so they could be found as evidence. Can you show me where you left those? 
but it was maybe right there. I know it was down low and then I left one up high. Crystal then takes them to the bedroom area and to the bathroom, further explaining how large the crime scene was within the home. Did you touch or manipulate anything in here while you were in here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, put laundry detergent in the washing machine and towels in there. Um, I had been instructed to try to wash things, really? and I didn't, didn't do that. You put a towel? There might have been a couple of towels that I put inside the washing machine, but they were just towels from dirty laundry. They weren't, they didn't have anything on them that I was aware of. Do you remember what color they were? Red. And, and there, so there may have been um, bloody footprints in here, but I don't specifically remember. I wiped um, the toilet, the top of the toilet. Um, I turned on the shower, the intake sphere was stuff in the bottom. I didn't see anything in the bottom of the shower. All right. They return to the kitchen area and she details more of the cleaning that she did and didn't do. There was blood on top of the coffee maker. There was blood. Um, in fact, I had to climb up near the blood batter up high. How'd you call it? Well, I had to climb up right here. And so any of the, anything that was in the thing, I don't know. Um, I don't remember exactly, but I put it in the thing. She continues discussing how much blood there was in the place and where she may have missed cleaning. It was great, but to get the curtains off, I had to climb up and undo, and it, um, it, uh, um, it, it was straight. And after I got done with it, it wasn't straight anymore. Okay. The ferocity of the attack becomes apparent as she points out just how high on the walls that she found Kelsey's blood. The spray was, uh, from here, all the way, uh, I had to clean up underneath here, then it was all down here. And uh, I, I know that I didn't get um, there. Crystal went on to take them upstairs to show them where there had been bloody footprints left and then told them that Patrick had told her to be on the lookout for a tooth that Kelsey had lost during the beating. Where the tooth was? Here's the bird. Crystal described the gruesome scene and forensic teams would scour the home, collecting even more evidence, proving her tale to be true of at least what she had walked into. But could they trust her that Patrick had been the killer? Crystal told them that after cleaning up the evidence as best she could, she put clothes, baby toys, books, and even Kelsey's blood-covered Bible into trash bags and headed out to Patrick's ranch. There, she would meet him, and they would destroy the evidence. But where was Kelsey's body? Investigators asked. Crystal said that the man had loaded it into a big plastic tote and put it in the bed of his truck and drove away from the house on Thanksgiving evening. Scouring every security camera in the immediate vicinity, investigators would eventually turn up images of Patrick and his red truck. At 12.44 p.m., the truck passes by a local business, Williams Log Cabin Furniture, headed toward Kelsey's home. The large black tote box can be seen in the bed of the truck. He was also photographed at an ATM machine that day, and the black plastic tote was clearly visible in the drive-away picture. He is later seen at a gas station with the tote filling up a gas can. The tote is visible again. A search warrant was then served to allow police to search the ranch where Patrick lived with his mother. Crystal accompanied the investigators and pointed out where he had put the black tote box and where the two had made a burn pit to dispose of the evidence and Kelsey's body. Crystal explained that the pair had built a fire and tossed in what she had brought, the clothes, the toys, the Bible, and the grisly remains he had taken as well. As they checked the barn at the farm, cadaver dogs alerted investigators that they had picked up a scent from an area with hay bales. A discolored area matching the size and shape of the black tote box was found, and Crystal confirmed that that was where Kelsey's body had been kept before they burned it. 
A number of similar black totes were found around the farm used for a number of everyday uses as well. There was no longer a doubt in the minds of the investigators that they had their murderer, even without finding Kelsey's body. The eyewitness account of the burning of the body plus the blood evidence at the crime scene left no doubt that Kelsey had been slain. Patrick Frazee was arrested. Local law enforcement, along with the district attorney and representatives of the Colorado Bureau of Investigations and the FBI, held a press conference to announce the arrest. Today we arrested Patrick Frazee on charges of first-degree murder of Kelsey Barrett, and he is currently being held in the Teller County Jail. As a reminder, Patrick Frazee is presumed innocent until proven guilty. Police Chief Miles DeYoung said that little Kaylee had been placed in protective custody and would be reunited with Kelsey's family. He asked the press to heed the family's request for no interviews during this difficult time. He then continued describing the situation at hand. This has been a methodical and time-consuming multi-state operation with investigators working nearly around the clock to find Kelsey. As you can tell from the arrest, sadly, we do not believe Kelsey is still alive. He told the crowd that even though the arrest had been made, there was still much work to do and it was underway in continuing their investigation. We have also conducted multiple searches at Kelsey's home and other locations as part of this comprehensive investigation. I can tell you we understand you demand it, a full accounting of why this has happened and nothing is more important to all of us than determining the circumstances surrounding Kelsey's murder and bringing Kelsey and her family justice. District Attorney Dan May spoke next. Patrick Frazee was charged uh, this, uh, this morning with first degree murder and solicitation for first degree murder. Uh, that is what he was booked in on. Uh, those who may be familiar with the process, uh, formal charges will be filed in the days ahead. FBI Special Agent Mike Nordwell spoke to the FBI's involvement in the case. Over the past three weeks, the FBI has provided our evidence response team, expertise from our behavioral analysis unit, technical analysis, and investigative resources from multiple field divisions across several states. As the press began asking questions, Chief DeYoung retook the podium and answered them as best he could in light of the ongoing investigation. We're still working on that charge. Um, that has been, uh, that has reached a point where we are able to charge that point, but I'm not able to comment on that because of multiple things that are going on related to that charge. If there are additional arrests related to a solicitation charge, that's an absolute possibility, but I'm not going to um, guess on that at this point. Crystal Kenny's involvement in the case becomes apparent in his explanation. The district attorney would then touch on the fact that Patrick was also being charged with solicitation for enlisting her help in the attempted murder and the eventual disposal of evidence and the body. We have a solicitation crime in our code, so it doesn't matter whether it's burglary, robbery, murder, if you're soliciting someone to help out in that crime and you have to take a substantial step towards really completing that. So it isn't just a discussion. You've actually done something that shows the firmness of your actions. You don't necessarily have to complete it uh, to, be a, uh, to have a solicitation charge, uh, but you have to show firmness of what you intended to do. In the intervening months before Patrick would come to trial, investigators would work hard at trying to answer every possible question, the biggest being the actual proof of Kelsey's remains. While a portion of a tooth was found in the ashes of the burn pit location, forensic teams from the state and and the FBI could only confirm that it was human and had come from a female. There just wasn't enough extractable DNA left to prove that it was Kelsey's. The testimony from Crystal that she had retrieved a tooth from the murder scene at Patrick's request and then finding burnt tooth remains at his ranch would have to do. Patrick apparently was hard at work as well. While being held in jail, he began soliciting for help again murderous help. It seemed to be a pattern for him. Patrick approached another inmate at the Teller County Jail and asked for help. The inmate was known to others as someone who had done some serious time and had been part of a prison gang. The man was only being held for a short time for missing a court date, and Patrick figured the man would go out and possibly kill off some of his loose ends for him 
possibly even using some of the old prison gang contacts. Using jail commissary receipts and paper towels, Patrick began providing him with a hit list and detailed instructions of what he wanted done. Each time after passing the man one of the sheets of paper, he warned him to read them, memorize them, and then flush them to get rid of the evidence. Unbeknownst to Patrick, the man, who still sported his prison gang facial tattoos, had no intention of carrying out even a single one of the requests. He was trying to straighten out his life and had put his bad days behind him. The man turned the notes over to officers at the jail and told everything to the prosecution team. By the time Patrick made it to court, any pretense that he had not done the crime was almost a foregone conclusion. Crystal Kinney took the stand and provided her own account to the jury, protected now by a plea deal that would have her only face punishment for tampering with evidence. The district attorney said that it was a deal with the devil, but one that had to be done to get her full cooperation. Other friends and family members, experts, and investigators also testified in the trial. A story of Patrick was put together that showed him to be an abusive, controlling person who attempted to manipulate everyone around him. Testimonies from Kelsey's friends and family members independently described a deteriorating relationship and one in which he was trying to gain full custody of the child one way or the other. Patrick's own brother, Sean Frazee, a policeman from Colorado Springs, even told the jury that he had been at the ranch on Thanksgiving for a family celebration on the day of the event. The meal started at 2.30, but Patrick didn't show up and never called to say he would be late. He didn't come through the door until nearly 5 p.m. and never offered any explanation for missing Thanksgiving dinner. No one there, though, could have known what horrific things Patrick had been doing that day in instead. In the end, after pleading not guilty, Patrick would not take the stand in his own defense, declaring that he would remain silent. The defense attorneys called no witnesses of their own, and their defense of his actions was only to say that Patrick was guilty of saying stupid things and that Crystal Kinney had made up the entire timeline of the killing. The defense's reasoning fell on unsympathetic ears. The jury only had to deliberate the case for three and a half hours before returning a verdict of guilty on all counts versus Patrick Frazee. In the end, he would be sentenced to life without parole plus 156 years. He would appeal the decision two years later, but in January of 2023, the appeal was denied. Crystal Kinney would be sentenced to three years in prison. She, through her attorneys, would later appeal that sentence as being beyond the maximum penalty for the crime that she had agreed to admit to in her plea bargain. An appeals court found that she had been missentenced and reduced it to 18 months. She was released for the time served after the appeal case was won. Little Kaylee is now being raised by Kelsey's family and probably will never have any actual memories of her mother. It is a sad ending to a tragic story, even if the guilty parties were punished for their deeds. Justice never heals all wounds. We can only hope that time will. This footage captures 23-year-old university student Molly McLaren and her ex-boyfriend, 26-year-old Joshua Stimson, working out at their local gym. It had been just two weeks since the couple had split up, and Joshua still had strong feelings for Molly. Such strong feelings, in fact, that he had spent days planning exactly how he was going to deal with her. And by the morning of June 29, 2017, he was certain of one thing. Molly was not going to leave their relationship alive. Before we start, we would like to send our sincere condolences to the loved ones of Molly McLaren. Molly McLaren was born on June 26, 1994, in the picturesque town of Cobham in Kent, South England. Her parents, Joanne and Douglas McLaren, described her as a kind-hearted, bubbly, and beautiful person inside and out. Growing up, Molly had struggled with bulimia and anxiety. In recent years, she had worked to overcome her issues and had become passionate about promoting self-love 
acceptance, and positivity. And by 2015, she was ready for a fresh start. Molly began studying for a degree in exercise, sport, and health education at the University of Kent. She embraced her student life. She joined societies and sports clubs and had regular nights out with her new friends that she had made in her course of study. And she had started a new fitness blog where she shared motivational quotes and videos of her workouts. By the summer of 2016, Molly felt ready to meet someone. She downloaded the popular dating app Tinder, and it was on Tinder that Molly would swipe right on 26-year-old Joshua Stimson. Stimson had grown up in Stoke-on-Trent before moving to Woodham near Rochester, just seven miles from Molly. Joshua, like Molly, had battled mental health issues with his first referral to a mental health specialist at just 12 years old. His parents had recently divorced at the time and his father was given full custody of Joshua. This didn't sit well with him. He felt like his mother had abandoned him. As a teenager, Joshua would regularly be seen as an outpatient at the Kingsley House Mental Health Clinic in Kent, but he refused counseling for his depression but was eventually prescribed antidepressants. By 2016, he was working a job in a warehouse and had a less than ideal past when it came to dating. His last relationship had ended with a confrontation in which he spat in his girlfriend's face. Molly and Joshua matched on July 31st, 2016. Soon they were chatting regularly. 24-year-old Joshua shared with Molly his own struggles with anxiety and depression. He told Molly he had suffered from bipolar disorder. Like Molly, he was also a fitness enthusiast. Molly felt a connection with Joshua. And so, in November of 2016, they finally met in person. Over the coming weeks, the two would spend more and more time together. Soon, Molly would tell her friends that she was falling for him. It was Molly's first proper relationship. But for Molly's friends and family, alarm bells were ringing. Her friends remember feeling on edge around him. When I met him, he wasn't overly chatty. He didn't seem to have any interest in getting to know them or any friends of his own. Molly's parents were concerned at how much time and energy he was demanding. He seemed to have no respect for boundaries. If Molly told him she couldn't meet him that day, he would just turn up at the house anyway. He wanted her full attention. After one weekend where she studied while he'd hung around the house, he messaged her. It's unfair me wasting hours of my weekend sat on your bed in silence. Molly was beginning to feel suffocated. She wrote to Joshua that she needed some space. We can't be with each other 24-7. I feel really pressured. Joshua fired back with insults and abuse. She was taking him for granted, throwing his kindness back in his face. Molly apologized, but her friends were shocked. It was clear that Joshua was manipulating Molly. His manipulation was already more ingrained than anyone knew. Joshua had never been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. He had concocted the diagnosis as a way of getting sympathy and attention from Molly, and it was a tool he would use again and again. Often, when Molly made plans with friends, Joshua would suddenly have an episode of depression that required Molly to cancel. Everywhere Molly went, Joshua insisted on going too. Soon, he quit his job just so he could spend more time with her. He used her issues as a reason for him to be around as well. She needed his support. Soon Molly was telling friends that she just couldn't take it anymore. He was too demanding, too possessive, and they were arguing constantly. After several days in a row of Joshua showing up unannounced at her house, Molly told Joshua it was over. But she didn't know Joshua or his dating history. It wasn't going to be as easy as she imagined. Joshua flipped. He began messaging her incessantly, begging for another chance. Please do not break up with me. I will literally beg. One chance is all I'm asking for. I will do anything. He implied that she was seeing things all wrong, taking things the wrong way. He told her it was anxiety that was the issue. She wasn't happy with herself. He encouraged her to book a GP appointment to seek help. 
After successfully gaslighting her into believing that their relationship issues were all in her head, and yet more badgering and pleading, Molly took him back. For a time, things seemed to improve. Joshua was working again, this time as an operations assistant at a window company. His co-workers said that he seemed to have two sides to him, one that was bright and likable, the other dark, irrational, and withdrawn. And soon, the same old patterns with Molly were repeating themselves. In April of 2017, the pair attended a party together for Molly's aunt's 60th birthday in Essex. Throughout the night, the McLaren family watched as Joshua stared daggers at Molly any time she danced, even with her own cousins. Molly's mother, Joanne, was already in bed when she received a message from Molly asking her to come to their hotel room. Joshua was in a rage. When Joanne arrived in the room, she found a furious Joshua urging her to take a look at the videos he had taken of Molly during recent arguments. He'd been recording and videoing her without her knowledge, just so he would have something he could use against her if he needed it. Joanne remembers thinking, for the first time, that there really was something off about Joshua. She wasn't the only one. Molly was ready to break up with him, but she told her family she wanted to give him one last chance. They had a holiday planned in Tenerife, and against her parents' advice, Molly wanted to go. Maybe on a holiday, they could work out their issues. Within one day of their vacation, she was messaging home that she had made a mistake. Thought this thing with Josh was going to pass, but it's not. It's the worst thing ever. Help me. Upon her return from the trip, Molly told her mother that she no longer had feelings for Joshua. She just needed to find the right time and words to end it with him amicably. That time would end up being June 17, 2017. Molly had made plans to have a night out with friends in Maidstone at a late celebration of her 23rd birthday. For days, she and Joshua had been arguing over Messenger, but they were still a couple and decided to put their differences aside for that night. It didn't take long before Joshua was in one of his moods. This time, though, Molly snapped. In the middle of the club, she told Joshua it was over, and Joshua lost it. He turned and shouted to her friends, She's finished with me! Her friends remember the look on his face, the pure rage. It was the first time they had seen this side of Joshua, but it would not be the last. No one had expected Joshua to take the breakup well, but they hadn't anticipated what would come next. For Molly and her family, the real nightmare was only just beginning. When his pleading for her to take him back failed, he became aggressive. Molly blocked him. Joshua then took to social media and began posting messages designed to humiliate her. He wrote that Molly, the fit, sporty, exercise enthusiast and health student, was a drug abuser. He posted private messages she had sent him and screenshots of their conversation, tagging the family members to make sure they would see them. You are a cokehead. Have you been honest that you need to stop sniffing gear? Gear being a euphemism for drugs. Even lying to your own mom. With Joshua blocked from her own account, Molly had only learned of the messages when a cousin phoned to let her know. Molly was horrified. She had known Joshua could be vindictive, but she never thought he was capable of this. On June 22nd, they printed everything out from the texts to the social media posts and walked down to the North Kent Police Station. Police officer Philpot attended to Molly's case. With Molly and her mother in the room, Philpot phoned Joshua and put him on the loudspeaker. He warned him to stop or face prosecution and ordered him to remove the abusive posts. Molly's mother remembers him saying repeatedly, I haven't done anything wrong. And then finally, if you think I have, there's more to come. Philpot told Joshua, we wouldn't want Molly to come to the station again about you, would we? Joshua's response was chilling. He simply said, wouldn't we? The police report that followed stated that while Molly was upset by Joshua's actions, what Joshua had done did not constitute a course of harassment and did not constitute a criminal offense. The next day, June 23rd, 
Joshua turned up at the police station himself. He had his own complaints to file. He told them that Molly was spreading rumors that he was in trouble with the police and it was damaging his reputation and career. Police advised Joshua to cease any contact with Molly and once again to remove the offending posts. Just two days later, Molly contacted the police again. Joshua had posted another message. Once again, the incident was logged and the information was passed on to Officer Philpot. But Philpot wouldn't be on duty again for the next few days. He wouldn't be able to deal with this until his return. By now, Molly was feeling genuinely fearful of Joshua. Her family circulated photos of him to their neighbors and asked if they saw him near the house to let them know. On June 27th, Molly received what was to be her final call from police. Ostensibly, it was good news. Joshua had removed the offensive posts. He explained that he didn't want potential customers seeing them. In fact, simply, he had a new strategy planned. What no one knew was that just one week earlier, Joshua had stopped by a couple of local hardware stores. In one, he had purchased a knife. In another, a pickaxe and both were now stashed away in his car. He also found a way around Molly blocking him from her accounts. A woman Joshua had stayed in touch with after a single Tinder date agreed to befriend Molly across all her social media accounts and feed back the information to Joshua about her posts. Joshua had misled her on his reasons for following Molly, but now he was able to know Molly's every move. Late that afternoon, Joshua firmed up his plans that he had made with another Tinder date to meet that night. He had a special place in mind for them to grab a drink. It was a warm summer evening on June 28, 2017, and the sun still hours from setting when Molly took a smiling selfie and posted it to Snapchat. She had already changed all the names on her social media accounts and set up new ones. She added the words to the photo, ship and trade this eve with a love heart. It had been a couple of rough months for Molly, and she was ready to unwind with friends at the Ship and Trades pub at the Chatham Docks. They hadn't been there long when Molly went to the bar to order some food. When she came back, her friend said that she looked like she had seen a ghost. In fact, she had seen Joshua sitting with his Tinder date. Later, he walked past her table, making sure to catch her eye on the way. Molly figured it had to be an unlucky coincidence, but she did feel shaken. She told her friends not to worry about him, that he was just some psycho. But she finished her drink and left early. It was the last time they would see her alive. By 10.10 a.m. the next morning, Molly was already at her gym at the Chatham Dockside Outlet. She had been visiting the gym daily to film workouts that she was doing as part of a new personal training course she was enrolled in. There was nobody in the workout room as she pulled out her mat and began her exercises. Minutes later, Joshua arrived. He takes the stairs two at a time to the open door, spies Molly, and does a U-turn back down the stairs. Then he turns right around again and confidently enters the room. Molly is in mid-workout when she looks over and notices the all-too-familiar figure enter. Joshua picks up an exercise mat and starts to stretch right next to where Molly is working out. Molly captures him in her video before going over to confront him. She asks him if he had been following her and why he was not at work. He tells her it's none of her business, so she leaves the room for another part of the gym where she sends several frantic texts. At 10.45 a.m., Molly texted her mother, Joanne, Mom, he's turned up at the gym and come next to me. She then called her mom, who told her to come straight home and drive carefully. Molly then texted a friend, Amy Lee. It was 10.59 a.m. She sent a photo of Joshua in the workout room next to her. Like Joanne, Amy told Molly to go straight back home. At 11 a.m., Molly wrote a reply. She thought that Joshua had left the gym and she was going home. She packed up her equipment and started walking to her car. Joshua had left the gym, but he hadn't left the car park. Joshua had been driving slowly around the car lot waiting for Molly to leave. At 11.02 a.m., Amy wrote, he has no sense of what's normal. He is a freak. 
Just stay away from him. Now inside her car, Molly didn't notice Joshua walking towards her car across the car park, carrying a knife. At 11.08 a.m., Molly looked up to see Joshua jerking open the driver's side door of her black Citroen. Before she could put her hands up to defend herself, he started stabbing. Joshua was a man possessed. He mercilessly stabbed Molly again and again, and he didn't stop until he was sure that Molly was dead. When he was finished, he calmly stepped away, his white tank top splattered in blood, and waited by the car for police. When they approached, he wiped the blood from his face and said matter-of-factly, It's me you're looking for. She's in the car. I've killed her. Despite the best efforts of the paramedics to save her life, 23-year-old Molly McLaren was declared dead at the scene at 11.43 a.m. She had more than 75 stab wounds. Neither Joanne or Amy had heard a word from Molly since she told them that she was going home. Amy then received a message from a friend about an attack at Dockside. Amy remembers thinking it couldn't possibly be Molly. She'd already left. Then a friend that she was with checked Molly's location on Snapchat. It showed her still at Dockside. She'd never made it home. Normally, it took Molly 15 minutes to drive home. As the minutes ticked by, Molly's mother Joanne wondered if she had gotten stuck in traffic. She dropped Molly a message, but heard nothing back. Then came a message from one of Molly's friends asking if she had seen that something was happening at the Chatham dockside. Joanne felt herself go cold. She knew instantly something had happened to Molly. Soon, officers were at the house, confirming her worst fears. The victim in the parking lot was indeed her daughter Molly. Joanne had to pass on the heartbreaking news to her husband, who was on a boat about 100 miles off the coast of Senegal for work, that his beloved daughter had been murdered. The trial began in January of 2018 and would focus primarily on whether or not Joshua Stimson was in control of his faculties when he killed Molly McLaren. Joshua Stimson had pleaded not guilty of murder on the grounds of diminished responsibility owing to a personality disorder. According to UK law, a personality disorder is grounds for diminished responsibility. That diagnosis would ultimately come down to the opinion of two psychiatrists. Psychiatrist Dr. Saheed Majid, the lead forensic consultant at Thornford Park Psychiatric Hospital where Joshua was assessed after Molly's death, was called upon by the defense. Dr. Majid had diagnosed Joshua as suffering from a severe case of borderline personality disorder. At the time of the murder, Dr. Majid said that Joshua was suffering from an abnormality of functioning owing to his mental illness and the abandonment issues that had stemmed from his parents' divorce. Joshua, he said, had a hypersensitivity to any rejection. Arguing on behalf of the prosecution was psychiatrist Dr. Philip Joseph. He disagreed with Majid. Joshua gave no signs of having a mental disorder that impeded his understanding enough to not hold him responsible for his actions. Rather, he was immature, vain, had narcissistic traits, and showed no remorse over killing Molly McLaren, he said. It took a jury less than four hours to come back with a verdict. Joshua Stimson was guilty of murder. At his sentencing hearing, Judge Adele Williams said Joshua didn't have a personality disorder, but just an issue with women. You see, during the trial, the family had learned that he had done this before, stalking and terrorizing. Two women came forward to recount their own chilling experiences with Joshua. Leah Hubbard had met Joshua on a night out at the Source Bar in Maidstone in 2016. The pair had hit it off and met up several times in the days that followed. One night, Leah told Joshua that she was going to a bachelorette party on an upcoming Friday evening. Joshua asked if Leah would be talking to any boys while she was out. The question struck her as odd. They had only just met, and they were not even exclusive, and Joshua was already acting possessive. A few days later, Leah was visiting her grandmother for her birthday when her phone began blowing up with calls and texts from Joshua accusing her of lying about where she was. With red flags everywhere, Leah ended things with him that same day. 
only to awaken a few nights later at 2 a.m. to find Joshua in her house. He told her he'd been out on the town and just needed to charge his phone. The next day, she messaged Joshua to tell him that if he ever did that again, she would call the police. Joshua never came over again. Instead, Leah began noticing him wherever she went, and he was watching her. Things came to a head when he spat a drink in her face at a bar and was forcibly removed from the venue. Joshua, it seemed, had finally decided to move on. But weeks later, he had moved on to Molly McLaren. And this was not the only disturbing story that would come to light during Joshua's trial. In 2013, Alexandra Dale went on one date with Joshua after meeting him on Tinder. After their date, she politely told him that she just didn't feel a connection. She figured that that would be that. But she didn't know Joshua. She was shocked when Joshua then bombarded her phone with calls and messages threatening her, telling her that he would fly out to where she was and drown her. He later sent a picture of her back garden, despite having never told him where she lived, and slashed the tires on her car after telling her, there's a surprise waiting for you when you get home. When Alexandra returned from her holiday, Joshua began showing up on her nights out. He openly followed her around, taking pictures, then sending them to her and branding her a slag for what she was wearing. Alexandra reported the stalking and harassment to Staffordshire police three times throughout 2013, stating that she was fearing for her safety, but his behavior was not recorded as a crime. The investigating officer simply texted Joshua telling him to stop contacting her. Had it been logged properly, Kent police would have seen the 2013 incident report when Molly reported her own experience of harassment and maybe more would have been done to protect her. What motivated Joshua? The motivation is quite simply revenge. They are often controlling personalities with antisocial and narcissistic tendencies who simply cannot abide being rejected. After following Joshua's case closely, Alexandra felt that she had had a lucky escape. She wrote on Facebook, This twisted made my life hell, and the police were informed yet did nothing about it. This poor girl did the same, and still nothing. I can't even imagine what her family are going through. Judge Adele Williams told Joshua that he should never be released for the sheer wickedness of his crimes. You were determined to punish her for finishing with you. You were seeking revenge. She was 23 years old, beautiful and intelligent. Her family's grief and anguish is raw and apparent for everyone to see. You are a highly dangerous young man, and you will pose a very considerable risk to women for a very considerable period of time in the future. He was sentenced to 26 years imprisonment. Molly McLaren's family released a statement following the sentencing. The verdict has brought us a small measure of comfort, but it seems that nothing will take away the pain or allow us to come to terms with our Molly being taken from us. We are serving a lifetime of pain, anguish, and loss. Kent police later invited the Independent Office for Police Conduct to conduct an inquiry into their handling of the case and the series of failings involved. Officers are now required to record stalking as a crime. Today, Molly's legacy lives on through the work of the foundation that her family has set up in her honor. The Molly McLaren Foundation helps to fund charities that educate, raise awareness, and provide support for people who, like Molly, are affected by eating disorders. While Joshua Stimson sits in a prison cell, we will leave you with some final words which are written by Molly before her tragic and untimely death.
This surveillance footage captures Brittany Drexel, a 17-year-old young woman, as she casually leaves a hotel in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where she had gone to spend her spring break with her friends in 2009. But little did anyone know at the time, this would be the last footage ever captured of Brittany before she mysteriously disappeared. After over a decade of searching, false confessions, and dead ends, the case of Brittany Drexel has long since been speculated over. As the years passed, theories grew wilder and more complex until 13 years after she was last seen alive, investigators were finally able to learn the devastating truth about her disappearance and realize the culprit had been right in front of them the whole time. Before we begin, we would like to extend our sincere condolences to the friends and loved ones of Brittany Drexel, whose life was taken so tragically as the result of the events described in this case. On April 25, 2009, 17-year-old Brittany Drexel traveled over 800 miles away from her home in Rochester, New York, to the popular South Carolina beach resort of Myrtle Beach. Having lied to her parents about where she was going and who she was going with, when Brittany failed to respond to her boyfriend, John Greco, the alarm was raised. An investigation was launched and detectives poured over CCTV and witness statements in an attempt to track down the 17-year-old's last movements. Brittany had last been seen walking to a neighboring hotel a mile away, off to meet with a group of friends that she had made on the trip. Once at the hotel, Brittany stayed for a few minutes until she got into an argument with one of the girls she had traveled with over a pair of shorts that she had borrowed. The 17-year-old was captured on CCTV exiting her friend's hotel and walking back to the Bar Harbor Hotel at 1010 North Ocean Boulevard. As she continued, Brittany had texted John about the argument before she stopped replying shortly after 9.15 p.m. Authorities discovered her phone had been pinged and had traveled along Route 17 near the boundary between Georgetown County and Charleston County before abruptly stopping in a swampy area of the Santee River. The case amassed interest from around the globe. Brittany's mother, Dawn Drexel, traveled to the area and spent days putting up posters where her daughter had last been seen and asking strangers on the street if they had any information about the 17-year-old. It's been horrible because I don't know where she is. I don't know if she's alive. She left um, all her clothing, um, her hair stuff, everything. It's just not like Brittany. Something's wrong. However, with leads quickly drying up, the friends that she had traveled with faced the brunt of baseless accusations, and Brittany's own mental state was called into question after her adopted father revealed that she had a history of depression. Is there a possible possibility her, here that uh, she just ran away? No, I don't believe she just ran away. And she was going through a lot because my, my um, soon-to-be ex-husband, I mean, we're going through a divorce. So this has been very hard on her. Unable to obtain evidence about where Brittany could have disappeared, the case eventually went cold. But investigators continued to keep their eyes open for clues about what may have happened in this case. And six years after Brittany disappeared on June 8, 2016, an informant who is currently serving a 25-year sentence for manslaughter approached the FBI with information that he said would help with the Brittany Drexel case. Horrifying new details about a New York teenager who disappeared from Myrtle Beach in 2009. Federal officials now say an inmate told them he witnessed Brittany Drexel's sexual abuse inside a gang stash house. The inmate said the 17-year-old was then shot and killed, her body then fed to alligators. Inmate turned informant Taquan Brown claimed to have witnessed the murder of Brittany Drexel. Two days after Brittany went missing on April the 27th, 2009, Taquan informed the FBI that he had gone to McClellansville, South Carolina, at a stash house about 60 miles south of Myrtle Beach to pay a local heroin dealer named Sean Taylor. 
Timothy Deshaun Taylor, the drug dealer's 16-year-old son, was one of the men who Taquan allegedly saw sexually assaulting a woman in the house who matched Brittany Drexel's description. Taquan said that when Brittany attempted to escape a few days later, the men shot and killed her, wrapping her body up and dumping it into an alligator-infested marsh not far from McClellanville, and also not far from where her phone was turned off. Although the area's alligator ponds were thoroughly inspected, authorities thought Taquan's account was too thorough to be disregarded. Police and the FBI turned their attention to Timothy Deshaun Taylor when the missing persons case was reframed as a murder probe. Timothy had committed an armed robbery at McDonald's in 2011 and had successfully completed an 18-month probationary term. Despite this, federal agents ultimately charged him with the same armed robbery to put him behind bars and to give them a chance to look into his relationship with Brittany. Timothy told the police that he had never even met Taquan before and vehemently denied any involvement in the crime. I may as well start with the obvious question. Did you kill Brittany Drexel? No, sir. I did not kill Brittany Drexel. Were you involved in the kidnapping of Brittany Drexel? No, sir, I was not. Were you with Brittany Drexel the night she was she disappeared in April of 2009? No, sir. I'm not sure who the administrator is who posts the comments, mm -hmm. but the person who apparently has information, they say they have information, says there are witnesses who are not in jail, other than, I assume, this Daquan Brown, who have told them that they saw you with Brittany. What do you think of that? Um, if it was witnesses, then they would have been brought to the attention and they would have highly spoke about it, but I'm pretty sure there's no witness. I know that there's no witness because I've never seen her and I've never been with her. In March of 2018, Timothy consented to take a lie detector test to demonstrate this, but he failed. Months later, detectives concluded that Taquan's account had been nothing more than a false confession and dropped that line of inquiry. Instead, they focused on a suspect who they had not yet been able to rule out, Raymond Moody, a convicted child sex offender who had been released from prison in 2004 after serving a 21-year sentence. Since then, he had been suspected in a string of offenses after moving to Georgetown, including the 2005 disappearance of a 28-year-old mother, Crystal Souls, but he had never been formally charged. Detectives discovered that in April of 2009, Moody had been in the Myrtle Beach area with his girlfriend, Angel Vaus. What's more, this wasn't the first time that police had heard his name in connection with this case. In 2011, Angel sat down with investigators and revealed that she was suspicious of her boyfriend having been involved with Brittany's disappearance. Angel explained to investigators how she believed her boyfriend, Raymond Moody, could be a threat based on his previous convictions as a child sex offender. I don't know, you know, like I said, a few years have gone by, you know, things, people, I know, people like that don't always change, I know that. You know, and I know there's always that tendency that they can do it again. I know that. But in spite of his previous offenses, Angel stayed with Moody as his girlfriend, and investigators spent the following years chasing down new leads and building a case against Raymond Moody, who was now a 76-year-old man. In 2021, an FBI task force was put together to investigate the case. Angel, now a nurse at the MUSC Medical Center, agreed to meet with the senior investigator, Hank Carrison, at the Georgetown County Sheriff's Office with two other FBI special agents and an intelligence analyst. During the interview, Angel is asked about the events of April 25, 2009, with investigators pushing her to reveal where she and Raymond had been that night. During the hours-long interview, Angel becomes distressed and walks out, upset at the accusations being thrown around. After being talked down by Carrison outside of the sheriff's office, Angel returns and begins to show her hand. No, but I would never hurt anybody. That's the truth. I, think I don't know I the don't whole truth. I don't know the whole truth. I don't know where it was that night. I believe you, Angel. I really do. I really don't. <laughs> I do. I believe you right now. All we're looking for, we, we need your help. Yeah. Right? To piece this thing together. I know. I was not about to just, what my belief is, is it, 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 it does depend upon the evidence. With the agent's reassurance, Angel goes on to say how she remembers Raymond returning on April 26, 2009 with scratches on his face. 
She wasn't sure where he had gotten them from and had questioned him at the time if maybe she had caused them during some drunken fight. I know for sure that he had my vehicle. He had asked me for it to trade vehicles, and I didn't ask why, you know, big deal, you know. And then I do remember him calling me early in the day. And I was off, but I, I just didn't feel like, you know, meeting up at that time. So I told him, yeah, I will meet you. So that evening, I did meet him. Down by the, yes. the hotel by the land, yes. right? Yes. And you traded vehicles. Yes. You took, you took I one. took my vehicle, and he got the SUV? red. Yes, and he got the red truck. Angel told the investigators about how, on April the 25th, she had gotten off work early and met up with Moody to swap cars before going their separate ways. Detectives revealed that they had evidence to suggest that Angel's phone and credit card were placed at the Ocean Boulevard, North Myrtle Beach area around the time that Brittany disappeared. Angel continued to deny being with Moody, but suggested that it was possible that her phone and card could have been in her truck, which Moody was driving. Angel also told investigators how, around 1 a.m., Raymond had left their home before returning about a half an hour later. Towards the end of the interview, Angel becomes more amenable, suggesting to the investigators that she could press Moody for information. She even went so far as to suggest bugging the house. You know, I don't know. What do you think you, you'd say? I'm, I yeah, was, yeah. in the beginning, I was very nervous about it. I really was, you know, because I, I didn't know. I didn't know. And he won't say anything, you know. So, I, and I didn't know. I still don't know. So, does it make me nervous when people bring it up? Yes, it makes me nervous, you know. Of course it does. Because mm -hmm. I'm living with somebody who could have. Right. You know. If you asked him if he was involved, would that be different? No, he said no. I mean, I can ask, I can try to ask him, I mean, again, you know, but first thing is going to be, he knows I'm here, right. but he thinks I'm meeting for some other reason. Yes. First question is going to be, did they ask you about me? That's going to be his first question. Okay. I mean, he's real, I mean, he's suspicious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Believe me. Still? Always. You had mentioned um, a bug. What is, is that something you think would work? Is that something that you think you could do? <laughs> I mean, I can do it. So, how would he respond to the, any discussion of that? If he saw he, it no, he no, don't, we don't. He don't talk about it. Period. I mean, he don't talk about it. After the interview was over, Angel returned home, and the FBI surveillance noticed suspicious activity in their home over the next few hours. Raymond was seen going in and out of the house, going through the car as if he was looking for something. Angel had suggested throughout the interview that she still had the phone that she was using at the time Brittany disappeared. With Moody's unpredictable behavior, a warrant was used to search the residence the next day, and several electronic devices were seized, including three phones, two tablets, a disposable camera, and multiple assorted storage devices. Days later, on Wednesday, May the 4th, 2022, Raymond Moody met with the investigators. His story differed completely from the account that Angel had given them just days earlier. After 13 years, knowing evidence against him was piling up, he was ready to give a full confession. The only person who ever told this story to is Mama Weir. Angel never even knew the real story. She never knew. Anyway, when I was going down the Ocean Boulevard, we were going along pretty slow driving. I was driving. And, uh, pretty walking speed and I saw uh, the Jacks girl working walking along on the sidewalk and I was smoking pot <laughs> she noticed that walked over to the door and said something about that smells like good weed she said yeah you want some sure get in she hopped right in the back without a problem and uh, we smoked the weed went down the boulevard and we we're just in small talk Angel's not really saying anything. More smoking the pot. And I said, hey, you want to party a little bit with us? We can get some cocaine, you know? She said, sure. So we started driving. We were just driving around, smoking, talking. And uh, I started, went right into Georgetown. Went right to a spot where we used to camp out down by the river. And we went down there. And... Um, and I was by myself with her because uh, Angel left for a while. She was going to see her son. This thing's got out of hand. And I 
panicked and she panicked and I strangled her. Knowing Angel would be back any minute, Moody told investigators how he had hidden her body in a boat landing. When Angel returned, she questioned Moody about where the 17-year-old had gone. Moody told her that she had been picked up by friends. Later that night, unable to sleep, Moody returned back to their campsite and buried her a short distance from where she was murdered. Was her, like her purse and her phone and stuff like that, do, do you know where that's at? Are you able to tell us? Oh, I got rid of that a long time ago. Did you throw it on the woods or did you, do you, do you recall what you did with her stuff? Um, actually, I dropped in a donation box at Salvation Army Georgetown. All of her stuff, the phone included, and her purse Not and her phone. What did you do with the, where did the phone go? I threw the phone in the river. After his confession, Moody led investigators to the site where he claimed that he buried Brittany all those years before. Moody took investigators through the scene, pointing out the spots that he had sexually assaulted the woman and murdered her. A search warrant for the property was issued and investigators spent the next two days excavating the site. After his May 4th confession, the next day, he sat down with investigators alongside his lawyer to give a full statement rehashing everything he had said the day before. Here, the detectives continue to push Moody. When you buried her, was she one piece? Was she Pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, she was a full intact. Okay. okay. Uh, you said you didn't cause any extra injuries or no. any broken bones? Or no. Okay. Do you know how you did it? How you strangled her? Well, there's a couple different ways, obviously, you can strangle somebody yeah. just like that. Yeah. There's just, there's nothing, there's no nothing else that you, that, that you might have kept, like the blanket might not have been kept. There's nothing else from that day. And she was in, when you transfer, she was in the back of your truck? Yep. Like in the bed? Yep. Yeah. Wrapped in the blanket? Yep. Yeah. she bleeding at all? Five days later, Angel appeared at the Georgetown County Sheriff's Office with her lawyer, where she gave a proffer statement, which could not be used against her in a court of law. Here, Angel changed her version of events that night to match what Moody had told investigators. We're, we're just here for the truth. Okay. Um, and so as long as that's... Everything that's told today, we're, we're good to go. Okay. So just go ahead and I'll give you the opportunity. You just tell us what you, what you remember okay. about that time. All right. Uh, me and him have went to the beach. We're in my vehicle, of course. Uh, we had smoked weed on the way up there while we were there and you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Then afterwards, we rode down the boulevard. Uh, he hollers him out the window. What exactly said, I don't remember. Uh, she hollered something back, but couldn't hear. There's a lot of traffic. So he pulled up a little bit. He pulled over to the, a little parking lot on the side of the road. She walked over to the car. He spoke to her out the window, said something about, hey, you want to let's smoke some weed, do a line or two, you know, and she said yes. She got into the vehicle, came back towards Georgetown, uh, really just smoking along the way, you know, stuff like that. Uh, went down to the pole yard, walked around a little bit smoking. A little bit later, called my son, or he called me, I can't remember who called who, but he had the keys to the apartment. So I said, I'll be back in a little while. Angel, though changing her story under the safety of the proffer agreement, closely matched what Moody had told to investigators. Like after you got to the apartment, what you did? I went to bed, because mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been drinking, okay? So yeah, I went to bed, right. uh, and I said, I believe that he was up for a little bit, but I went to sleep. I did wake up later, and he was gone, but like I said before, that, that really is kind of normal. He was always an early person. He'd get up 4.30, what, 4 in the morning, and he'd be up. That was just his routine, which he still did to this day, you know. With both accounts detailing how Moody had returned to the scene to bury Brittany, a second search of the site was conducted, and soon they found what they were looking for. Four feet beneath the dirt lay a nose ring, contact lenses, long hair, and a set of human remains. The remains were sent for forensic dental and DNA identification, and two days later, the Drexel family received the devastating news. It was Brittany. Authorities in South Carolina have recovered the long missing remains of Brittany Drexel, the 17 year old New York girl who vanished while on a spring break trip to Myrtle Beach in 2009. Georgetown County Sheriff Carter Weaver announced on Monday during a press conference that Drexel's body was found on May 11th and that police have charged 62 year old Raymond Moody with murder. A press conference was held by police where they confirmed the remains that had been found 
had been identified as the missing teen. Brittany's mother, Dawn, and Chad, and Father John were promised that every resource would be used to find the answer of what happened to Brittany, where did it happen, how did it happen, and why did it happen. The why may never be known or understood, but today, this task force can confidently answer the rest of those questions along with the who is responsible. The who is Raymond Douglas Moody. His date of birth is May the 9th of 1960, and he is a white male with an extensive sex offender criminal history. The Georgetown County Sheriff's Office charges against Mr. Raymond Moody are murder, kidnapping, criminal sexual conduct in the first degree, all of these charges occurring within the jurisdictional limits of Georgetown County, all of which occurred on April the 25th of 2009, and all of which detail Brittany Drexel as the victim. On October 19th, 2022, Raymond Moody, who had waived his rights to a trial, pled guilty to all the charges and was sentenced to life in prison with an additional two consecutive terms of 30 years. I don't have the words to express how horrible I feel. And I've felt ever since that day, very, very sorry. Before reading Moody's sentence, Judge Farrell Cothran Jr. said, We're all products of the decisions we make in life. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people give up their long-term happiness for immediate pleasure. And you gave up a lot of people's long-term happiness for your immediate pleasure. In court, addressing Brittany's family, Raymond Moody said, I was a monster. Angel, who stood by Moody during the proceedings, has not yet faced charges of her own and to this day continues to work as a nurse. Today, Raymond Moody is being held in the Kirkland Correctional Institution in Richland County, South Carolina. He will never be released. It's every parent's nightmare. An adolescent seeking adventure and validation ventures out into the night to meet up with an online friend who turns out to be a murderous predator. On January 27, 2016, 13-year-old Nicole Lovell did just that and fell victim to something that was very much out of her control. Nicole, honey, if you see this, if you're out there, you can come to me. I'm not mad at you. I'm worried about you. Your family's worried about you. Just come home. Today's case examines the disappearance and murder that claimed the life of a young and vulnerable resident of Blacksburg, Virginia a college town that is sadly no stranger to terrible acts occurring out of the blue and shaking the community to its core. What first appeared to be a child running away in the middle of the night soon turned into a desperate search and race against the clock to return her home and to the life-saving medication that she needed. Nearly a thousand volunteers fanned out across the town and nearby campus of Virginia Tech and the mountainous Montgomery County. Nicole Madison Lovell's young life, however, had ended not long after she snuck out of her home on that Wednesday night around 1 a.m. Her body would be found callously disposed across the state line in a rural part of North Carolina's Surrey County. Who could have killed this young girl and why? What led her to leave the apartment through the bedroom window that night? Who did she encounter? Did she plan on meeting them? And what happened to bring her to this terrible end? This is the tragic story of Nicole Lovell. Before we begin, we would like to send our deepest sympathies to the loved ones of Nicole Lovell, who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. January in the mountains of Western Virginia can be cold with long nights. Icy winds are commonplace. Fallen snow tends to linger sometimes for a week or two in the deep shady spots that are everywhere. It was just such a night when Tammy Weeks saw her 13-year-old daughter off to bed. 
The next morning was going to be a teacher's work day for the Montgomery County school system and Nicole wouldn't have to get up early to head away to middle school, a rare bonus day off for students. There was no way for her mother to know that after that bedroom door was shut, the girl would slide her dresser over in front of the door, send a text to a waiting compatriot, and then make preparations to make her escape. Nicole had made plans for something very different than a kid's normal no-school plan of sleeping late and watching TV. At around 1 a.m., Nicole slid open the window to her room. She grabbed a dark blue blanket with a Minions character emblazoned on it and headed out for the night, backpack and cell phone in hand. Nearby, a car waited for her as she crunched through the patchy snow on the ground. The roads were plowed and clear. She and her internet boyfriend were making their escape. Adventure awaited. And then things went horribly wrong for her. At first, Nicole's mother discovered the girl was gone and how she had left the home at the Lantern Ridge Apartments on Fairfax Road. The window had been left open all night. Tammy Weeks immediately reported her daughter missing to local law enforcement agencies. Nicole, honey, if you see this, if you're out there, you can come to me. I'm not mad at you. I'm worried about you. Your family's worried about you. Just come home. At the age of 10 months old, Nicole had received a liver transplant, something that would affect her for every day of her life. She required anti-rejection medicines twice a day to remain healthy. If she missed more than a dose or two, the problems that she could face could turn deadly. I've been without her medications for three days, and I know that we're in a, a situation where if she doesn't get her medication and get it fast, that you know, my daughter's gonna die. As local television and radio stations broadcasted their alerts about the missing girl, police, fire, and rescue personnel throughout the area moved quickly through the community to begin their search. Numerous community members familiar with the area's many forests and mountainous terrain joined in the efforts. Students from nearby Virginia Tech swung into action as well, and drones were used to search the area from the sky. The Virginia Tech Corps of Cadets had also joined in the search as well. Blacksburg and Virginia Tech had developed an incredibly tight-knit and supportive community in the recent years. On April 16, 2007, Siung Hui Cho went on a killing spree on that campus that killed 32 people and wounded an additional 17. Devastated by what was then the largest mass shooting in American history, Blacksburg and the college community leaned on each other and somehow made it through that devastating loss. Now, on this day, they worked together desperately to find this young girl. It would be on the third day that her body, naked, left down an embankment in a wooded area was found. The body was located just across the state line in neighboring Surrey County, North Carolina. Just off of North Carolina Route 89, it may have seemed like an out-of-the-way location for people unfamiliar to the area, but in fact, it was not very far from a moderately traveled road. As the region was searched, investigators were given an important key to the mystery by Nicole's own hand. On a wall in her bedroom, the young woman had scribbled usernames and passwords for her online social media apps, including ones like Omegle and Kick. Popular among teens, the site offers a chance to chat with and sometimes see other people in an anonymous way. That anonymity and with no actual oversight have led to those sites gaining a reputation as a hunting ground for predators and groomers. Nicole's mother, Tammy, told investigators that she had found Kick on her daughter's phone prior to her disappearance and made her delete it. It had now become obvious that Nicole had gone back to those apps and had been using them extensively. Those usernames and passwords turned out to be the key that began unlocking this terrible case. Experts were able to go into her accounts and backtrack through her texts, photos, and other communications to build a profile of her activities. Outside of traffic to her school friends and family, there was a secret relationship with an older man, a college student at nearby Virginia Tech. Online, Nicole's persona was one filled with the angst felt by many middle schoolers just entering their teen years. She didn't feel understood or loved. She craved attention. She wanted someone to see her as an adult. She wanted someone to accept her for her appearance, always having felt that the scars left from her early life surgeries were unattractive. 
She found someone willing to look past that or found a person looking for someone with very specific vulnerabilities. She found a predator. Online, he called himself Dr. Tombstone. An FBI cyber squad was able to obtain the data trail from Nicole's communications on the Kick app, working with the company that owned and operated the service. It quickly became apparent that the only person the young girl had communicated with in the days leading up to her disappearance had been this Dr. Tombstone. Cyber detectives were able to find out that the username was registered to a David A and that it was linked to a Gmail account. That account led directly to a young man named David Eisenhower. David Eisenhower, 18 at the time, was a freshman at Virginia Tech. Drawn to the college by its stellar engineering program, David also ran track and had been a star athlete back home at the Wild Lake High School just outside of Baltimore, Maryland. He had even been featured as an athlete of the week in one of the local television stations' news broadcasts during his senior year. Three times he had won distance races at the Maryland State Championships during his high school times. I will personally not stop until I reach my peak performance. Outwardly, he didn't look any different from any other freshman coming to the large university that year. He made some friends at school, in classes, and on the track team. Most were just acquaintances, though. David had struggled to make a place for himself. He had a penchant for telling offbeat stories in a way to portray himself as someone more experienced and worldly than he really was. Stories that often included unlikely occurrences or just out-and-out -out lame attempts to build himself up. Stories of his drinking exploits, classmates would say, didn't make sense and often ended up with him saying that he was passed out and didn't remember what happened next. He quickly developed a credibility problem, one that was often attributed to him just trying too hard to impress others. He did make one very close friend on campus, though. Natalie Keepers was also a student at Virginia Tech and majoring in engineering. She had also come from Eastern Maryland to the mountains of Western Virginia. Bookish and serious, the 20-year-old young woman had dated Eisenhower for a short period of time after arriving on campus, but their relationship quickly turned into a friendship, although a very deep one. Or, at least, that's how their stories went. We at Beyond Evil are proud to announce that we have partnered with established titles. Have you ever wondered what it was like to be a lord or a lady? This is the opportunity to give the amazing gift of land and title as enjoyed by lords and ladies in centuries gone by. Land ownership is a strong tradition within Scotland, each landowner being referred to as the laird or lady. Established titles offers you a chance to purchase your very own lord or ladyship along with your own designated piece of land on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland, at least one square foot in size. They have pledged that the land and surrounding woodlands will never be used for anything other than conservation, protection, and the enjoyment of the natural biodiversity living within it. They will plant a tree for every purchase made. Looking after our planet is at the forefront and the primary mission of the project. Having already partnered with global reforestation charities, One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future, the title that you purchase is fully authentic and you can officially change your title to Lord or Lady that can be used in your correspondence, credit cards, and any other purchase that you make. There has never been a better time to purchase this wonderful gift. Established Titles is running a fantastic sale right now. If you use the code Beyond Evil, you will get an additional 10% off your purchase. The first 200 people who purchase their title pack using the Beyond Evil link will have plots within just a few moments of each other. So don't waste time. Take advantage of this special price for this special gift while you can. Giving someone you love a piece of land, title and tradition, and conservation. Simply go to establishedtitles.com slash beyondevil to purchase your gifts now. Sometime during the autumn, David had made a new friend in Blacksburg, but this time it was an online one. Starting out on Omegle, he began chatting with Nicole Lovell. He would maintain that at the time, he thought she was 16 or 17 years old. She, however, was only 13 years old and apparently didn't do anything to change his mind as the two talked and exchanged messages. In December 2015, the two met up and it was impossible for Nicole to conceal her age anymore. 
Maybe Eisenhower was surprised. Maybe he had already puzzled it out and decided that he didn't care. Following urges that would lead them on a terrible collision course, there was no admission of any sexual contact at their first meeting, but something in their relationship changed. Eisenhower's actions immediately thereafter began to point to the idea that he felt he had crossed some kind of personal line, one that he could not take back. He felt dread for what his actions could bring down on him. Later at the trial, Montgomery County Commonwealth Attorney Mary Pettit told the court that he, Eisenhower, had a problem, and his problem is Nicole Lovell. He decided that this relationship with this underage girl was a serious problem. Eisenhower turned to his only close friend at the school, and Natalie Keepers responded with a willingness to help him take care of the problem no matter how far they might have to go. David had a serious problem to find a way out of, but Natalie now had something she could sink her teeth into. Perhaps she still loved David, and this was a bonding event for the two in her mind. Maybe this presented some opportunities to indulge in very dark and secret sides of their personalities. Was it just a desperate man and a friend working together to solve a problem, or was it a case of a borderline psychopath and a closeted sociopath finding each other in the midst of an opportunity to indulge their darker sides? Prosecutors and defense attorneys would eventually wrestle over that very important distinction. Questions of her willingness, her enthusiasm for solving this problem, and her actions on the day of the killing would haunt the proceedings and actually form part of Eisenhower's defense during the trial. Three days after the disappearance, with the searches going on throughout the region, a candlelight vigil was organized for Nicole Lovell and her family. Hundreds from the community descended upon the Lantern Ridge Apartments, where they prayed for her safe return, sang hymns, and provided support for her family and each other. A couple of counties away to the south, just across the North Carolina state line, law enforcement officers made the grisly discovery that everyone had feared. The naked body of a young girl was found down off of a roadway in a wooded area of Surrey County. Officers from Blacksburg were called to the scene to help make the initial identification, one that was later verified by her next of kin. Nicole had been found, and the very worst case scenario had happened. As the body was recovered and the scene secured and probed by forensic officers from both states and the Federal Bureau of Investigation, back in Blacksburg, the net was closing on their newly discovered suspects. Armed with Nicole's online data evidence, Blacksburg police and officers from the Virginia Tech Police, along with an FBI agent, brought David Eisenhower in for questioning. Nicole Weeks was brought in as well. Both were initially cooperative with police, and official arrests were slow played as they gathered more information. This investigation is far from over as we continue to conduct multiple interviews and processing additional evidence related to this crime. The focus of this investigation is to now reconstruct the timeline leading up to Nicole's tragic death. A very preliminary determination of the cause of death is stabbing. Online data had led officials to bring the pair in for questioning. The discovery of Nicole's obviously murdered and disposed of body led to the arrest, and then the physical evidence began pouring in. The two began to talk and individually laid out details of what had gone down. Their cell phones provided both a timeline and a roadmap for the events leading up to that night and the following day. Keepers told investigators that David had confided of the relationship to her and the difficulties he had been having. She said he claimed to have met her at a party and feared that he had slept with her but couldn't remember everything because he had passed out and woken up in a ditch the next morning. In light of what he said, the listener would remember David's purported penchant for spinning outlandish tales of his drinking that always ended up with him passing out or blacking out. Those tales never rang true to those who heard them. Did the event really happen that way, or was it just him falling back on a stock story that he didn't realize was never really believable? No one can say, but he and Keepers moved forward with the stated worry that he could have gotten the young girl pregnant. Keepers said Eisenhower told her that he had tried to cool down the relationship with Nicole and wanted to stop communicating with her because he feared being arrested for their relationship if it was found out. He would later tell Keepers that Nicole 
said that she would kill herself if he broke off the relationship. Somehow, under the specter of a possible pregnancy and being found out, Eisenhower and Keepers came to the conclusion that a permanent solution was needed. In their eyes, Nicole's death was the only answer. The two began concocting their plan, sometimes by text. Both, in court, would base their defenses on the enthusiasm that the other showed for the crime while playing up their own reluctance. The day before the abduction, cell phone GPS showed both Eisenhower and Keepers out and about making their plans and gathering their necessary materials. The day before Nicole's disappearance, the two went to a local Walmart and purchased a large garden shovel. Security cameras captured the two walking out after their purchase, carrying the shovel, which would match the appearance of one found later with Nicole's blood on it. The night of Nicole's disappearance, GPS locating services showed the two at a cookout fast food restaurant in Blacksburg. The two shared a meal, made the final preparations, and put their plan into action. Keepers claims that she was not present during the next step, but did not dispute that she was involved in the planning and what followed. Eisenhower coordinates with Nicole, and she awaits his arrival. Her dresser is pushed to block the bedroom door. He pulls up outside, Nicole grabs her coat, backpack, and cell phone, and the dark blue minions blanket. She slides the window open, climbs out, and gets into his car, and the pair drive away. GPS tracking shows the car arriving at a location on Craig Creek Road near the Virginia Tech campus. Craig Creek Road is a single-lane road through a wooded area. Rural, houses, and trailers along the road are often widely spaced, and sometimes there's no line of sight from one neighbor's house to the next. On this cold Wednesday night, snow on the ground and a fading moon shone overhead through partly cloudy skies, Temperatures were falling quickly as the two motored down what turned out to be a dark and lonely road with no street lights. Then, Eisenhower stopped the car. It was 1.02 a.m. The two got out. There is no way to know what Nicole was thinking at that moment, but Eisenhower's next steps were laid out by the autopsy report given to the court. Nicole was struck by a shovel in the neck, breaking one of her vertebrae. Still alive, she fell to the ground, and Eisenhower began stabbing her. In the end, she was stabbed 14 times, seven times in the head and face, and seven times in the chest. The fatal wound was from the hit that slashed her throat. Nicole Madison Lovell, a child who had survived a liver transplant, who was loved by her extended family and numerous friends, died on a lonely road on a cold January night, the victim of cold-blooded murder. Eisenhower then took her lifeless body and dumped it into the trunk of his car. Her other items, including her minion's security blanket, were tossed in as well, along with a shovel and the knife. He got back into his car and headed home. He'd go in and spend the night in a warm home, possibly haunted by his actions, while Nicole's body stayed out in temperatures that would drop into the mid-twenties before first light. No one along that road would report anything out of the ordinary that night. The murder passes unnoticed into the wee hours of the morning. People sleep in preparation for the coming workday, completely unaware of the evil that had passed them by. Eisenhower would text keepers and put into motion their next terrible step of their plan. The next day, the pair would climb into his car and head off to a secluded spot just across the North Carolina line. Texts on Eisenhower's phone show that he had asked an unnamed man in Pulaski, Virginia, if he knew of a place to dispose of a body. Police determined that that man did not know Eisenhower was serious and thought he was joking. Driving down North Carolina Route 89, the pair found a likely spot, one somewhat near a property owned by a member of Eisenhower's extended family. Nicole's body was stripped and cleaned to remove any evidence and then dumped down a wooded embankment. Text between the two showed that they thought the cold weather would keep the smell down and that in such an area, nature would completely dispose of the body within a couple of weeks. Online searches by Eisenhower prior to the murder showed that he had sought out answers to questions such as, how long does it take to burn a body? What is used as ID on a body? His inability to find the right answer well, certainly contributed to his downfall. Nicole's body was found and found intact up until that moment, the evidence that had been piling up had been mostly electronic. 
In the police station, Eisenhower quit talking before long, but keepers just kept on. Now, beyond the electronics and the words, physical evidence of a murder was on hand and evidence who had done the murder was being collected by forensic experts. At the scene of the body, evidence was collected and rolls of skin were found under Nicole's nails. Completely missed in the efforts to wipe down the body, the bits of skin would provide the DNA evidence that she had scratched Eisenhower before she had been slain. Other law enforcement officers and forensic teams began searching the dumpsters and bins at Virginia Tech. A dive team searched the pond on campus. Then a bottle of Clorox and numerous wipes coated with brown stains were found in a dumpster. Blood traces were later found in the trunk of Eisenhower's car. Potentially the most damning evidence was a bag found among Keeper's possessions. Bloody clothing and the very distinctive dark blue Minion's blanket had been retained and hidden away. Perhaps it was evidence to be disposed of later. Perhaps it was some kind of grisly trophy. Blood was also found on the toe of Keeper's boots, another thing seemingly missed in the pair's post-murder cleanup efforts. Eisenhower and Keepers were formally arrested and charged with their part in the abduction and murder of Nicole Lovell, as well as for the disposal of the body. Both pled not guilty to the charges offered against them, but their individual defenses rested not so much on not being involved, but in fact who was the mastermind behind it. Eisenhower's defense insinuated that Keepers was the mastermind behind the killing and had manipulated him into doing the deed. They attempted to nullify her testimony on the grounds that much of it had been given to police before she was made aware of her Miranda rights. At times, she was painted in the light of a sociopath playing out a role, excited by the thrill of killing and the planning that went into it. On Keeper's side, attorneys argued that she had no hand in the actual killing of Nicole Lovell. Evidence could not place her at that point of the murder, although it was nearly impossible to argue that she didn't have input before the event and an active hand in the disposal of the body and the concealment of evidence. I am sorry for the pain that my actions have caused Nicole Lovell and her family. Nothing can ever undo what has been done, and for that, I am deeply, sincerely, and forever sorry. In the end, David Eisenhower was found guilty on all charges, and received sentences of 10 years for the abduction, 60 years for the first-degree murder, and 5 years for concealing Nicole's body. 15 years of the sentence would be suspended, and 20 years of probation would be tacked on to the sentence. He was also ordered to pay $5,130 in restitution. Natalie Keepers would also be found guilty as an accessory to the murder in the first degree, she was sentenced to 40 years in prison for the accessory charge and an additional five years for concealing the body. Five years of the sentence was suspended and she was given twice the recommended 20-year minimum sentence for the accessory to murder charge. The pair will definitely spend the majority of their lives behind bars, but it will never bring Nicole Lovell back. She chased growing up and acceptance as so many adolescents do but thanks to this pair, she'd never get the opportunity to find her own way in the world, to find pride and happiness in herself. Her family was left shattered and wounded in a way that can never completely heal. The vile act on that cold January night just leaves a cold, empty spot in the mountain town of Blacksburg, Virginia. And the story leaves a cold chill in the heart of any parent who has struggled along with their child going through those tough years of adolescence. Please, please. Where are you at? Can you tell if you're on I-75? I don't know where your phone is. I'm sorry. Are you blindfolded if you don't press the button? The frantic female voice you just heard was that of Denise Amber Lee. Denise had secretly called 911 while blindfolded and restrained in the back seat of a car. She desperately tried to tell the 911 operator as much information as possible before her captor caught her on the phone and the call went silent. It was the only chance Denise had to reach out for help, yet hers would not be the only call to 911 regarding her kidnapping that day. 
In the end, it would be one of many attempts that would fail to save her life. Before we begin, we would like to send our sincere condolences to the loved ones of Denise Lee, who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. Meet Denise Amber Lee, a 21-year-old woman who was happily married to the man of her dreams and was raising two children whom she adored. Denise met her husband, Nathan Lee, in high school. Their love for each other grew rapidly, and soon after graduation, they married. Not long after tying the knot, the newlyweds were blessed with a son, Noah. Two years later, they had another baby boy, Adam. Having started a family so soon out of high school, Nathan and Denise were not exactly financially stable. Denise was a stay-at-home mother, and Nathan had to work three jobs just to make ends meet. Still, their financial burdens did not interfere with their family's happiness. We were going through what most people would say some tough times. You know, we had two little kids, and we were young. Money wasn't necessarily on our side. It didn't phase us. We, were, we knew we were going to be fine, and we knew we were, you know, going to grow old together. For the money-tight couple, housing options were limited. However, they found a newly built rental home at an affordable price in Northport, Florida. The location of the house allowed the couple to be close to both of their parents. It was situated in a rural area that was quiet, though Denise's parents likened it more to a ghost town. It was a newly constructed subdivision that had many houses that were still left vacant after the housing market crash of 2008. Denise's father, Rick Goff, and her mother expressed concerns about their daughter and her family living in such an isolated setting. Despite that, he understood that the home was a great deal for the couple who had limited resources. For Nathan and Denise, home and neighborhood appeared as a financial blessing that would allow them to raise their children in their own home in a quiet and peaceful community. At least, that's what they thought. It was an unusually warm and muggy day in Northport, Florida on January 17, 2008. At 11.09 a.m., Nathan called Denise to chat during his lunch break. The two talked for about five minutes. During their conversation, Nathan asked Denise to turn off the central cooling system and open up the windows of the house to help save money. Denise let him know that she already had. Nathan got off work at 3 p.m. and he called Denise to let her know that he was on his way home, but she didn't respond. Nathan tried calling her eight more times during his 25-minute drive home. It was odd not to have a response from Denise, but he didn't become concerned until he reached their house. While pulling into the driveway, Nathan noticed all of the windows in the house were closed, though Denise had told him that she had opened them. Upon entering the home, he found no sign of Denise anywhere. A check of the children's room revealed that both were sleeping in the same crib together, something that Denise had never done before. He found Denise's phone, keys, and purse still in the house. Despite the heat, the windows of the house were all closed but not secured. Another odd observation. After thoroughly searching for Denise in the home, he found no trace of her. Nathan became highly concerned. Nathan immediately called 911. The call was made at 3.29 p.m. Northport Emergency. Uh, yes, um, I'm at 7912 uh, Latour Avenue. Uh, mm -hmm. I just got home from work and my wife, I can't find her. My kids were in the house and I don't know where she is. I've looked every single place. Everything looked normal. It's just the only thing that wasn't normal was the fact that obviously Denise wasn't there. After getting off the phone with the 911 operator, Nathan called his father-in-law, Rick. Rick was a police sergeant with 25 years' experience at the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office. Rick was expecting a call from Denise and Nathan because he had invited them to come over for dinner that evening. He had called and left a message on Denise's phone. Rick, however, was not expecting the news he received. Nathan informed Rick that he had called 911. Having 25 years of experience in law enforcement, Rick understood the often lack of attention given to reports of spouses suddenly going missing. He made it his mission to convince the Northport Police Department running the investigation that his daughter was the missing person and that it needed to be given immediate attention. 
Rick also reached out to his chief and co-workers at the Charlotte County Sheriff's Department, pleading with them to do all they could to help him find his daughter. They were more than happy to lend a hand. First, police headed over to the Lee residence. They began visiting their neighbors' homes to see if anyone knew anything about Denise's disappearance. The police came across one neighbor, Jennifer Eckert, who said that she had seen a suspicious person driving around the neighborhood who later pulled into the Lee's driveway. Jennifer provided police with a description of the vehicle, a green Chevrolet Camaro. With that information in hand, the police department sent out a BOLO, a be on the lookout alert for Charlotte County. The BOLO went out at 6.35 p.m., about three hours after Nathan reported Denise missing. The BOLO stated that the green Chevrolet Camaro had been seen around Toledo Blade Boulevard and US 41 near the Charlotte County Northport line. At 6.14 p.m., a 911 operator received a phone call from a woman screaming and crying loudly into the phone. The caller identified herself as Denise. Rick and Nathan were informed of the disturbing 911 call and they asked to listen to the recording to verify whether or not the caller was in fact their Denise. Both were at Nathan's home at that time. After hearing the recording, the family recognized their greatest fears had come true. Denise had been kidnapped and was in grave danger. Denise somehow got a hold of her captor's cell phone and dialed 911. She desperately tried to relay information to the operator while pretending to be talking to her kidnapper. While pleading for her life, Denise did her best to answer the operator's questions. She successfully provided the operator with her name, street address, the make and color of the captor's car. She also let the operator know that the kidnapper was a stranger. During the conversation, you could hear the kidnapper cussing at Denise and asking her where his phone is. It took about five minutes, but eventually he realizes that Denise has his phone and has called 911. The call goes silent. After discovering his daughter had been kidnapped, Rick immediately informed anyone and everyone he knew to be on the lookout for his daughter. He had Highway Patrol and even the Marshals Service out looking for Denise. Since Denise had the opportunity to call 911 using her captor's cell phone, Nathan was confident that the police would be able to track down their location using that phone. Unfortunately, the phone belonging to the kidnapper was a cheap prepaid cell phone, also known as a burner phone. This style of phone does not have the GPS tracking device that allows police to trace its location. The police were able to obtain pings from all of the nearby cell towers, which let them know that they were at least close by. Though useful, it was not enough information to track down Denise. Still, using the cell phone number, police were able to identify the owner of the phone, Michael King. Neither Nathan nor Rick recognized that name. Nine minutes after the 911 call, another operator received a call from a girl by the name of Sabrina Moxlow. And the girl came out of the, like, got out of the car, and my, co my dad's cousin went and put her back in the car, and when she got out... Okay, where's your, where's your dad's house? Um, it's in North Florida. Where would he be going with this female? He came over to my dad's house, borrowed a shovel, a gas tank, and something else. Sadly, at the time of Sabrina's call, Denise was only four miles away from the home. Not long after Sabrina's call, a 911 operator received a call from a woman named Jane Kowalski. That was around 6.30 p.m. Just inside the Charlotte County line from Sarasota County, Jane was traveling down US-41 along Florida's west coast. She came to a stoplight and suddenly heard what she thought sounded like a child screaming in terror coming from the car next to her. Jane looked over to see what was going on and for that moment made eye contact with the driver, a white male. What sounded like a child screaming to Jane was actually Denise screaming for her life in hopes that someone would hear her. 
and the driver was Michael King, but Jane had no way of knowing that. As Jane glared at Michael, a hand shot up and started banging on the passenger window. She watched in horror as the driver tried to subdue the person in the passenger seat. Immediately, Jane called 911, believing that she was witnessing a child abduction. 911, where's your emergency? Well, I'm on 41 going south, and uh, I'm going to do a cross street right now. It's at, I'm on Chamberlain. I just crossed Chamberlain. I'm on 41 going south. And I was at a stoplight. And a man pulled up next to me, and there was a child screaming in the car. Not a happy kind of vehicle was he in? It's a blue Camaro. Having been near the Sarasota County line just moments ago, Jane thought her call went through to the Sarasota County Police Station, but it was actually sent to Charlotte County, where Denise's father, Rick, works. Jane did her best to stay with the driver and even attempted to get the license plate on the car while speaking with the operator. However, the operator was distracted and slow to respond during the call. Jane, we have your phone number. If we need you, we'll call you back. You'll be on that cell phone number if we need you, right? Absolutely, and don't hesitate. I'll give you whatever information I can give you. Okay, and we really appreciate you calling in. Yeah, okay. I both got a hope. Man, oh man. Okay. Thanks, um, Jane. All right, thank Just you. Drive careful. Oh, I shall. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. At one point, the male driver had pulled behind Jane, obviously realizing that she was on to him. Jane slowed down to 45 miles an hour in hopes of getting the suspicious driver to pass her so she could get his plate number, but all he did was drive slower. At some point during the call, the male driver pulled into the left lane and abruptly turned. Jane asked the operator should she try to follow the vehicle, but before receiving instructions, she lost her chance to get into the other lane and was blocked by traffic. Michael had gotten away. During the call, the operator could be heard relaying information to other people in the call center, but no one ever responded to Jane's call. Around 6.42 p.m., police went to Michael King's home. They broke into the house and found it empty, so the police began searching the property. During their search, they found a room that could only be described as a torture room. It was obvious that it had been recently used. Police found duct tape that had long strands of hair attached to it. Eight minutes later, yet another 911 call was made regarding Denise's abduction. This time, the caller was Harold Muxlow, Sabrina's father. Wanting to remain anonymous, Harold made the call on a payphone and refused to give his name. The information he provided to the operator was vague except for the description of the car, a green Chevrolet Camaro with a black cover on the front known as a bra. Is he going to hurt the girl? Uh, I don't. Did you, you saw them though? Yeah. And where, where was she? Uh, In the car? Was she okay? It turned out that Michael had visited Harold around 6 p.m., requesting to borrow a flashlight, a gas can, and a shovel. The reason being given was that his lawnmower had gotten stuck in the mud in his front yard. During this time, Denise was able to climb out of Michael's car. She began screaming at Harold to call the cops. Stunned, Harold didn't know what to do or think. Harold asked Michael what was going on, and he said, Nothing. Don't worry about it. After forcing Denise into the back seat of the car, Michael quickly got in the driver's seat and sped away. Harold knew his cousin had a history of bad relationships, so he initially chalked it up to a minor domestic dispute. Still, he was concerned. He decided to call his daughter Sabrina and told her what happened. She reacted by immediately calling 911. The situation Harold had witnessed with Michael was weighing heavy on his mind. He made the decision to go by his cousin's home to verify the lawnmower story. When Harold arrived at the house, there was no one home. Plus, there was, of course, no lawnmower stuck in the front yard. Harold realized he had been lied to, and at that point, he decided to call 911 himself. Though Harold tried to remain anonymous on the 911 call, police soon pieced together that he was both Sabrina's father and Michael's cousin. As soon as police figured out Harold's identity and home address, they went over to the house and questioned him about what had happened with Michael and the woman that he had in his car. It was at this time that Harold told the police all that had transpired. 
The fact that Harold witnessed Michael and Denise together and had the best opportunity out of anyone to save her that day pains Denise's family dearly. At 9.16 p.m., a state trooper pulled over a vehicle matching Michael King's 1995 green Camaro with the black bra. Michael King was behind the wheel. He had finally been found, but he was alone in the car. Michael was pulled over about four miles away from the location where Jane, the driver who had called 911 on the road, had seen him. The trooper made Michael get out of the car. When he did, he saw that Michael was soaking wet from the waist down. On his person was a cell phone, but the battery had been removed. In the car, the trooper found a muddy shovel. At 9.30 p.m., Denise's father, Rick, received a call with the information that Michael King had been found. Rick hoped that meant that his daughter was now safe, but unfortunately, he was wrong. Though Michael King was finally located, he was not about to tell police what he had done. Instead, he claimed that he was a victim and had been abducted along with Denise by a stranger who had offered them a ride. Michael was taken to the police station where he was held for questioning. Hours after his arrest, Michael was allowed a visit from his cousin Harold. During their visit, Michael gave his cousin his version of what happened that day. He told his cousin the same story he had told police. Michael said that he had attempted to call 911 while being held captive. He also claimed that he had no idea where the kidnapper had taken Denise because the kidnapper had let him go first and continued to drive off with Denise still in the car. Michael also tried to take the credit for Denise being able to call 911. During their conversation, Harold tried multiple times to convince Michael to take a lie detector test to prove his innocence, but Michael showed no interest, stating that he's not going to do anything until he gets a lawyer. While being interrogated, Michael mentioned a location he believed Denise had been taken. However, when police searched the area, they found nothing. Unconvinced by the story Michael gave to Harold, the police charged him with kidnapping. Two days had passed and there was still no sign of Denise. Many volunteers and police officers worked together to search and find her. About a half a mile from the location where the state trooper had picked up Michael, a canine unit discovered a freshly dug hole within a marshy field. In that hole, they found the naked remains of Denise Amber Lee. She had been shot in the head. After the discovery of Denise's body, her family expressed their gratitude and pain over their loss. With Denise recovered, police could now focus on putting together a profile on Michael King and try to figure out why he had targeted Denise. Michael King was 36 years old. He had moved from Michigan to Florida in 2002 after experiencing a painful divorce. He was currently an unemployed plumber who stopped going to work about three months earlier. Michael had no criminal history other than a few complaints made by neighbors who believed he had been pulling pranks around the neighborhood. During their investigation, police were able to get a hold of Patty Paul, the owner of a beauty salon in Venice, Florida, where Michael had been a regular customer. Patty described him as a quiet, modest customer, except for one disturbing visit where Michael had brought a girl with him who he said was only 15 years old. At first, Patty said she assumed the girl was a relative of his. That is, until they started kissing at the front desk. More disturbing complaints came out about Michael after that. Other witnesses claimed that Michael had exposed himself to a woman while at work. Another accused him of sexual assault. However, none of the events were ever reported to police. It was also discovered that Michael had spent two hours at a local gun range just a little while before he was seen pulling into Denise's driveway. After a few days, Jane, the woman who had believed she was witnessing a child abduction, called the Northport Police Department after recognizing Michael's picture on the news. Jane told them that that was the person she had called about when she thought she had seen a child abduction, but now realized it was Michael holding Denise down in the car. She wanted to know if they needed her to provide any further information, but no one at the Northport Police Department knew anything about the call that she had made as it had gone to Charlotte County. More so, no one at the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office where the call had been routed knew about her call either because the dispatchers had never sent it out. 
For the next two days, Jane kept calling the Northport Police Department until investigators finally managed to find records of her 911 call. During an internal investigation regarding Jane's 911 call, it was discovered that the operator who took the call realized that the call could be related to Denise's kidnapping. However, the operator never entered the information about the call into their computer system. All she did was shout it out to dispatchers across the aisle. The dispatchers who had heard her never sent out the tip. They claimed the chaos of that night was overwhelming and they forgot. To add insult to injury, multiple deputies were stationed near Michael's location at the time of the 911 call from Jane. In a sworn statement, one deputy said that he parked alongside Toledo Blade Boulevard at 6.35 p.m., which means Michael could have driven right past him, with Denise still screaming for her life in the back seat. This information weighs heavily on the friends and family who lost Denise. The sheriff of Charlotte County, John Davenport, refused to admit that his department was to blame for the missed opportunity to save Denise while she was driving down the Toledo Blade Boulevard. Instead, he said the chaos caused by the emotional stress of looking for one of their own in another case was the reason why Jane's call was neglected. Denise's father, Rick, however, disagrees. On the window so hard and screaming, trying to get help, which is a smart thing to do because by that time she knows she probably wasn't coming back. As far as I'm concerned, we blew it. And I say we because I'm part of that sheriff's office. Sheriff Davenport did make four of the call center workers take remedial training, and he suspended two dispatchers who took Jane's call for a few days. But the punishment meant little to nothing to Denise's husband. Denise's family believes that she did everything in her power to save her life that day, while the Charlotte County Police Station failed miserably. As if there wasn't enough evidence to prove this fact already, upon further investigating the Green Camaro, police found clues that were believed to have been planted by Denise. This evidence was found in the backseat of the Camaro. Police found strands of hair torn out by the roots matching that of Denise. They also found a heart-shaped ring that she had been given by Nathan on their very first Valentine's Day a ring that Denise never took off. More evidence would stack up against Michael, who was continuing to play innocent. A lab report showed a match between his DNA and that found on Denise's body. Not only was Michael now being accused of murder, but he was also being accused of sexual assault. Six days after Denise's abduction, a massive funeral was held in her honor. The entire town came together to pay their respects to Denise and her family. Questions about Denise getting abducted in broad daylight by a complete stranger continue to haunt her family. Though the evidence stacked up against Michael is immense, he pleaded not guilty during his trial. The family's questions remain unanswered. With all that had transpired throughout the desperate search for Denise and the many mistakes that were made, Nathan was not about to chalk up Denise's murder as an unavoidable death. He truly believed that more could have been done and should have been done by the police to save her life. In April of 2008, Nathan filed an intent to sue Charlotte County for their failure to save his wife due to their carelessness. His focus wasn't on the money that he would receive from the lawsuit, but to ensure that Charlotte County was held accountable for its mistakes. Rick, Denise's father, also took the stand to ensure mistakes like this never happen within the Florida 911 system again. Named after Denise, Rick pushed for the passage of a state law that would standardize training for call center workers. It was called the Denise Amber Lee Act. It passed unanimously on April 24, 2008. Unfortunately, this act only provides optional training for 911 operators. It does not mandate training and certification. To this day, Denise's family continues to push for the new law that would make the training and certification mandatory for all 911 workers. The investigation into Denise's murder found that Michael had aggressively sexually assaulted Denise multiple times in his home. He did so again right before shooting her in the head and burying her naked body in the ground. Medical examiners found several defensive wounds on her body and bruising on her wrists from where she was bound. Denise had been shot point-blank in the head, but medical examiners discovered that she did not die immediately. She had suffered before she died. Michael shot Denise above her right eyebrow, which caused her eye to explode. 
Blood had also entered her lungs, which signified that she was still breathing after being shot. After trial, Michael King was found guilty of sexually assaulting and kidnapping Denise on August 28, 2009. It took almost two years for the family of Denise to finally see her murderer condemned for what he had done. The punishment for the assault was 30 years. His sentence for kidnapping was life. His punishment for her murder was death. Though it was believed that Michael's death sentence would be carried out swiftly, he continues to sit in the Union Correctional Institution in Rayford, Florida. As of now, there is no indication whether he will actually be served his death sentence. The Charlotte County Sheriff's Department failed to help save the life of Denise Amber Lee. Now the justice system may fail to provide Denise and her family with the justice they deserve. It was Super Bowl Sunday night, and the big game festivities had finished an hour or so earlier. A busy bar in Key West, Florida, Conk Town Liquor and Lounge was serving a crowd of hangers-on and those who didn't have to be somewhere early the next morning. A group of three young men get up from their drinks and head out the back door leading into the parking lot behind the bar. A middle-aged man, the owner of this strip mall, gets up and follows them. Minutes later, as things moved into the early hours of Monday, there were shots from behind the building. A shot was fired, followed by two more in quick succession. One young man's life would pour out into that parking lot and another man's life would be changed forever. What had happened and why? Let's look together into the shooting of Garrett Hughes on that fateful night. Before we begin, we would like to send our deepest sympathies to the family of Garrett Hughes, who lost their son on that night. This case, we would like to mention, has yet to be decided in a court of law, and until such a time, all defendants are presumed innocent until proven otherwise. It is our desire to offer you the preliminary evidence and the chance to see how just a few seconds can determine whether a life ends or doesn't based on the actions of those involved. Was this murder or was it self-defense? Was this negligence based on alcohol or just a terrible, irrevocable accident? Yes, hello. I just shot okay. someone. In a you just shot yard. someone? Who did you shoot? I don't know. What is your name? Garrett Hughes. Garrett Hughes. Okay. Why did you shoot him? I came to be aggressively in my parking lot at Concound. Okay. We have units in route. You said he approached you aggressively? Yes. Are you the owner of Conk Town? Yes. Please send uh, ambulance. Hey, yes, yeah, there's units in route. Is he awake? Yes. Are you, are you awake? Okay, do me a favor. I need you to put the weapon away. Can you do that for me? Yes, the weapon is set, set aside. Okay, there's a unit pulling up right now, okay? Can you tell me where you hurt him, where are you injured? Where? Uh, in the stomach. Hi, I'm right there. I'm here. Sir, the are you with the officer? Yes. Popular hangout in Key West, a town known for its partying atmosphere, Conktown is located at North Roosevelt Boulevard, separated by the waterfront by a roadway and a picturesque line of palm trees. An international house of pancakes sits to one side and a Wendy's is on the other. It could well be one of those perfect spots to catch a couple of drinks, take in a game, and then get some late-night food with friends afterwards. There's even a drive through window for the attached liquor store. It's the kind of place that caters to locals, but even more so to the island's many visitors. On this particular night, 21-year-old Garrett Hughes, his brother Carson, and a friend, Logan Manuel Pellisier, had been drinking at Conktown and enjoying themselves. Hughes, called Cheeto by some of his friends, was a likable young man who had been a star athlete in football and track at Key West High School. Now in his early 20s, he had started training as a fireman and also spent time volunteering as a coach at his old high school and at nearby Horace O'Brien High School as well. 
An avid fisherman and diver, he was a busy outdoorsman who had grown up in Key West since his parents had moved there when he was just one year old. This was his hometown. He was active in the community and generally known as a good kid in the area. Tonight, though, he was drunk and having a good time. Also in that bar that evening was Lloyd Preston Brewer III, a 57-year-old businessman who had deep roots in the community as well. Brewer had come to Conktown to watch the championship game that night with his niece and her boyfriend. After the game was over, his niece and her boyfriend left, and Brewer stayed around in hopes of maybe picking up a girl from the bar. Over the course of the evening, Brewer admitted to having three beers. Brewer was also the owner of the shopping center strip that held Conktown and a couple of other attached stores. This was literally his part of town, you could say, and he appears to have taken an owner's interest in the goings-on of the area. Just after midnight, Brewer said that he began to notice something. Let's look at his description of the event as taken from the body cam of Key West Police Department Detective Marcus Del Valle, who interrogated Brewer after the arrest later that morning. Um, I noticed there was a lot of activity going to and from the back door, okay. as we have discussed in the past, yes. correct? Yes. So I went out back to just see what was going on. As you know, I am armed. Nature of my business, my property. All right. I went out back, and there was not one. It, this was not a drug dealer, I don't think. Just a guy, and he had buddies with him, and there were there were cars, but he was in between two cars. There were car, and there, there were people on either side, and I guess they were all together. Okay. I don't know. They hadn't come from inside the bar. I don't know where they came from. And he's pissing in the parking lot okay. and on the building. And I said, man, can't you just go in the, in, I'll be honest, can't you just go in the fucking bar and piss in the toilet? And we exchanged words. And as it progressed, he became more agitated and approached me. And I said, look, I own this. Stop. He continued to approach me. I said, I'm armed. It appeared as though he was reaching for something. The first shot went off this way. The second shot went off up in the air. To the best of my recollection, he was already on top of me. It would happen that fast. Okay. At this time, there appears to be no prior knowledge or connection between Brewer and Hughes before this night. Hughes had only come of legal drinking age in November of 2022, just a few months before. Immediately after the shooting, Brewer calls 911 and places his firearm, a 9mm semi-automatic pistol, on the hood of a nearby car. As Hughes' friends check on him, Brewer waits on the police and rescue workers to arrive. The police arrive and secure the location. An ambulance team and EMTs immediately begin to work on Hughes. They transport the mortally wounded young man to the hospital, where he was pronounced dead from the gunshot wound just 25 minutes after the incident took place. Brewer would be held at the scene for a while, then brought to the Key West Police Department for booking. It was nearly sunrise when he would be interrogated about what happened. Brewer appears to have at least a professional passing acquaintance with Detective Del Valle, probably over incidents that had happened in and around his property over the years. At the time, Brewer signs away the rights to a lawyer being present. Detective Del Valle even allows Brewer to borrow his reading glasses to be able to read the documents that were provided. Brewer began to make a case for standing his ground. It was that fast. It was my property, I stood my ground, I feared for my life. Period. Okay. Brewer would then describe the back and forth that was spoken between himself and Hughes before the shooting. We were going back, like, who the fuck are you? just going back and forth on this thing and it just I mean, that fast okay it, it, it was it was not a long drawn out process it really wasn't because if it had been then his buddies that were here would have i mean okay. had they all come in together and it been a fist fight it, things might have ended differently but that dude was agitated already 
I mean, you can test me for drugs or whatever. I don't know. I, I, I swear I hope he's okay. At this time, Brewer has not been told that Hughes had died. He does not know this has moved into a much more serious situation, one where a charge of murder is a distinct possibility. He continues with his description of the event, reinforcing his take on it being defensive. I hit him in the abdomen. I don't think I hit him with the second shot because the second shot went in the air. It was that fast. Detective Del Valle asks if there was any kind of hand-to-hand -hand contact between the two men. Were any punches thrown or any attempts to grab? Was there any contact with you on him? Did you grab him? Did he grab you? Did, was there any uh, hand contact? Not to my recollection. Okay. It, 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 it happens so fast, but when somebody's coming at you that fast... I got you. It doesn't, got you. It doesn't matter. All right. Now... If we're going to get into very minute particulars, that's what I'm going to ask for a lawyer. Okay. Because I'm, I'm telling you the overall scope of what mm -hmm. happened. And the reason I ask for you is you understand the dynamics of that establishment. Yes, I do. And you, so you know I'm armed all the time. Nature of my business and what goes on back there. And really all I was doing was walking through here to see what was going on, to give you okay. a call if something was happening. All right. That's it. Over the next few minutes, Brewer is asked to go over the event again and again as the detective drills down into the little details of the confrontation. He comes back around to the moment when Brewer made the fateful decision to discharge his firearm. At what point did you draw on him? Was it here? When he got... When I fired... He was about this close because I fired on him. It appeared as though he was reaching for something and he's coming at me. And by okay. the time he got that close, I fired and he's on top of me. Okay. Did he fall on you? He can't, yeah. Oh, did he? Like, like he, he, my second shot went in the air. Okay, so were you, he was you, fell, on, you fell on the ground? Do you remember if you fell on the ground and fell back? Yeah, I, I, I he came at me. Yeah, because when I broke, yeah, I, I, I got up, but he wasn't on top of me okay. by the time it all ended. He was on the ground. Okay. Given the chance to state and restate what has happened, Brewer's take on the incident has been laid out. He then begins attempting to manage the situation and how it should be approached. Right. And I'm going to maintain stand your ground all day long. I mean, it's my parking lot. He's coming at me. I, I mean, I, it, what I hope comes out of this, I understand your job. And I understand friends don't cross that line for your job. I think this is a case for a grand jury. Oh, that's... That's what we're here. Do you know my job? Yep. Um, I think this is a case for an injury to investigate all the facts. This is something that we, we get all the facts. We get all the, we get everything the good, the bad, and the ugly. We put everything together. And you know, and I'm before we I do anything. I don't want to go to jail tonight, but you know I'm not going anywhere. So, you take it to a grand yeah. jury. That, well, that's up to the state. Next, Brewer asks for special handling from the local police. So here's what I would ask. If, if you want to hold me for whatever reason, give me three or four days. Here's why. I'm a one-man shop. I've got to pay estimated taxes. I'm the only one that can do it. Okay. I've got to be in my office. I don't care if you come and sit with me to make sure I don't go anywhere, right. but I, I've got to be able to do that. It's only after a half hour of interrogation and the long wait beforehand that Brewer finally gets around to wondering what had become of Hughes, the young man he had shot in the parking lot. Can I ask you how the fellow's doing? Right now he's uh, critical. 
The detective doesn't answer, then leaves the room to process some paperwork and to check on a request for medications that Brewer said he needed. There is a long wait, and Detective Del Valle comes back in for one final run at questioning to give Brewer one last chance to state how the final moments of the conflict played out. Brewer sticks to his story. Before we go, um, just one question I want to ask, because once we get everything and go to the state, when the guy came, you said the guy came towards you, do you remember anything or any type of threatening things that he told you or anything that he made, actions? I know you said he grabbed yeah, you something. He, he was coming to aggressively get me. He was getting taller than I was. All right. Did he show anything? Like, did you remember anything? Hand maneuvers, hand things. Do you no. remember anything? It, it was just that fast. No. Okay. All right. After that, the detective informs him that it is time for them to do what they need to do and get him moved over to the local hospital where he can be given his prescription medication and have a blood alcohol test administered on him. As they ready him for the move, Detective Del Valle lets Brewer know what has happened to Hughes. All right, Preston. Um, so, Preston, just so you know, I'm always up front with you. What do you do? The hospital had contacted us a little bit ago. I just talked to the, the detective that was out there, and the, uh, the kid did pass away. So I just want to let you know that. All right. Um, unfortunate thing, but I I got to tell you, I've known you too long, and there's no need to, to hold anything back. But um, we're going to do the blood draw. They'll give you your medication out there, and then um, we'll. Right, and we, while you're doing that, we're going to do what we got to do and then see what, those, what avenue the state wants to take. Okay? All right. They'll, uh, they'll take you now. The gentleman that went downstairs will take you out there. Police detectives and those on the scene gave Brewer a chance to tell his side of the story, but Hughes would never have that opportunity. Instead, that job would fall greatly on the CCTV footage from the scene. The footage was shot by cameras owned and installed by Brewer's family to protect their property. In watching the security footage, you can see Hughes walking, or staggering, across the parking lot, shirtless and apparently drinking deeply from a bottle or can. Hughes then walks between two cars on the opposite side of the parking lot and begins to urinate on the wall of a different building, named the Peacock Plaza. The plaza is owned by a different family and is separate physically and illegally from the one that houses Conktown Liquor. Brewer emerges from off-screen from Conktown's back door at the left side of the screen. He stops for a second, seems to assess the situation, turns back towards Hugh's companions, exchanges words with them, and then turns back. You can see him begin drawing a weapon here, some 40 feet away from Hughes. Hughes still appears to have his back turned to Brewer. Brewer now advances across the parking lot towards Hughes. The handgun has apparently already been drawn and is pointing towards the young man who now turns and takes a couple of steps forward. Words are exchanged between the two and one of Hughes' companions move closer to the center of the lot. He seems to be trying to get Brewer's attention. Hughes takes another lurching step forward and Brewer steps back. Then Brewer not Hughes, advances aggressively, gun out, and fires at Hughes. The shot was fired at nearly point-blank range. The two fall to the ground, and at last look, it appears that Brewer may well have been the one on top. Police forensics on the scene would later say that Brewer had fired a total of three shots, not the two that he remembered. The case now rests on the differences between Brewer's explanation of the event and the video taken from the scene that does not exactly back up his account. What is known is that a shirtless, drunk, unarmed young man was killed in the parking lot that night. The video does not seem to give any indication that Hughes was acting aggressively, but we cannot hear the words that are being exchanged between them. Other witnesses on the scene will have to provide that information when the case comes to court. A case could be made for Brewer under Florida's Stand Your Ground law had he stayed in the center of the lot where he paused for a moment, gun drawn, and exchanging words. 
At that moment, he was in a defensible position and could be considered in command of the situation. Then he advances another 15 to 20 feet as Hughes apparently zipped up and turned around. At that point, any step forward, even a drunken stagger from Hughes, could easily be misinterpreted as a threatening move, whether it was or not. Even Brewer, at this point, would later admit that he could tell Hughes was unarmed. Hughes, reaching for his waistband, could easily be determined to be the young man just adjusting his pants after he had finished urinating. Perhaps Hughes' companion, that advanced out and into the open area of the parking lot, had triggered Brewer's fight-or-flight reflex, perceiving him to be an additional threat. Whatever the cause, the trigger was pulled and every life there either ended or changed irrevocably in just the next few seconds. Brewer is currently being held without bond after pleading not guilty to second-degree murder in the death of Hughes and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon for threatening Carson Hughes and a federal misdemeanor charge of carrying a firearm in an establishment whose primary purpose is the sale and consumption of alcohol. If convicted on the second-degree murder charge, Brewer could receive a sentence of 25 years to life and it is subject to mandatory minimum sentencing rules due to the death being caused by a firearm. Locally, the death of Garrett Hughes was met with great sadness in the community. He was remembered as a popular young man and volunteer with the community's youth. A benefit concert was held in his name at Key West's Coffee Butler Amphitheater, with a number of local celebrities performing. Over 2,000 people attended and over $50,000 was raised for a scholarship fund established in his name. Once again, we at Beyond Evil present this case as an opportunity to examine a current case and to look at the ramifications, both legal and social, that it presents. As this case is still waiting to be decided before a judge and possibly a jury, please understand that we offer no legal advice, judgments, or opinions, and just strive to provide the facts and evidence that are available at this time. If you found this case compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. Less than half of the viewers of our videos are subscribers. Subscribing is easy and it makes a huge difference in our ability to continue to provide you with top quality true crime content. Also hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. And until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.